Audiobooks presents Tick Tock by Dean Koontz. Read for you by B.D. Wong. To see what we have never seen, to be what we have never been, to shed the chrysalis and fly, to part the earth, kiss the sky, to be reborn, be someone new. Is this a dream or is it true? Can our future be cleanly shorn from a life to which we're born? Is each of us a creature free or trapped at birth by destiny? Pity those who believe the latter. Without freedom, nothing matters. The Book of Counted Sorrows. In the real world, as in dreams, nothing is quite what it seems. The Book of Counted Sorrows. Out of a cloudless sky on a windless November day came a sudden shadow that swooped across the bright aqua corvette. Tommy Fawn was standing beside the car in autumn sunshine, holding out his hand to accept the keys from Jim Shine, the salesman, when the fleeting shade touched him. He heard a thrumming like frantic wings. Glancing up, he expected a seagull, but not a single bird was in sight. Unaccountably, the shadow had chilled him as though a cold wind had come with it, but the air was utterly still. He shivered as Jim Shine put the keys in his hand, for they felt like ice. The trees along the nearby street were phoenix palms with huge crowns of fronds, offering no branches on which a bird could alight. Pretty exciting, Shine said. Tommy looked at him, slightly disoriented. Huh? Shine resembled a pudgy choir boy with guileless blue eyes. Your first Corvette! Pretty exciting! The aqua Corvette waited, as sleek and cool as a high mountain spring. Overall length, 178 and a half inches. Wheelbase, 96.2 inches, 70.7 inches in width at the dog leg, 46.3 inches high, with a minimum ground clearance of 4.2 inches. Tommy knew the technical specifications of this car better than any preacher knew the details of any Bible story. He was a Vietnamese American, and America was his religion. The highway was his church, and the Corvette was about to become the sacred vessel by which he partook of communion. Tommy slid into the driver's seat. Thirty-six and a half inches of headroom, forty-two inches of legroom. His heart was pounding. He was no longer chilled. In fact, he felt flushed. He had already plugged his cellular phone into the cigarette lighter. The Corvette was his. Crouching at the open window, grinning, Shine said, You're not just a mere mortal anymore, not like other men. Now you're a god. Behind the wheel of the Corvette, with this childhood dream fulfilled, Tommy seemed to be full of the power of the car, exalted. With the Corvette still in park, he eased his foot down on the accelerator, and the engine responded with a deep-throated growl. 5.7 liters of displacement, with a 10.5 to 1 compression ratio, 300 horsepower. Rising from a crouch, stepping back, Shine said, Have fun! Tommy Fawn drove away from the Chevrolet dealership, into a California afternoon so blue and high and deep with promise that it was possible to believe he would live forever. With no purpose except to enjoy the Corvette, he went west to Newport Beach and then south on the fabled Pacific Coast Highway through Corona del Mar along the newly developed hills called Newport Coast with beaches and gently breaking surf to his right, listening to an oldies radio station that rocked with the Beach Boys, the Everly Brothers, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and Roy Orbison. As the end of the century approached, some people said that the American dream was almost extinguished. Nevertheless, for Tommy Fawn on this wonderful autumn afternoon, the promise of his country and the promise of the coast were burning bright. The swooping shadow and the inexplicable chill were forgotten. He drove through Laguna Beach and Dana Point to San Clemente, where he turned and, as twilight fell, headed north again, cruising aimlessly. 
he was getting a feel for the way the Corvette handled. Entering Dana Point from the south this time, he switched off the radio, picked up his cellular phone, and called his mother in Huntington Beach. She answered speaking Vietnamese, although she had immigrated to the United States 22 years ago, after the fall of Saigon when Tommy had been only eight years old. He loved her, but sometimes she made him crazy. Hi, Mom. Dong, she said. Tommy, he reminded her. He had not used his Vietnamese name for many years. Phan Tran Prong had long ago become Tommy Phan. He meant no disrespect for his family, but he was far more American now than Vietnamese. His mother issued a long-suffering sigh because she would have to use English. A year after they arrived from Vietnam, Tommy had insisted that he would speak only English. Even as a little kid, he had been determined to pass eventually for a native-born American. You sound funny, she said with a heavy accent. It's the car phone. Why you need car phone, Duong? Tommy, they're really handy. Couldn't get along without one. Listen, Mom, guess what? Car phone for big shot. Not anymore. Everybody's got one. I don't. Phone and drive too dangerous. Tommy sighed and was rattled by the realization that his sigh sounded like his mother's. I've never had an accident, Mom. His mother changed subjects. Tong, haven't seen you in weeks. We spent Sunday together, Mom. This is only Thursday. You come to dinner tonight. We have come to come. You remember what is come to come? Or maybe forget about your mother's cooking? Of course I know what it is, Mom. Chicken and rice in a clay pot. It's delicious, but I can't come tonight. Night was creeping over the coast. The ocean was inky near the shore, striped with the silvery foam of incoming breakers, but indigo toward the horizon, where a final blade of bloody sunlight still cleaved the sea from the sky. Cruising through the falling darkness, Tommy did feel a little like a god, as Jim Shine had promised, but he was unable to enjoy it because he also felt like a thoughtless and ungrateful son. His mother said, Also having stir fry, celery, carrot, cabbage, some peanuts, very good, my nook mom sauce. You make the best nook mom in the world, but I... Maybe you got walk there in car with phone, you can drive and cook at the same time. In desperation, he blurted, Mom, I bought a new Corvette. You bought phone and corset? I've had the phone for years, and the, what's this corset? Not corset, Corvette. You know, Mom, a car, a sports car. Remember? I always said if I was a big success someday, never hear corset. Stupid name for car. His mother was stubborn, more of a traditionalist than was the Queen of England, and set in her ways. She knew perfectly well what a Corvette was, because Tommy's bedroom walls had been papered with pictures of them when he was a kid. But she also knew what a Corvette meant to him, what it symbolized. She sensed that in the Corvette, he was moving further from his ethnic roots, and she disapproved. Stupid name for car. Expensive? You spend everything on car, go broke? No, no, I'd never... You go broke, don't take welfare. I'm not broke, Mom. You go broke, you come home to live. Family always here. Tommy felt like dirt. She said... Other reporter drive Toyota, Honda, Ford, never see one drive Corvette. I thought you didn't know what a Corvette was. I know, she said. Oh, yes, I know. Making one of those abrupt 180-degree turns that only a mother could perform without credibility whiplash. Doctor drive Corvette. You are always smart, Tong. Get good grade. Could have been doctor. Sometimes it seemed that most of the Vietnamese Americans of Tommy's generation were studying to be doctors or were already in practice. A medical degree signified assimilation and prestige, and Vietnamese parents pushed their children toward the healing professions. Tommy, with a degree in journalism, would never be able to remove an appendix or perform cardiovascular surgery, so he would forever be something of a disappointment to his mother and father. Anyway, I'm not a reporter anymore, Mom, not as of yesterday. Now I'm a full-time novelist, not just part-time anymore. No job. Self-employed. Fancy way of saying no job, she insisted, though Tommy's father was self-employed in the family bakery, as were Tommy's two brothers, who also had failed to become doctors. People read newspaper. Who read book? Lots of people read books. 
You read books, not books about silly private detective with guns in every pocket, get in fight, drink whiskey, chase blonde. My detective doesn't drink whiskey. He should settle down, marry a nice Vietnamese girl, have babies, work, steady job, contribute to family. Boring, Mom. No one would ever want to read about this detective in your book. He ever marry blonde? He break his mother heart. Who want to read book about mother with broken heart? Too sad. Exasperated, Tommy said, "Mom, I just called to tell you the good news about the Corvette and come to dinner. Clay pot chicken and rice better than lousy cheeseburger. I can't come tonight, Mom. I have too much cheeseburger and French fry. Soon you look like a big fat cheeseburger. Tomorrow night we have a shrimp toast, pork stuffed squid." Pot roasted rice, duck with nok cham. Tommy's mouth was watering. Okay, I'll be there tomorrow night, and after dinner I'll take you for a spin in the Corvette. Take your father. Maybe he like flashy sport car, not me. I simple person. But your father, good man. Don't put him in fancy sport car and take him out drink whiskey, fight, chase blonde. I'll do my best not to corrupt him, Mom. Goodbye, Tong Tommy. He corrected, but she had hung up. God, how he loved her. God, how nuts she made him. He drove through Laguna Beach, and continued north. The last red slash of the sunset had seeped away. The wounded night in the west had healed, sky to sea, and in the natural world, all was dark. Mild shivers swept through Tommy. And then he was shaken by a series of more profound chills that made his teeth chatter. As a novelist, he had never written a scene in which a character's teeth had chattered because he thought it was a cliché. As a small boy on a leaky boat on the South China Sea, fleeing from Vietnam with his parents and two brothers under ferocious attack by Thai pirates who would have raped the women and killed everyone if they had been able to get aboard, Tommy had been terrified, but had never been so fearful that his teeth had rattled like castanets. They were chattering now. He clenched his teeth until his jaw muscles throbbed, but that didn't stop the chattering. The coolness of the November evening hadn't yet leached into the Corvette. The chill that gripped him was curiously internal, but he switched on the heater anyway. Remembering the peculiar moment at the car dealership, the flitting shadow that no cloud or bird could have cast, he glanced away from the road ahead, up at the deep sky, as if he might glimpse a pale shape passing through the darkness above. What pale shape, for God's sake! You're spooking me, Tommy boy," he said. Then he laughed dryly. <laughs> Now you're even talking to yourself. Nothing sinister was shadowing him in the night sky above. He had always been too imaginative for his own good, which was why writing fiction came so naturally to him. Maybe he had been born with a strong tendency to fantasize, or maybe his imagination had been encouraged to grow by the folk tales with which his mother had entertained him and soothed him to sleep when he had been a little boy during the war, back in the days when the communists had fought so fiercely to rule Vietnam, the fabled land of seagull and dragon. When the warm, humid nights in Southeast Asia had rattled with gunfire and reverberated with the distant boom of mortars and bombs, he'd seldom been afraid, because her gentle voice enraptured him with stories of spirits. And gods and ghosts. Now, lowering his gaze from the sky to the highway, Tommy Fon thought of the tale of Le Loy, the fisherman who cast his nets into the sea and came up with a magical sword rather like King Arthur's shining Excalibur. He recalled the Raven's magic gem as well, and the search for the land of bliss and the supernatural crossbow. Usually, when something reminded him of one of the legends that he had learned from his mother. He could not help but smile, and a happy peace settled over him. This time, however, those tales had no consoling effect. He remained uneasy, and he was still chilled in spite of the flood of warm air from the car heater. Odd. Driving through Corona del Mar, block by block, depression seeped into Tommy. He felt hollow inside, gray and cold and empty. He knew that hollowness well. It was guilt. He was driving his own Corvette, the car of cars, the ultimate American wheels, the fulfillment of a boyhood dream, and he should have been buoyant, jubilant, 
but an emotional abyss lay under him. He felt guilty about the way he had treated his mother, which was ridiculous because he had been respectful. He didn't want to hurt her feelings. Never. But she was so hopelessly stuck in the past, stubbornly and stupidly fixed in her ways, and Tommy was embarrassed by her inability to assimilate into the American culture as fully as he himself had done. Sharper than a serpent's tooth is a thankless child. Tommy Fawn, bad son, slithering through the night, low and vile and unloving. He knew, of course, that wallowing in guilt was irrational. Sometimes he had unrealistic expectations of his parents, but he was far more reasonable than his mother. Strong-minded, iron-willed, she could be a tiny tyrant when she wished, and she knew how to make a look of disapproval sting worse than the lash of a whip. Those uncharitable thoughts appalled Tommy, even as he indulged in them, and his face grew yet hotter with shame. I am such a selfish creep, he said aloud. As he stopped at an intersection on the border of Corona del Mar and Newport Beach, he settled deeper in a sea of gloom and remorse. Would it have killed him to accept her invitation to dinner? There was no excuse for turning her down, especially since he hadn't seen her and his father for weeks. No, wrong, that was her line. Dong, haven't seen you in weeks. Actually, they had spent Sunday together, but now here he was, minutes later, buying into her fantasy of abandonment. Suddenly his mother seemed to be all of the stereotypical Asian villains of old books and movies rolled into one, as manipulative as Ming the Merciless, as wily as Fu Manchu. He blinked at the red traffic light, shocked to have had such a mean-spirited thought about his own mother. He was a swine. More than anything, Tommy Fawn wanted to be an American. Not a Vietnamese American, just an American, with no hyphen. But surely he didn't have to reject his family, didn't have to be mean to his beloved mother to achieve that complete Americanization. He looked at his hands on the steering wheel. They were the color of burnished bronze. In the rearview mirror, he studied the epicanthic folds of his dark Asian eyes, wondering if he was in danger of trading his true identity for one that was a lie. Fu Manchu. If he could think such unkind things about his mother, he might slip up and say them to her face. She would be crushed. It would be more merciful to shoot her in the heart. So this was the kind of son he had become, the kind of son who shoots his mother in the heart with words. The traffic light changed to green. As he drove through the intersection, he reached for the cellular phone, intending to call his mom and ask if the dinner invitation was still open. Car phone for big shot. He could hear her as clearly as if she were speaking those words now rather than in memory. He snatched his hand away from the phone. On the west side of the Pacific Coast Highway was a restaurant styled as a 1950s diner. Impulsively, Tommy swung into the lot and parked in the glow of red neon. Inside, the place was fragrant with the aromas of onions and hamburgers sizzling on a grill. Ensconced in a red vinyl booth, Tommy ordered a cheeseburger, fries, and a chocolate milkshake. In his mind's ear, his mother's voice replayed, Clay pot chicken and rice better than lousy cheeseburger. Make that two cheeseburgers, Tommy amended as the waitress finished taking his order. Defiantly, certain that farther north in Huntington Beach his mother had just flinched with the psychic awareness of his betrayal, he said, And onion rings. I like a man with a big appetite, the waitress said. She was a slender, blue-eyed blonde with a pert nose, exactly the kind of woman about whom his mother probably had nightmares. Tommy wondered if she was flirting. Her smile was inviting, but her comment about his appetite might have been innocent small talk. He wasn't as smooth with women as he would have liked to be. If she had given him an opening, he was incapable of taking it. One rebellion a night was enough. Cheeseburgers, yes, but not both cheeseburgers and a blonde. After lathering plenty of mustard and ketchup on the burgers, he ate every bite of what he ordered, relished it. He left a generous tip, and as he headed toward the door, his waitress said, You look a lot happier going out than coming in. I bought a Corvette today, he said inanely. Cool, she said. Been my dream since I was a little kid. What color is it? Bright aqua metallic. It flies like a rocket, he said, 
and realized that he was lost in the oceanic depths of her blue eyes. This detective in your book, he ever marry blonde? He break his mother's heart. Well, he said, take care. You too, said the waitress. He went to the entrance and looked back, hoping that she would still be staring after him. She had turned away, however. A breeze had sprung up, but the night was balmy for November. On the far side of Pacific Coast Highway, stately ranks of enormous phoenix palms were illuminated by floodlights. Long green fronds swayed like hula skirts. The breeze was lightly scented with the fecund smell of the nearby ocean. It didn't chill him, but, in fact, pleasantly caressed the back of his neck, playfully ruffled his thick black hair. In the wake of his little rebellion against his mother and his heritage, the world had grown delightfully more sensuous. All the way home, he listened to old-time rock and roll, and he knew the words to every song. He lived in a modest but comfortable two-story tract house in the city of Irvine. Because he'd supplemented his salary from the newspaper with income from a series of paperback mystery novels, he had been able to buy the house three years ago when he'd been only 27. Now his books were coming out in hardcover first, and his writing income had gotten large enough to allow him to risk leaving the register. As Tommy swung into his driveway, swift shadows crawled up the ragged bark of several melaleucas, swarming into higher branches where moonlight silvered leaves shuddered in the night breeze. In the garage, once the big door closed behind him, he remained in the silent car for a few minutes, savoring the smell of leather upholstery, basking in the pride of ownership. If he could have slept sitting upright in the driver's seat, he would have done so. In the kitchen, as he hung the car keys on the pegboard by the refrigerator, he heard the doorbell at the front of the house. Though recognizable, the ringing was different from the usual sound, like a hollow and ominous summons in a dream. The curse of homeownership, something always needed to be repaired. When Tommy opened the front door, ice-cold wind assaulted him. A whirl of melaleuca leaves like hundreds of tiny, flensing knives spun over him, whispering, buzzing against one another, and he stumbled backward two steps, shielding his eyes with one hand. A dry, papery leaf blew into his mouth. The hard little point pricked his tongue. Startled, he spit it out. As suddenly as it had burst through the door, the whirlwind now wound up tight and disappeared into itself, leaving only silence and stillness in its wake. The air was no longer cold. He brushed leaves out of his hair, plucked them from his soft flannel shirt and blue jeans. What the hell? No visitor waited beyond the threshold. Tommy switched on the outside light and saw a strange object on the porch floor in front of him. A rag doll no more than ten inches tall, lying on its back, its stubby arms spread wide. Frowning, he surveyed the night once more. He saw no one. The doll at his feet was unfinished covered with white cotton fabric, unclothed, without facial features or hair. Where each eye should have been, two crossed stitches of coarse black thread dimpled the white cloth. Five sets of crossed black stitches marked the mouth, and another pair formed an X over the heart. Tommy eased across the threshold onto the porch. He squatted on his haunches beside the doll. The bitterness of the dry leaf no longer lingered in his mouth, but he tasted blood. His tongue didn't hurt. The wound was tiny. In one of the doll's mitten-like hands was a folded paper held by a straight pin with a glossy black enamel head as large as a pea. Tommy picked up the doll. It was solid and surprisingly heavy, but loose-jointed and limp, as though it might be filled with sand. When he pulled the pin out of the doll's hand, the death-still street came alive again. A chilly breeze swept across the porch. Shrubbery rustled and trees shuddered, causing moon shadows to shimmer across the black lawn. Then all fell quiet and motionless again. The paper was unevenly yellowed, as though it might be a scrap of ancient parchment, slightly oily and splintered along the edges. The message was in Vietnamese, three columns of gracefully drawn ideograms. Tommy recognized the language but was not able to read it. Rising to his full height, he stared thoughtfully at the street, then down at the doll in his hand. After refolding the note and putting it in his shirt pocket, he went inside and closed the door. He engaged the deadbolt lock. 
In the living room, Tommy put the strange blank-faced doll on the end table beside the sofa, propping it against a lamp. He put the pin on the table beside the doll. Upstairs in the bedroom that he had outfitted as an office where he wrote his novels, he sat at the desk without turning on a lamp. The only light came through the open door from the hall. He picked up the phone and called the home number of Sal Delario, a reporter at the register where Tommy had worked until yesterday. He got an answering machine but left no message. He called Sal's pager. After inputting his own number, he marked it urgent. Less than five minutes later, Sal returned the call from his desk at the newspaper. What's so urgent, cheesehead? Leaning forward in his chair, hunched over his desk, Tommy said, Listen, Sal, I need to know something about the Vietnamese gangs. The Santa Ana boys, Cheap boys, Natoma boys. Tommy, you already know about them. Not as much as you do, Tommy said. Sal was a crime reporter with a deep knowledge of the Vietnamese gangs in Orange County and nationwide. While with the newspaper, Tommy had written primarily about the arts and entertainment. Sal, you ever hear about Natoma or the cheap boys threatening anybody by mailing them an imprint of a black hand or, you know, a skull and crossbones or something like that? Like leaving a severed horse's head in their bed? You have your cultures confused, boy wonder. These guys aren't nice enough to leave warnings. They make the mafia seem like Girl Scouts. What about the older gangs? Not the teenage street thugs, the more organized guys, the Black Eagles, the Eagle Seven. The Black Eagles have the hard action in San Francisco. The Eagle Seven in Chicago. Here is the Frogmen. Tommy boy, if the Frogmen leave a severed head in your bed, it's gonna be your own. Tommy sighed and looked at the nearest window. Clotting clouds had begun to cover the moon and fading silver light filigreed their vaporous edges. That piece I wrote for the show section last week. I think maybe somebody's threatening to retaliate for it. The piece about the little girl figure skater? And the little boy who's a piano prodigy? Who could have been pissed off by that? Some other six-year-old pianist think he should have gotten the coverage? Now he's going to run you down with his tricycle? Well, Tommy said, feeling foolish. The piece did make the point that most Vietnamese kids don't get mixed up in gangs. Ooh, yeah, that's controversial journalism, all right. I had some hard things to say about the ones who do join gangs, especially the Natoma boys and Santa Ana boys. One paragraph in the whole piece you put down the gangs. These guys aren't that sensitive, Tommy. A few words aren't going to put them on the vengeance freeway. The dark clouds congealed rapidly as they moved in from the ocean. The moon sank into them like the face of a drowner in a cold sea, and the lunar glow on the window glass slowly faded. What about the girl gangs? Tommy asked. Wally girls, Pomona girls, the dirty punks. It's no secret they can be more vicious than the boys. But hell, if they got steamed this easily, they'd have gutted me like a fish ages ago. Come on, Tommy, tell me what's happened. What's got you jumpy? It's a doll. Sal sounded bewildered. Like a Barbie doll? A little more ominous than that. Yeah, Barbie isn't the nasty bitch she used to be. Who'd be afraid of her these days? Tommy told Sal about the strange white cloth figure with black stitches that he had found on the front porch. Sounds like the Pillsbury Doughboy gone punk, Sal said. It's weird, Tommy said. Weirder than it probably sounds. You don't have a clue what the note says? You can't read any Vietnamese at all? Not even a little? Taking the paper from his shirt pocket and unfolding it, squinting at the three columns of ideograms on the yellowed paper, Tommy said, This is as meaningless as Sanskrit to me. Can you fax it? In maybe five minutes I can find someone to translate. I'll get back to you as soon as I know what it says. Thanks, Sal. A small Xerox machine stood in one corner of Tommy's office. He made a photocopy of the note, returned the note to his shirt pocket, and faxed the copy to Sal at the register. The phone rang a minute later. Sal said, You put it through the fax wrong side up, bonehead. All I've got is a blank sheet of paper with your number at the top. Send it again. After switching on a lamp, Tommy returned to the fax machine. He was careful to load the page properly. Two minutes later, the phone rang. Sal said, do I have to drive over there and show you how to do it right? You got a blank page again? I loaded it right this time. 
Then something's wrong with your facts, Sal said. Must be, Tommy said, although that answer didn't satisfy him. You want to bring the note by here? You got me curious. If not tonight, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Sal. Tommy put down the phone and switched off the lamp. Once more, the only light was a pale pearlescence from the second floor hallway. He went to the nearest window. The glow of the street lamps didn't reveal anyone lurking in the night. A deep ocean of storm clouds had flooded the sky, entirely submerging the moon. The heavens were black and forbidding. Tommy went downstairs to the living room, where he discovered the doll slumped on its side on the end table beside the sofa. He had left it propped against the lamp in a sitting position. Frowning, Tommy stared at it suspiciously. The doll had seemed to be full of sand. It should have stayed where he had put it. Feeling foolish, he toured the downstairs, trying the doors. They were all still securely locked. No one had entered the house. He returned to the living room, hesitant, not sure why he was hesitant. Tommy Fawn picked up the doll, examining it more closely than he had done earlier. The black sutures that indicated the eyes and the mouth were sewn with heavy thread as coarse as surgical cord. He wondered what his detective, Chip Nguyen, would do in this situation. Chip was tough, smart, relentless. He was a master of Taekwondo, a chess master, a lover of such prowess that a beautiful socialite had killed another woman over him, a collector of vintage Corvettes, and a philosopher who knew that humanity was doomed but who fought the good fight anyway. Already, Chip would have obtained a translation of the note, tracked down the source of the cotton cloth and the black thread, and punched out a thug just for the exercise. What a drag it was to be limited by reality. Tommy sighed and wished that he could step magically through the pages of his own books, into the fictional shoes of Chip Nguyen, and know the glory of being self-confident and utterly in control of life. It was too late to drive to the newspaper offices to see Sal Delario. Tommy just wanted to get a little work done and go to bed. The ragdoll was strange, but not as menacing as he pretended it was. His fertile imagination had run away with him again. He was a master of self-dramatization, which, according to his older brother Don, was the most American thing about him. Americans, Don had once said, all take each individual person more important than whole society or whole family. But how can each person be most important thing? Can't everyone be the most important thing? All equal, but all the most important at the same time? Make no sense. Tommy had protested that he didn't feel more important than anyone else, that Don was missing the point about American individualism, which was all about the right to pursue dreams, not about dominating others. But Don had said, Then if you don't think you're better than us, come work in bakery. Stay with family. Make family dream come true. Now Tommy turned the doll over in his hand, and the more that he handled it, the less ominous it seemed. It was probably just a prank perpetrated by children in the neighborhood. The note-fastening pin with the black enamel head was no longer on the end table where Tommy had left it. Evidently, when the doll had toppled over, the pin had been knocked to the floor. He couldn't see it on the cream-colored carpet, although the glossy black head should have made it easy to spot. From the kitchen, he retrieved a bottle of beer. The beer in one hand and the doll in the other, he went upstairs to his office. He switched on the desk lamp and propped the doll against it. He sat in his office chair, turned on the computer, and printed out the last chapter of the new Chip Nguyen adventure. Sipping the Coors, he worked on the manuscript, marking changes. The incoming storm clouds finally pulled some ground-level turbulence with them, and the wind began to suff in the eaves. From time to time, Tommy glanced at the doll. It sat in the amber light from the desk lamp, arms at its sides. By the time he finished editing the chapter, he had also drunk the last of the beer. Before entering the red line changes in the computer, he went to the guest bathroom off the upstairs hall. When he returned to his office a few minutes later, Tommy half expected to discover that the doll had toppled onto its side again. It was sitting upright as he had left it. Lowering himself into his chair, he saw four words on the previously blank computer screen. The deadline is dawn. A sharp pain stabbed through his right thigh. Startled, he shot to his feet, felt the tiny lance that had pierced his blue jeans, and plucked it out, the straight pin with the black enamel head. 
Over the soughing of the wind and the eaves, he heard a new sound, a soft pop, and then again, like threads breaking. The cross stitches over the spot where the doll's heart was had snapped. They hung loose on its white cotton breast. Tommy's mouth was so dry his tongue had stuck to his palate. He worked up some saliva, but his tongue nevertheless peeled loose as reluctantly as a Velcro fastener. Gingerly, he extended one index finger and pressed it against the pair of snapped sutures on the white cotton breast. Inside the dreadful little man-like figure under Tommy's finger, something twitched, throbbed, something alive, like a squirming insect, an extremely fat spider or frenzied cockroach. He snatched his hand back. Abruptly, the dangling black threads unraveled into the needle holes through which they had been sewn, disappearing into the doll's chest as if something had pulled them from inside. Tommy stumbled backward a step and nearly fell into his office chair. He clutched the arm of it and kept his balance. Pop, pop, pop. The stitches over the thing's right eye broke as the cloth under them bulged with internal pressure. They raveled into the doll like strands of spaghetti sucked into a child's mouth. Tommy was shaking his head in denial. He had to be dreaming. Where the broken sutures had disappeared into the face, the fabric split, revealing a flash of color, a fierce, radiant green. The cotton cloth curled away from the hole, and a small eye appeared in the soft, round head. It wasn't the shiny glass eye of a doll, but as real as Tommy's own eyes, although infinitely stranger, full of soft, eerie light, hateful and watchful, with an elliptical black pupil as in the eye of a snake. Tommy made the sign of the cross. Although he had not attended Mass in years, he was suddenly devout again. The doll twitched, its green eye fixed on Tommy. The words on the computer began to flash. The deadline is dawn. The stitches over the doll's second eye popped and raveled into its head. The fabric bulged and began to split again. The creature's stubby arms twitched. Its mitten hands flexed. It pushed away from the desk lamp and rose to its feet, all of ten inches tall, but nonetheless terrifying for its diminutive stature. Even Chip Nguyen, toughest of all private detectives, master of Taekwondo, would have done precisely what Tommy Fan did then. Run. Neither the author nor his creation was a complete fool. Pushing aside the wheeled office chair, Tommy crashed against the corner of the desk, stumbled, and staggered out of the room. He slammed the office door behind him so hard that the house and his own bones reverberated with the impact. There was no lock. He started toward the stairs, but on second thought, he dashed into his bedroom, switching on the lights as he went. The bed was neatly made. The white chenille spread was as taut as a drum skin. He kept a neat house, and he was distressed to think of it all splattered with blood, especially his own. What was that damn thing? And what did it want? The rosewood nightstand gleamed darkly from furniture polish and diligent care, and in the top drawer, next to a box of Kleenex, was a pistol that had been equally well maintained. The gun that Tommy took from the nightstand drawer was a Heckler & Koch P7. He had purchased it years ago, but he had never needed it until now. As he hurried out of the bedroom and into the second-floor hallway again, he wondered if he might be losing his mind. Then he wondered why he was wondering. Of course he was losing his mind. Ragdolls couldn't become animate. Ten-inch-tall humanoid creatures with radiant green snake eyes didn't exist. He was hallucinating. That was the only credible explanation. The door to his office was closed, as he had left it. The house was as silent as a monastery full of sleeping monks, without even the murmur of whispered prayers. No wind in the eaves. No tick of clock or creak of floorboards. Trembling, sweating, pistols shaking in his hand, Tommy sidled along the carpeted hall to the office. He put one ear to the door. No sound came from the room beyond, at least none that he could hear over the runaway thudding of his heart. What was the creature doing in there? Still ripping out of the cotton fabric like a mummy unwinding its burial wrappings? He tried again to assure himself that this whole incident was an hallucination brought on by a stroke. His mother had been right. The cheeseburgers, the french fries, the onion rings, the double-thick chocolate milkshakes, those were the culprits that had done him in. Although he was only thirty, his abused circulatory system had collapsed under the massive freight of cholesterol that he forced it to carry. Inside the office, something rattled softly. No delusion, no figment of imagination, 
It's in there. The smartest thing to do was leave and call the police. Right away, he saw one serious problem with that scenario. The Irvine Police Department didn't have a doll from hell SWAT team that it customarily dispatched upon request. This was Southern California, after all, not darkest Transylvania or New York City. The authorities would probably write him off as a crackpot. The cops wouldn't bother to send anyone in to answer his call. He put his left hand on the knob. It was cool against his palm. The pistol looked powerful. With its 13-round magazine, it should have given him confidence, but he continued to tremble. Although he would have liked to walk out and never return, he couldn't do that. He was a homeowner. The house was an investment that he couldn't afford to abandon, and bankers seldom canceled mortgages as a result of devil doll infestations. He was virtually immobilized, and his indecisiveness deeply shamed him. Chip Nguyen, the hard-boiled detective whose fictional adventures Tommy chronicled, was seldom troubled by doubt. Chip always knew the best thing to do in the most precarious situations. Usually his solutions involved his fists or a gun or a knife wrenched away from his crazed assailant. Wondering how he could ever again write about a man of action if he failed to act decisively in his own moment of crisis, Tommy finally threw off the chains of paralysis and turned the doorknob. A thunderous crash shook the house, rattling window panes. He gasped, let go of the knob, backed across the hall, and assumed a shooter's stance with a heckler and Koch gripped in both hands. He realized the crash was thunderous precisely because it was thunder. Soon the rain would come. Embarrassed by his overreaction, Tommy returned boldly to the office door. He opened it, and nothing leaped out at him. The only light issued from the desk lamp, leaving dangerous shadows throughout the room. Stepping across the threshold, he fumbled for the wall switch and turned on the ceiling light. Quicker than a litter of black cats, shadows fled behind and under the furniture. The creature was no longer on the desk. Tommy closed the door and stood with his back against it. Prudence required that he proceed as though on a rat hunt, keep the little beast confined to one room, search in every cranny where the vermin might be hiding until it was flushed into the open. A sudden patter, as of small, swift feet, alarmed Tommy. He swung the pistol left, right, but he was hearing only the first fat drops of rain snapping against the clay-tile roof. Hesitantly, he edged across the room and around the desk. The red-penciled chapter of his latest book and the empty bottle of beer were where he had left them, undisturbed. Under the gooseneck desk lamp were two ragged scraps of white cotton fabric. Although somewhat shredded, they had a recognizable mitten-like shape, obviously the cloth that had covered the thing's hands. They appeared to have been chewed off at the wrists. Tommy didn't understand how there could have been any living creature in the doll when he had first handled it and brought it upstairs. The soft cloth had seemed to be filled only with sand. The deadline is dawn no longer glowed on the screen. In the place of that cryptic yet ominous message was one word. Tick-tock. He pushed the wheeled office chair out of the way. Thrusting the pistol in front of himself, he cautiously stooped to peer into the knee hole in the desk. The doll thing was not there. To the left of the knee space were one box drawer and a file drawer. To the right was a stack of three box drawers. He eased them open, one at a time, expecting the minikin to explode at his face, but he discovered only his usual business supplies. Outside, driven by a suddenly fierce wind, rain pounded across the roof, roaring like the marching feet of armies. Raindrops rattled against the windows with a sound as hard as distant gunfire. The din of the storm would mask the furtive scuttling of the doll thing if it tried to creep up behind him. He glanced over his shoulder, but he wasn't under attack. As he searched, he strove to persuade himself that the creature was too small to pose a serious threat to him. Nevertheless, his heart continued to race, and his chest was tight with apprehension. He recalled too clearly the radiant green eyes with elliptical black pupils. They were the fierce eyes of a predator. The brass wastebasket was half-filled with crumpled sheets of typing paper and pages from a yellow legal pad. He kicked it to see if he could elicit an alarmed response from anything hiding at the bottom of the trash. Nothing. Chain lightning flared outside, and with arachnid frenzy, the turbulent shadows of wind-shaken trees thrashed across the glass. Across the room from the desk, a sofa stood against the wall, under framed movie posters advertising two of his favorite films, Double Indemnity and Dark Passage. The sofa was built to the floor rather than supported on legs. Consequently, nothing could be hiding under it. 
The doll thing might be behind the sofa, however, and to move such a heavy piece away from the wall, Tommy needed both hands. He placed the gun on a sofa cushion within easy reach, and he dragged that heavy furniture away from the wall. Sure that something hideous, clothed in torn cotton rags, would come at him, shrieking. His ankles were vulnerable to sharp little teeth. The minikin had not taken refuge behind the sofa. Relieved but also frustrated, Tommy left the cumbersome piece standing away from the wall, and he picked up the pistol. The only place left to search was a mahogany credenza. It had two pair of doors. He considered firing a few rounds through them before he dared to look inside, but at last he opened them and poked among the supplies without finding the tiny intruder. Standing in the middle of the office, Tommy turned slowly in a circle, trying to spot the hiding place that he had overlooked. He was certain the doll thing was still in this room. He sensed its hateful presence, the coiled energy of its predatory patience. Lightning flashed at the windows, and tree shadows ran spider-quick over glass and streaming rain, and like a warning voice, the tolling thunder seemed to call Tommy's attention to the drapes. Two windows faced east, each flanked by panels of gold and red brocade. All the drapes hung in neat folds, none appeared to be pulled out of shape by a rat-sized creature clinging to the back. With the pistol cocked, using his left hand, Tommy took hold of one of the drapery panels, hesitated, and then shook it vigorously. Nothing fell to the floor. Nothing snarled or scrambled for a tighter hold on the fabric. Although he spread the short drape and lifted it away from the wall, Tommy had to lean behind it to inspect the liner to which the intruder might be clinging. He found nothing. He repeated the process with the next drapery panel, but no snake-eyed minikin hung from the back of it either. Cautious inspection revealed that nothing unnatural was behind the drape to the left of the second window. One panel of brocade remained. He shook it without effect. It felt no different from the other three panels. Spreading the material, lifting it away from the wall and the window, Tommy leaned in, looked up, and saw the minikin hanging from the brass rod, suspended upside down by a glistening black tail that had uncoiled from the white cotton fabric, the thing's two hands, no longer like mittens, sprouting from ragged white cotton sleeves, were mottled black and yellow, four bony fingers and an opposable thumb, each digit tipped with tiny pointed reptilian claws. During an eerily attenuated moment of stunned immobility, Tommy had an impression of hot green eyes glaring from a loose white mask and numerous yellow teeth that had chewed open the five sets of crossed black sutures with which the mouth had been sewn shut. Lightning thawed that moment of heart-freezing confrontation. The minikin hissed, its tail unwound from the brass rod, and it dropped straight at Tommy's face. As thunder crashed in the wake of the lightning, Tommy fired the pistol. The bullet missed the beast and lodged in the ceiling. Hissing fiercely, the doll thing landed on Tommy's head. Its claws scrabbled through his thick hair and pierced his scalp. Howling, he clutched the minikin by the back of its neck and tore it off his head. The beast squirmed ferociously in his grip. Tommy was caught in the drape. The front sight of the P-7 was not prominent, but it snagged the liner as securely as a fish hook. A wet guttural snarl issued from the minikin, and it gnashed its teeth, trying to bite his fingers. The liner material tore away from the gun sight, and Tommy flailed out from under the drape. With all of his might, he threw the beast as though firing a killer pitch in a baseball game. The thing shrieked as it was hurled across the room, and it thudded against the far wall hard enough to snap its spine. Freeing himself from the drape, Tommy pulled the brass rod out of its supports, and the entire assemblage, rod, two panels of material, and cords, fell on him. Cursing, he tossed the blinding cowl of brocade off his head and thrashed loose of the drapery cords. The hideous minikin was crumpled on the carpet against the baseboard at the far side of the room near the door. Taking a step toward the intruder, intending to finish it off, Tommy was snared by the mound of fallen drapes. He fell. With his left cheek flat against the carpet, he now shared the murderous minikin's plane of view, though from a tilted perspective. The creature stood as erect as a man, trailing its six-inch black tail, still dressed in the rags of the doll. Outside, the storm was reaching a crescendo, hammering the night with a barrage of lightning and thunder. The creature sprinted toward Tommy, white cotton cloth flapping like tattered banners, and Tommy fired two shots. One of the rounds hit the minikin. It tumbled backward. Proportionately, the slug from the forty caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge was to this beast what a shell from a battlefield artillery would be to a man. This thing should have been smashed, shattered, blown to bits. Instead, the small figure appeared to be intact. 
sprawled in a tangle of limbs and scorched white cotton cloth, racked by spasm, wisps of smoke rising from it, but intact. No blood on the carpet or on the wall, not one drop. The beast stopped shuddering, sat up, and sighed. The sigh wasn't one of weariness, but of pleasure, as though being shot in the chest had been an interesting and gratifying experience. Tommy pushed up onto his knees. Across the office, the minikin put its black and yellow mottled hands on its smoking abdomen. Actually, it reached into its abdomen, digging with its claws, wrenching out the misshapen slug from the forty caliber cartridge. The minikin tossed the chunk of lead aside. Shaky, weak-kneed, slightly nauseous, Tommy got to his feet. He felt his scalp, where the tiny puncture wounds from the beast's claws still stung. He hadn't been seriously hurt. Yet. His adversary rose to its feet as well. Although seven times taller than the minikin, and perhaps thirty times its weight, Tommy was so terrified he almost peed his pants. Chip Nguyen, hard-boiled detective, would never lose control of himself in that fashion, but Tommy Fan no longer gave a damn what Chip Nguyen would do. Chip Nguyen was an idiot, a whiskey-drinking fool who put too much faith in guns, martial arts, and tough talk. Pointing the P-7 at the minikin, Tommy felt a mad laugh swelling in him, but he choked it down. If the minikin was a supernatural entity, resistance to it might be pointless, but at least the pistol had stunned it. He might not be able to kill it, but he could fend it off until he ran out of ammunition. Ten rounds remained in the thirteen-shot magazine. The doll thing cocked its rag-swaddled head and regarded him with a fierce, green-eyed hunger. The strips of cotton hanging over its face looked like white dreadlocks. Thus far, the gunfire had been masked by the thunder. Eventually, however, the neighbors in this peaceful city of Irvine would realize a battle was being waged next door, and they would call the cops. When the police arrived, he would tell them what was happening, though he would sound like a poster boy for paranoid dementia. Then the minikin would reveal itself or hide and let the police transfer their raving ward to a windowless room with rubber wallpaper. Tommy almost didn't care which of the two scenarios played out. In either case, the immediate terror would be over, and he would be able to avoid peeing his pants. The fiend hissed. Instead of charging, it darted across the room and disappeared behind the sofa. Buoyed slightly by his adversary's retreat, Tommy dared to hope that the forty caliber round had done some damage after all, at least enough to make the little beast cautious. He eased across the room to peer around the sofa, but the minikin wasn't there. Then he saw the torn flaps of fabric. The creature had burrowed into the sofa and was now hiding inside it. Tommy circled the sofa, studying it as he moved. Fire. Maybe fire could achieve better results than a bullet. While the creature was building a nest, or doing whatever the hell it was doing in there, Tommy might be able to sneak down to the garage, siphon gasoline out of the Corvette, grab some matches from a drawer in the kitchen, and return to set the sofa on fire. No, that would take too long. By the time he returned, the repulsive little creepazoid wouldn't be inside the sofa anymore. From deep in the mysterious creature's upholstered haven came a creaking, then a sharp twang. More silence. Tick-tock. Tick-tock and then the sound of fabric ripping. One of the seat cushions was dislodged by the beast as it tore out of the sofa. In one dark, bony hand, it held a six-inch length of a broken seat spring, a spiral of gleaming eighth-inch steel wire. Shrieking with rage and hatred, its piercing voice as shrill as an electronic oscillation, the creature flung itself off the sofa and at Tommy with such force and velocity that it almost seemed to fly. He scrambled out of its way, reflexively firing, and wasting one more round from the P-7. The beast hadn't been attacking after all. The lunge had been a feint. It dropped to the carpet and streaked past Tommy, around the desk, and out of sight. When Tommy followed the minikin around the desk, he discovered it at an electrical outlet. The creature appeared to be grinning through its mask of rags as it jammed the steel spring into the receptacle. Power surged through bare steel, crackle-snap, and outside in the fuse box, a breaker tripped, and all the lights went out except for a shower of gold and blue sparks that cascaded over the minikin. Those fireworks lasted only an instant, however, and then darkness claimed the room. Depleted by distance and filtered by trees, the yellowish glow of the street lamps did not penetrate to the room, 
Tommy was blind. The only sounds were the rataplan of rain on the roof and the moaning of wind in the eaves. Undoubtedly, the doll thing was alive. The electricity hadn't phased it any more than could a forty caliber bullet in the midsection. Tommy clutched the P-7, but he could not stun the minikin with a well-placed shot if he was unable to see it. Holding his breath, he listened, but could not hear the minikin. Only the rain. The rain. The rattling rain. What scared him most about the intruder was not its monstrous appearance, not its fierce hostility, not its physical spryness or speed, and not even the fundamental mystery of its very existence, but the new realization that the thing was highly intelligent. Initially, he had assumed he was dealing with an animal, but to be able to adapt a sofa spring into an essential tool to understand the electrical system of the house well enough to disable the office circuit, this beast was not only able to think, but was possessed of sophisticated knowledge that no mere animal could acquire. This was no longer a rat hunt. The Minikin's strategic imposition of darkness revealed that this was a contest between equals, or at least Tommy hoped it was a contest between equals, because if they weren't equals, then this was a rat hunt after all, and he was the rat. By opting for darkness, had the creature merely been trying to minimize Tommy's size advantage and the threat of the gun, or did it gain an advantage of its own from the darkness? Perhaps, like a cat, it could see as well at night as it could in daylight. What do you want? he asked aloud. He would not have been surprised if a small, whispery voice had responded. Indeed, he almost hoped it would speak to him. Whether it spoke or only hissed, its reply would reveal its location, maybe even clearly enough to allow him to open fire. Why me? he asked. The minikin made no sound. Swinging the heckler and Koch slowly from side to side, he tried to elicit a telltale response from the tiny intruder. What are you? The minikin, in its original white cotton skin, brought to mind voodoo. But a voodoo doll was simply a crude fetish, believed to have magical potency. It never showed up on the doorstep of the intended victim to bedevil and assault him. Nevertheless, into the gloom and the incessant drumming of the rain, Tommy said, Voodoo? Whether this was voodoo or not, the most important thing he had to learn was who had made the doll. The doll maker was his ultimate enemy, not the critter that was stalking him. He'd never find the doll maker by waiting for the minikin to make the next move. Action, not reaction, was the source of solutions. He moved toward the wall opposite the windows. When he bumped into the door, he fumbled for the knob, and still the minikin did not attack. Yanking open the door, he discovered that the lights were also off in the upstairs hall, which shared a circuit with his office. Lamps glowed on the first floor, and pale light rose at the stairs. As Tommy crossed the threshold, the minikin shot between his legs. He heard it hiss and felt it brush against his jeans. He kicked, missed, kicked again. A scuttling sound and a snarl revealed that the creature was moving away from him, fast. At the head of the stairs, it appeared in silhouette against the rising light, turning, fixing him with its radiant green eyes. The rag-entwined minikin raised one gnarly fist, shook it, and shrieked defiantly. Its cry was small but shrill, piercing and utterly unlike the voice of anything else on earth. Tommy took aim, but the creature scrambled down the stairs and out of sight before Tommy could squeeze off a shot. In the gloom, and at a distance, he could not be certain, but he thought that the creature had still been holding the six-inch length of spring steel. Alarmed, Tommy ran to the stairs. The minikin wasn't in sight. Tommy descended the steps two at a time. At the landing, he saw that the lower steps were deserted too. Then movement drew his attention. The minikin streaked across the small foyer and vanished into the living room. If he didn't move fast, Tommy was going to be either trapped in a pitch-black house where all electrical circuits were disabled, or driven on foot into the storm where the minikin could repeatedly attack and retreat with the cover of darkness and rain. Though the thing was only a tiny fraction as strong as he was, its supernatural resilience and maniacal relentlessness compensated for its comparative physical weakness. Clearly, it expected to win, to chase him down, to get him. Cursing, Tommy raced down the last flight. As he came off the bottom step, he heard a hard crackle snap, and the lights went out in the living room and the foyer. He turned right into the dining room. He glimpsed himself in the ornately framed mirror above the sideboard. His hair was disarranged. His eyes were wide. He looked demented. 
As Tommy pushed through the swinging door into the kitchen, the minikin squealed behind him. The familiar sound of an electric arc snapped again, and the dining room lights went out. Fortunately, the kitchen lights were on a different circuit from the dining room. The overhead fluorescents were still bright. He snatched the car keys off the pegboard. The door to the dining room swung so smoothly that the ten-inch minikin was able to squeeze into the kitchen behind Tommy. Not daring to look back, he heard tiny clawed feet clicking on the tile floor. He stepped into the laundry room and slammed the door behind him before the creature could follow. No lock. Didn't matter. The minikin wouldn't be able to climb up and turn the knob on the other side. It couldn't follow him. The lights failed in the laundry room for they were on the same circuit with those in the kitchen, which the creature evidently had just shorted, Tommy groped forward through the blackness. In the garage, the light still functioned. The big overhead door began to rumble upward when Tommy tapped the wall switch, and the storm wind chuffed like a pack of dogs at the widening space at the bottom. He hurriedly circled the Corvette to the driver's side. The garage lights blinked out, and the roll-up door stopped ascending when it was still half-blocking the exit. No! The Minikin could not have gotten through two closed doors and into the garage to cause a short circuit, and there hadn't been time for it to find the electric service panel and trip a breaker. Frantically, Tommy pawed at the darkness overhead until he located the dangling release chain that disconnected the garage door from the electric motor that operated it. Still clutching the pistol, he rushed to the door and pushed it all the way up. A noisy burst of November wind threw shatters of cold rain in his face. The balminess of the afternoon was gone. The temperature had plummeted at least 20 degrees. Though he was convinced he would be attacked before he reached the Corvette, he got behind the steering wheel and slammed the door without encountering the Minikin. He put the pistol on the passenger seat within easy reach. The engine started with no hesitation. He reversed into the driveway into torrents of rain, switched on the windshield wipers, and continued into the street, leaving the garage door open, other doors unlocked. Driving too fast for a residential neighborhood, casting up ten-foot-high wings of water as he raced through a flooded intersection, Tommy dared not slow down. The gates of hell had been flung open, and each creature among the legion of monstrosities seething out of those portals was intent on the same prey. Tommy Fun. A few minutes later, on University Drive, passing the Irvine campus of the University of California, Still damp with cold sweat and with the slanting rain that had blown through the open garage door, Tommy shivered violently. He switched on the car heater. He was half-dazed, as though the dose of terror he had taken was a potent drug with a lingering narcotic effect. His thinking was cloudy. He couldn't focus on what needed to be done next, on deciding where and to whom he should turn. He wanted to be Chip Nguyen and live in the world of detective fiction where blazing guns and hard fists and sardonic wit always led to satisfactory resolutions, where the motives of adversaries were simple greed, envy, and jealousy, where the villains, by God, never had serpent eyes or sharp little teeth or rat-like tails. He was exhausted. His limbs felt weak. The metronomic thump of the windshield wipers lulled him, and more than once he came out of a waking dream to find that he was in a different neighborhood from the one he last remembered. He understood what was wrong. He was a well-educated man with an unshakably rational viewpoint. He had always assumed that he could clearly read the big map of life and that he had both hands firmly on the controls of his destiny. From the moment that the two black sutures had popped and the green eye had glared at him out of the doll's torn face, however, his world began to collapse. Forget the great laws of physics, the logic of mathematics, the dissectable truths of biology. They might still apply, but they didn't explain enough, not anymore. He was confused, lost, dispirited, as only a rationalist could be upon encountering irrefutable evidence that something supernatural was at play in the universe. He might have accepted the devil doll with greater equanimity if he had been in Vietnam, where his mother's folk tales were set, in that Asian world of jungles, limpid waters, and blue mountains like mirages. It was easier to believe in the fantastic. On humid nights along the banks of the Mekong River or on the shores of the South China Sea, the air seemed thickened by magic. 
But this was the United States of America, the land of big business and big science, from which men had gone to the moon, where movies and television had been invented, where the atom had first been split. This was America, damn it, where you could solve any problem with a screwdriver and a wrench, or with a computer, or with fists and a handgun, or at worst with the help of a therapist and a 12-step program to affect personal enlightenment and change. Screwdrivers, wrenches... Computers, fists, guns, and therapists weren't going to help him cope with the minikin if he returned to his house and found the creature still in residence. And it would be there. He had no doubt about that. It would be waiting. It had a job to finish. It had been sent to kill him. Tommy didn't know how he could be so sure of the minikin's purpose, but what he intuited was true. Little Assassin. Now, Tommy cruised Spyglass Drive, piloting the Corvette along ridges stippled with million-dollar houses that overlooked Newport Beach, past graceful California pepper trees thrashing in the wind, and his thoughts were as chaotic as his driving was aimless. He wanted to go to his parents' cozy house in Huntington Beach, take refuge in the bosom of his family, but he was reluctant to do so, for fear that he had put too much emotional distance between them and himself to warrant the unconditional acceptance they once would have given him. He might babble out the story of the devil doll only to see his mother's face pinch with disapproval and hear her say, You drink whiskey like your silly detective, then surprise when see demon and dragon? Tommy groaned aloud in misery. He decided not to go home to Huntington Beach because he was afraid that once he got there, he would find that it wasn't really home anymore. Then having discovered that he didn't belong in the Fawn house in quite the way that he had once belonged, and not being able to return to his own minikin haunted house in Irvine, what place would he be able to call home? Nowhere. That was a discovery he was not yet prepared to make, even if he had to deal with the minikin alone. Tommy reached to the passenger seat and briefly put his right hand on the heckler and Koch. The shape of the pistol the sense of godlike power cast in steel did not comfort him. Minutes later, after the rhythmic thump of the windshield wipers had once more half-hypnotized him, he came out of his daze and saw that he was on MacArthur Boulevard, on the southern end of Newport Beach. He was traveling west in light traffic. According to the dashboard clock, the time was 10.26 p.m. He couldn't just drive aimlessly through the night until he ran out of fuel. He decided to seek family help after all, but not from his mother and father. He would go to his older brother, Guy Min Fan. Guy had changed his name, too, from Fan Min Guy, merely reversing the order to place the surname last. For a while, he had considered taking an American name, as Tommy had done, but decided against it, which earned points with their parents, who were far too conservative to adopt new names themselves. Guy had given American names to his four children, Heather, Jennifer, Kevin, and Wesley, but that was all right with mom and dad because all four had been born in the States. The oldest of the three Fan brothers, Thon Tat, eight years Tommy's senior, had five children, all born in the USA, and each enjoyed both a Vietnamese and an American name. Don's kids called one another by their Vietnamese names when they were around their grandparents, used their American names when with friends of their own age, yet not one of them had an identity crisis. Thon, 16 when they had fled Vietnam, was still sufficiently mired in the ways of the old world that he shared some of the elder Fon's frustrations with Tommy. Don and Tommy had been reasonably close as brothers, but they had never been the kind of brothers who were also friends. Guy, on the other hand, though six years older than Tommy, was a brother and a friend and a confidant, or once had been, and if anyone in this world would give the devil doll story a fair hearing, it would be Guy. As Tommy crossed San Joaquin Hills Road, less than a mile from Pacific Coast Highway. He was planning the easiest route north to the family bakery in Garden Grove where Guy managed the graveyard shift when he heard a peculiar noise from the vet's engine compartment. Underlying the monotonous squeak and thump of the windshield wipers rose a soft rattling, a whispery scraping as of metal abrading metal. He was at last warm, so he turned off the heater in order to hear the sound better. Something was loose and working steadily looser. Frowning, he leaned over the steering wheel, listening closely. The noise persisted, low but troubling. He thought he detected 
an industrious quality to it. He felt a queer vibration through the floorboards. The noise grew no louder, but the vibration increased. The shoulder on his side of the highway was narrow, with a slope and then a dark field beyond, and Tommy didn't want to be forced to pull off here in the blinding downpour. From under the hood came a sharp twang, as of metal snapping under tremendous stress. The steering wheel shuddered in Tommy's hands. It pulled hard to the left. Traffic was headed upslope in the eastbound lanes. Two cars and a van. The Corvette angled toward them. With both hands, Tommy pulled the wheel to the right. The car responded, but sluggishly. The oncoming vehicles began to swerve to their right as the driver saw him cross over the center line. The catastrophic twang under the hood was followed by a clattering, clanking, grinding that instantly escalated into cacophony. He had no brakes. Zip. Zero. No stopping power whatsoever. And the accelerator was stuck. The car was picking up speed. He wrenched at the steering wheel so forcefully that he felt as though he would dislocate his shoulders. At last, the car angled sharply back into the westbound lanes where it belonged. Over in the eastbound lanes, the wildly sweeping glimmer of headlights on the wet pavement reflected the other driver's panic. Then the Corvette's steering failed altogether. The wheel spun uselessly through his aching hands. The vet shot off the highway, onto the shoulder, flattened a small highway department sign, tore through tall grass and low brush, and rocketed off the embankment. Airborne. The engine was still screaming, demanding acceleration. The car came down only on the passenger side tires, one of which exploded. Tommy hadn't been aware that his mouth was open or that he was screaming until his teeth clacked together hard enough to crack a walnut. Like Tommy, the big engine stopped screaming on impact too, so as the Corvette rolled, he was able to hear the fearsome and familiar shriek of the minikin. The beast's shrill cry was coming through the heating vents from the engine compartment. Gleeful shrieking. With a hellish clatter to rival the sound of an 8.0 earthquake shaking through an aluminum pot factory, the sports car rolled. The laminated windshield imploded, and the side windows shattered. The hood buckled with a screek and was cracked, crunched, twisted, and jammed into the engine compartment during the second roll. With one headlight still aglow, the Corvette finally came to rest on the passenger side after two and a quarter revolutions. Or maybe three, he couldn't be sure. He was anxious, disoriented, and as dizzy as if he had spent the past hour on a roller coaster. The driver's side of the car was where the roof should have been, and only the safety harness prevented him from falling into the passenger seat, which was now where the floor should have been. In the comparative stillness of the aftermath, Tommy could hear his own panicky breathing, the hot tick of overheated engine parts, the whistle of pressurized coolant escaping a punctured line, and rain drumming against the wreckage. The minikin was silent. Tommy didn't delude himself that the demon had been killed. It was alive, wriggling toward him through the wreckage. In the confines of the demolished car, he wouldn't be able to fend it off. Gasoline fumes. The chill wind brought him the last thing he wanted to smell, the astringent odor of gasoline fumes. Although dizzy, Tommy found the release button for the safety harness. Holding onto the steering wheel with one hand to avoid dropping into the passenger seat, he wriggled loose of the straps. He located the door handle, but the lock was shattered or the door was torqued. It wouldn't open. The side window had broken out in the crash. Cold rain poured through the hole, soaking Tommy. He thrust his head through the window, then his shoulders and arms, and levered himself out of the wreckage. He rolled off the side of the tipped Corvette into a cold puddle, into mud. The stink of gasoline was stronger than ever. Pushing onto his feet, he saw that the car had tumbled across a parcel of bare land that was the site of a future shopping center at the corner of MacArthur Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway. Because the Corvette was turned on its side, he was standing next to the undercarriage. From out of the mechanical guts of the machine, the minikin issued a shriek of rage and need. Tommy stumbled backward from the car. As the bone-piercing shriek trailed into a snarl, and then into an industrious grumble, Tommy heard the demon pounding, straining, clawing, and metal creaked against metal. He couldn't see into the dark undercarriage, but he sensed that the minikin was temporarily trapped in the wreckage and struggling furiously to pry itself free. The fiberglass body of the Corvette was a mess. His dream car was a total loss. He was fortunate to have gotten out unscathed. In the morning, he would be crippled by whiplash if he lived through the night. The deadline is dawn. Tick-tock. Get moving. Keep moving. When he circled the front of the tipped car, 
passing through the beam of the sole functioning headlight, Tommy couldn't see the engine compartment either, for the hood had compacted into it. But he could hear the demon battering against the walls of its prison. In the distance, someone shouted. Two cars had stopped along MacArthur Boulevard to the south, near the place where Tommy had run the Corvette off the roadway. A man with a flashlight stood at the top of the low embankment 80 yards away. The guy called again, but his words were swallowed by the wind. He started to descend the slope. Tommy raised one arm and waved, encouraging the Good Samaritan to hurry, to come hear the squawking demon trapped in the smashed machinery, to see the impossible doll thing with his own eyes, if it managed to break loose, to marvel at its existence, to be a witness. Gasoline, pooled under the length of the Corvette, ignited. Flames geysered high into the night, vaporizing the falling rain. The great hot hand of the fire slapped Tommy with such fury that his face stung, and he was staggered backward by the force of the blow. There had been no explosion, but the heat was intense. An unearthly squealing rose from the trapped minikin. At the foot of the embankment, the Good Samaritan had halted, startled by the fire. Hurry! Tommy shouted, though he knew that the roar of rain and wind prevented the man from hearing either him or the demon. With a boom and a splintery crack, the battered and burning hood exploded off the engine compartment and tumbled past Tommy, spewing sparks and smoke as it clattered toward the stand of phoenix palms. Like a malevolent genie freed from a lamp, the minikin flung itself out of the inferno and landed upright in the mud, no more than ten feet from Tommy. It was ablaze, but the streaming cloaks of fire that had replaced its white fabric shroud did not seem to disturb it. Indeed, the creature was no longer shrieking in mindless rage, but appeared to be exhilarated by the blaze. Raising its arms over its head as if joyfully exclaiming, Hallelujah! Swaying as if in a state of rapture, it fixed its attention not on Tommy, but on its own hands, which like tallow tapers on a dark altar streamed blue fire. Incredibly, the thing had grown. This demon swaying rapturously before him was not ten inches tall, but perhaps eighteen. Because of the masking fire, Tommy could not see the details of the creature's form, although he thought he detected wickedly spiky protrusions the length of its spine, which had not been there before. Having expected the minikin to wither and collapse in the consuming flames, Tommy was dangerously mesmerized by the sight of it thriving instead. This is nuts, he muttered. The puddles on the ground glimmered and flickered with the fiery shadows of the capering minikin. To add body weight, it would have required nourishment, fuel to feed the feverish growth. What had it eaten? The Good Samaritan was approaching again, behind the bobbling beam of his flashlight, but he was still more than sixty yards away. The burning corvette was between him and the demon, which he wouldn't be able to see until he had come virtually to Tommy's side. Impossibly, the rhapsodic minikin appeared to swell larger even as the flames seethed from it. Tommy backed slowly away, overcome by the urgent need to flee, but reluctant to run. Sudden movement might shatter the demon's fascination with the fire and remind it that its prey was nearby. The guy with the flashlight was forty yards away. He was a heavyset man in a hooded raincoat that flared behind him. Lumbering through the puddles, slipping in the mud, he resembled a cowled monk. Suddenly Tommy was afraid for the Samaritan's life. At first, he had wanted a witness, but that was when he thought the minikin would perish in the flames. Now, it wouldn't allow a witness. He would have shouted at the stranger to stay away, even at the risk of drawing the minikin's attention, but fate intervened when a gunshot cracked, then a second and a third. Evidently recognizing the distinctive sound, the heavyset stranger skidded to a halt in the mud. He was still thirty yards away, with the ruined car intervening, so he couldn't possibly have seen the blazing demon. A fourth shot boomed. A fifth. In the scramble to get out of the Corvette after the crash, Tommy had not remembered the pistol. Now the intense heat was detonating the ammunition. Lacking even the inadequate protection of the Heckler and Koch, Tommy stopped backing away from the demon and stood in tremulous indecision. The rain washed, parching panic through him, and his fear was a fever burning in his brow, in his eyes, in his joints. He turned and ran for his life. Mud sucked at Tommy's athletic shoes. Tangles of dead grass and creeping lantana vines snared him, almost brought him down. He glanced over his shoulder and saw that the flames at the Corvette, although brightly whipping the night, were subsiding. 
The smaller conflagration that marked the burning demon was fading much faster than the blaze of the car, but the beast continued to be entranced and was not yet giving chase. The deadline is dawn. Tomorrow's sunrise hung out there just a few minutes this side of eternity. Almost to the street, Tommy dared to glance back again through the obscuring gray curtains of rain. Flames still sputtered from the minikin, but only fitfully. Apparently, most of the gasoline saturating the creature had burned off. Too little fire remained, mere wisps of yellow, to allow Tommy to see the thing well. Just well enough to be certain it was on the move and coming after him. It was not pursuing as fast as it had been before, but it was coming nonetheless. Having crossed the empty lot on the diagonal, Tommy reached the corner of Pacific Coast Highway and Avocado Street and plunged off the curb into calf-deep water that overflowed the gutters. A car horn blared. Brakes screeched. He hadn't checked oncoming traffic because he had been looking over his shoulder. When he snapped his head up in surprise, an astonishingly colorful Ford van was there, blazing yellow, red, gold, orange, black, green, as if appearing magically, poof, from another dimension. The dazzling van stopped an instant before Tommy reached it, but he ran into it full tilt. He bounced off the fender, spun around to the front of the vehicle, and fell to the pavement. Clutching the van, he pulled himself up from the black top. The extravagant paint job wasn't psychedelic, as it had appeared on first impression, but rather an attempt to transform the van into an Art Deco jukebox. Images of leaping gazelles amidst stylized palm fronds, streams of luminous silver bubbles in bands of glossy black, and more luminous gold bubbles in bands of Chinese red lacquer. As the driver's door opened, the night swung with Benny Goodman's big band classic, One O'Clock Jump. As Tommy regained his feet again, the driver appeared at his side. A young woman in white shoes, what might have been a nurse's white uniform, and a black leather jacket. Hey, are you all right? Tommy squinted at the rain-swept vacant lot. The minikin was no longer a fire. Tommy couldn't see where the creature was, but it must be closing the gap between them. Go, he told the woman, waving her away with one hand. You must be hurt, she insisted. Get out of here, he said frantically. He pushed away from her, intending to continue across all six lanes of Pacific Coast Highway. At the moment, there was no traffic except for a few vehicles that had stopped half a block to the south, where their drivers were watching the burning Corvette. The woman clutched tenaciously. Was that your car back there? Lady, it's coming! What's coming? It! He tried to wrench loose of her. She said, Was that your new Corvette? He knew her the blonde waitress. She had served cheeseburgers to him earlier this evening. The restaurant was across this highway. The place had closed for the night. She was on her way home. Tommy had the queer sensation that he was riding a bobsled of fate, rocketing down a luge chute toward some destiny he could not begin to understand. You should see a doctor, she persisted. He wasn't going to be able to shake her loose. When the minikin arrived, it wouldn't want a witness. Eighteen inches tall and growing, bigger claws, teeth, it would rip her throat out, tear her face off, her slender throat, her lovely face. Tommy didn't have time to argue with her. Okay, a doctor, okay, get me out of here. Holding his arm as if he were a doddering old man, she started to walk him around to the passenger door. Drive the damn thing, he demanded, tearing loose of her. He yanked open the passenger door but the waitress was still standing in front of her jukebox van, stupefied by his outburst. Move, or we'll both die, he shouted in frustration. He glanced back at the vacant lot, then clambered into the Ford. The woman slid into the driver's seat and slammed her door an instant after Tommy slammed his. Switching off one o'clock jump, she said, What happened back there? I saw you come shooting off MacArthur Boulevard. Are you stupid, or deaf, or both? He demanded, his voice shrill and cracking. We gotta get out of here now! You've got no right to talk to me that way, she said quietly, but with visible anger in her crystalline blue eyes. Speechless with frustration, Tommy could only sputter. Even if you're hurt and upset, you can't talk to me that way. He glanced out the side window at the vacant lot next to them. Forcing himself to speak more calmly, Tommy said, I'm sorry. You don't sound sorry. Well, I am. Well, you don't sound it. 
Tommy thought maybe he would kill her rather than wait for the minikin to do it. I'm genuinely sorry, he said. That's better. Can you take me to a hospital? He asked to get her moving. Sure, put on your seatbelt. What? It's the law. Her hair was honey dark, lank with rain and pasted to her face. Her uniform was saturated. He reminded himself that she had gone to some trouble for him. As he unreeled the shoulder harness, he said, Please, miss, please, you don't understand what's happening here. Then explain. I'm neither stupid nor deaf. For an instant, the improbability of the night left him without words again. But then they exploded in a long, hysterical gush. This thing, this doll on my doorstep. And then the stitches pulled out. It had a real eye, green eye. Red's tail dropped on my head from behind the drape. And it pretty much eats bullets of a breakfast, which is bad enough. But then it's also smart. And it's growing. What's growing? Frustration pushed him close to the edge of rudeness once more. The doll snake rat quick little monster thing is growing. The doll snake rat quick little monster thing? She repeated, eyeing him suspiciously. With a wet thunk, the shrieking minikin hit the window in the passenger door inches from Tommy's head. Tommy screamed, and the woman said, Holy shit! The minikin was growing all right, but it was also changing. Its head was proportionately larger than before and repulsively misshapen. The radiant green eyes bulged from deep sockets under an irregular bony brow. The waitress released the brake. Knock it off the window! How, for God's sake! Although the minikin still had hands, its five digits were half like fingers, half like the spatulate tentacles of a squid. It held fast to the glass with pale sucker pads on hands and feet. Tommy wasn't going to roll down the window and try to knock the thing off. No way. The blonde shifted the Ford into drive. She stomped on the accelerator hard enough to punch the van into warp speed and put them on the far side of the galaxy in maybe 18 seconds. The minikin's mouth was open wide. Its glistening black tongue flickered. Black teeth snapped against the glass. The tires found traction, and the van shot forward. Don't let it in, she implored. Why would I let it in? Don't let it in. Do you think I'm insane? The van was a rocket screaming north on the coast highway. It's trying to get in, she said. What does it want? He said, me, for some reason, I just piss it off. A slit opened the length of the beast's underside, and obscenely wriggling tubes with sucker-like mouths slithered out of its guts and attached to the window. The light inside the van wasn't good enough to reveal exactly what was happening, but Tommy saw the glass begin to smoke. He said, It's burning through the glass! Like, with acid! Barely breaking for the turn, she hung a hard ride off the highway into the entrance drive of the Newport Beach Country Club. The van canted drastically to the right, and centrifugal force threw Tommy against the door, pressing his face to the window, beyond which the minikin's extruded guts wriggled on the smoking glass. Where are you going? he demanded. Country Club parking lot, she said. At that hour, only a few vehicles stood on the blacktop. One was a delivery truck. Aiming the van at the truck, she accelerated. What are you doing? he demanded. Detachment! At the last moment, she swung to the left of the parked truck, roaring past it so close that she stripped the elaborate custom paint job off the front fender and tore off the van's side mirror. Showers of sparks streamed from tortured metal, and the minikin was jammed between the van window and the flank of the big truck. Its suckers abruptly popped loose with a sound Tommy could hear even above all the other noise. The window in the passenger door burst, and tempered glass showered across Tommy, and he thought the beast was falling into his lap. But then they were past the parked truck, and he realized that the creature had been torn away from the van. Want to circle back and run over the damn thing a few times? She shouted over the howling of the wind at the broken out window. He leaned toward her, raising his voice. That won't work. It'll crawl up into the undercarriage. Get at us one way or another. Then let's haul ass out of here. Rain slashed through the missing window and snapped against his head. It didn't bother him. He couldn't get any wetter than he was. At the speed they were making, the hooting and gibbering wind was so loud that neither of them tried to engage in conversation. As they crossed the bridge over the Back Bay Channel, a couple of miles from the parking lot where they had left the demon, the blonde finally reduced speed. The noise of the wind abated somewhat. She looked at Tommy in a way that no one had ever looked at him before, as though he was green, warty, with a head like a watermelon, and had just stepped out of a flying saucer. He cleared his throat nervously. 
<laughs> You're a pretty good driver. Surprisingly, she smiled. You're good yourself. That was some stunt with a Corvette. You went airborne pretty straight and true, but you just lost control of it in flight. Sorry about your van. It comes with the territory, she said cryptically. I'll pay for the repairs. <laughs> You're sweet. We should stop and get something to block this window. You don't need to go straight to a hospital? I'm okay, he said, but the rain's ruining your upholstery. Don't worry about it. But the damage, I'm used to it, she said. There's frequently damage. There is? I lead an eventful life. I've learned to roll with it. You're a strange woman, he said. She grinned. Thank you. He felt disoriented again. What's your name? Deliverance, she said. Deliverance Pain. P-A-Y-N-E. It was a hard birth and my mom has a weird sense of humor. He didn't get it. And then he did. Uh. People just call me Del. What's your name? Duong Fan. He startled himself. I mean Tommy. Duong Tommy? Duong nothing. My name's Tommy Fan. Are you sure? Most of the time. There really is a lot of water coming in this window. We'll stop soon. Where'd you learn to drive like that, Del? Mm, my mom. Some mother you have. <laughs> She's a hoot. She races stock cars. Not my mother, Tommy said. And power boats? And motorcycles? It has an engine. My mom wants to race it. <laughs> Dell braked at a traffic light. They were silent. Rain fell as if the sky were a dam and the breast had broken. Finally, Dell said, So, back there. That was the doll snake rat quick little monster thing, huh? As they drove, Tommy told Dell about the doll. She didn't seem to find his story either dubious or particularly astonishing. From time to time she said, uh-huh, and, mm, -hmm. and, okay, and, yeah, makes sense, as if they were discussing nothing more incredible than what she might have heard on the TV news. He paused in his tale when Dell stopped at a 24-hour-a-day supermarket. She insisted on getting a few things to clean the van and close off the shattered window, and at her request, Tommy went shopping with her. He pushed the cart. Only a few customers prowled the enormous market at that hour. Flooded with glary light from the overhead fluorescent panels, the long aisles were uncannily empty and silent, but for the ominous low-pitched hum of the compressors for the refrigerated display cases. Striding purposefully through these eerie spaces in her white shoes, white uniform, and unzipped black leather jacket, with her wet blonde hair slicked straight back and tucked behind her ears, Del Payne looked like a nurse who might also be a hell's angel. She selected a box of large plastic garbage bags, plumbing tape, paper towels, razor blades, a tape measure, one gram tablets of vitamin C, vitamin E capsules, and two 12-ounce bottles of orange juice. From an early bird display of Christmas decorations, she took a red flannel Santa hat with white trim and white pom-pom. As they were passing the dairy and deli section, she stopped and said, Do you eat tofu? Her question seemed so esoteric that Tommy could only repeat it in bafflement. Do I eat tofu? No, no, I don't like tofu. You should. Why? he asked impatiently. Because I'm Asian? I don't eat with chopsticks either. Are you always so sensitive? I'm not sensitive, he said defensively. I didn't think about you being Asian until you brought it up. Curiously, he believed that she had just now noticed the slant of his eyes and the burnt brass shade of his skin. She grinned, he said, I'm sorry. If you eat tofu five times a week, you'll never have to worry about prostate cancer. It's a homeopathic preventative. He had never met anyone whose conversation was as unpredictable as Del Payne's. I'm not worried about prostate cancer. Well, you should be. It's the third largest cause of death among men, 
or maybe fourth anyway. For men, it's right up there with heart disease and crushing beer cans against the forehead. I'm only 30. Men don't get prostate cancer until they're in their 50s or 60s. I don't want tofu. She plucked a carton of tofu from the cooler and dropped it into the shopping cart. You're never too young to start taking care of yourself. She grabbed the front of the cart and pulled it along the aisle, forcing him to keep pace with her. He said, What do you care whether I wake up 20 years from now with a prostate the size of Cleveland? We're both human beings, aren't we? What kind of person would I be if I didn't care what happens to you? You don't really know me, he said. Sure I do. You're Tuang Tommy. Tommy Fan. That's right. At the checkout station, Tommy insisted on paying. After all, you wouldn't have all the mess in the van if not for me. Okay. But just because you're paying for some plumbing tape and paper towels doesn't mean I have to sleep with you. Chip Nguyen would have replied instantly, and with a playful witticism that would have charmed her, because in addition to being a damn fine private detective, he was a master of romantic repartee. Tommy, however, racked his brain, but could think of nothing to say. You're blushing, she said, amused. I am not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Dale turned to the cashier, a middle-aged Hispanic woman wearing a tiny gold crucifix on a gold chain at her throat, and said, Is he blushing or isn't he? The cashier giggled. He's blushing. He's cute when he blushes, <laughs> said Dell. Tommy let out a long, suffering sigh and surveyed the nearly deserted market, relieved that there were no other customers close enough to hear. He was blushing so intensely that his ears felt as though they were on fire. When the cashier ran the carton of tofu across the barcode scanner, Dell said, He worries about prostate cancer. Mortified, Tommy said, I do not. Yes, you do. No, I don't. He doesn't believe tofu can prevent it, Dell told the cashier. After hitting the key to total their order, the cashier frowned at Tommy. Almost as if speaking to a child, she said, Listen here, you better believe it because it's true. The Japanese eat it every day and they have almost no prostate cancer. You see, Dell said smugly. The cashier repeated her admonition. You listen to the girl. Outside, the rain chilled him again, sluicing away the warmth of the blush. Tommy thought of the minikin, which was still out there in the night, and not as mini as it had once been. In the market, he had forgotten the damn thing. Only Dell Payne could have made him forget even briefly, that he'd been under attack by something monstrous and supernatural half an hour earlier. Are you nuts? he asked as they neared the van. I don't think so, she said brightly. Don't you realize that thing is out there somewhere? You mean the doll, snake, rat, quick little monster thing? What other thing would I mean? Well, the world is full of strange stuff. Don't you watch the X-Files, Tommy? It's out there and it's looking for me. Looking for me, too, she said. I must have pissed it off. So how can you be going on about my prostate, the benefits of tofu, when we've got some demon from hell trying to track us down? She went to the driver's door, and Tommy got in the other side of the jukebox van. Driving away from the market, she said, You're so sober, serious, so straight arrow. I can't resist tweaking you. He looked down glumly at the pair of plastic sacks on the floor between his legs. I can't believe I paid for this damn tofu. You'll like it. A few blocks from the market, in a district of warehouses and industrial buildings where there was no traffic, Dell parked the van under a freeway overpass, sheltering it from the rain. Bring the stuff we bought, she said. It looks awful lonely here. I'm not sure it's safe. Nowhere is safe unless you want it to be, she said, having entered her cryptic mode once more. What does that mean exactly? What doesn't it mean? Leaving the engine running, she went around to the back of the Ford, which was a delivery van of the kind commonly used by florists, and she opened the rear door. 
she took the supermarket bags from Tommy and emptied the contents on the floor of the cargo hold. Tommy stood watching her, shivering. He was wet through and through, and the temperature must have been in the low fifties. She said, I'll put together a cover for the broken window. You use the paper towels to soak up as much water as you can from the front seat and get rid of the glass. In the cargo hold was a cardboard carton full of smaller boxes of dog biscuits. I went shopping this afternoon for Scooty, she explained as she removed the biscuits from the larger container. Your dog, huh? The essence of all dogginess. Coolest canine on the planet. With the new tape measure, she took the accurate dimensions of the broken-out window, and then she used one of the razor blades to cut a rectangle of that precise size from the cardboard carton. She slid the panel of cardboard into one of the plastic garbage bags, folded the bag around that insert, and sealed it with lengths of the waterproof plumbing tape. More tape secured the rectangle inside and out to the glassless window frame in the passenger's door. While Dell made the rain shield, Tommy purged the front seat of water and sparkling fragments of tempered glass. As he worked, he told her how the Minikin shorted out the office lights and later erupted from the burning Corvette. Bigger? she asked. How much bigger? Almost doubled its original size and different. The thing you saw clinging to the van window, that's a hell of a lot weirder than it was when it first began to emerge from the doll. Not one vehicle drove through the underpass as they worked, and Tommy was increasingly concerned about their isolation. Repeatedly, he glanced toward the open ends of the concrete shelter, where heavy rain continued to crash down by the ton weight, bracketing the dry space in which they had taken refuge. He expected to see the radiant-eyed demon approaching menacingly through the storm. So what do you think it is? she asked. I don't know. What does it want? To kill me, I think. I don't know. There's a lot you don't know. Who did you take off? What do you do for a living, Twong Tommy? He ignored the purposeful misstatement of his name and said, I write detective stories. She laughed. <laughs> so how come, in this investigation, you can't even find your own butt? This is real life. No, it's not. With apparent seriousness, she said, There's no such thing. No such thing as real life? Reality is perception. Perceptions change. Reality is fluid. So, if by reality you mean reliably tangible objects and immutable events, then there's no such thing. He said, Are you a new age type or something? Channel spirits? Heal yourself with crystals? No, I merely said reality is perception. I'll explain someday when we have more time. Meanwhile, he said, I'll wander aimlessly in the wilderness of my ignorance. Sarcasm does not become you. Are you about finished here? I'm freezing. Dell surveyed the window repair. It'll keep the rain out, but it's not exactly the latest thing in aesthetically pleasing motor vehicle accessories. In the poor light, Tommy couldn't clearly see the elaborate Art Deco mural, but he could discern that a substantial portion of it had been scraped off the passenger side. I'm really sorry about the paint job. It must have cost a bundle. Just a little paint and a lot of time. Don't worry about it. I was thinking of redoing it anyway. She had surprised him again. You painted it yourself? I thought you were a waitress. Being a waitress is what I do. An artist is what I am. On the freeway overhead, the air brakes of a big truck screeched like the cry of a scaly behemoth raging through a Jurassic swamp. Tommy was reminded of the demon. He glanced nervously at one end of the short concrete tunnel, then at the other end. At the back of the van, Dell handed one of the two 12-ounce bottles of orange juice to Tommy and opened the other for herself. His teeth were chattering. Rather than a swig of cold orange juice, he needed a mug of steaming coffee. We don't have coffee, she said, startling him. Well, I don't want juice, he said. Yes, you do. From the two vitamin bottles, she counted out ten one-gram tablets of C and four capsules of E. After all that fear and stress, our bodies are flooded with dangerous free radicals. Incomplete oxygen molecules, tens of thousands of them, ricocheting through our bodies, damaging every cell they encounter. You need antioxidants to bind with the free radicals and disarm them. 
Tommy washed down his seven pills with the orange juice. He was cold and weary, and he could save a lot of energy by cooperating with Dell. She was indefatigable, after all, while he was merely fatigued. Do you want the tofu now? Not now. Maybe later with some chopped pineapple, she suggested. She put on the red flannel Santa hat with the white trim and white pompon, which she had bought in the supermarket. You look ridiculous, Tommy said. I think it's cute. It makes me feel good. Puts me in a holiday mood. She closed the back door of the van. Do you see a therapist regularly? He asked. I dated a dentist once, but never a therapist. Behind the wheel of the van again, she started the engine and switched on the heater. Tommy held his trembling hands in front of the dashboard vents, relishing the gush of hot air. Just before I totaled the Corvette, I decided to go see my brother Guy. Could you drop me off there? Drop you off? She said, disbelieving. And then what? Just go home and sit and wait for the doll snake rat quick little monster thing to come tear out my liver and eat it for dessert? I don't think you're in any danger. According to the message the thing apparently typed on my computer, the deadline is dawn. How exactly am I to take comfort from this? She asked. It's got until dawn to get me, and I've got until dawn to stay alive. Then the game ends. He squinted through the windshield at the silvery skeins of rain falling beyond the underpass. Could we get moving? Makes me nervous to sit here so long. Dell released the handbrake but didn't put the van in gear. Tell me what you mean, game. Whoever made the doll is willing to play by rules. Or maybe they have to. Maybe that's what the magic requires. He locked his door. Magic, sorcery, voodoo, whatever. Anyway, if I make it to dawn, maybe I'm safe. He reached across Dell and locked her door. This creature won't come after you if it's been sent to get me and has a limited amount of time to make the kill. Dell nodded thoughtfully. That makes perfect sense, she said, as though they were discussing the laws of thermodynamics. No, it's insane, he corrected, like the whole situation, but there's a certain nutty logic to it. She drummed her fingers on the steering wheel. One thing you overlooked, she checked her wristwatch. It's now seven minutes past midnight. Dawn is five and a half or at most six hours. So... Tommy, at the rate you're going, a creepy crawler will catch you by one o'clock, tear your head off, and have four or five hours of spare time on its hands. If it has hands, it'll come for me. It doesn't know who you are. How would it find you? The same way it tracks you. She tilted her head and thought. The fluffy white pompon dangled. Maybe. By the pattern of your psychic emanations. Telepathy. Or if each of us has a soul that emits a sound. Or maybe a radiance that's visible in some spectrum beyond those that ordinary humans are able to sense. A radiance as unique as a fingerprint. Then this thing could home on it. Okay, all right. Maybe it could do something like that if it was a supernatural entity. If it was a supernatural entity, if... <sighs> what else do you think it is, Tommy? A shape-changing robot they send out from MasterCard to teach you a lesson when your monthly payment is overdue? At last, Dell pulled back into the street and drove out from under the freeway, switching on the windshield wipers as heavy volleys of rain exploded across the van. I'll take you to see your brother, she said. But I'm not just dropping you off, Tofu Boy. We're in this together, all the way. At least until dawn. In Garden Grove, the New World Saigon Bakery operated in a large, tilt-up concrete industrial building surrounded by a blacktop parking lot. It was painted white, with the name of the company in simple peach-colored block letters. On Tommy's instructions, Dell drove around to the back of the building. At this late hour, the front doors were locked, and one had to enter through the kitchen. The rear parking area was crowded with employees' cars and more than 40 sizable delivery trucks. I was picturing a mom-and-pop bakery, Dell said. Yeah, that's what it was 20 years ago. 
Now they supply breads and pastries to lots of markets and restaurants, and not just Vietnamese restaurants in Orange County and up in L.A. too. It's a little empire, she said as she parked the van, doused the headlights, and switched off the engine. Even though it's gotten this big, they keep up the quality. You sound proud. Why aren't you in the family business too? I couldn't breathe. The heat of the ovens, you mean? An allergy to wheat flour? He sighed. I wish. That would have made it easy to opt out. But the problem was too much tradition. You wanted to try radical new approaches to baking? He laughed. I like you, Del. Even if you are a little crazy. I'm the sanest person you know. It was family. Vietnamese families are sometimes so tightly bound, so structured, tradition so, so like chains. But you miss it too. Not really. Yes, you do. She insisted. There's a deep sadness in you. A part of you is lost. Tommy met her gaze. In the dim light, her blue eyes might as well have been black, and they were even less readable than usual. He said, "If I hadn't found a different way, one that worked for me, I would have died inside." Then you did the right thing. Whether it was or not, I did it, and it's done. The distance between you and them can be bridged. Never quite, he disagreed. In fact. It's no distance at all compared to the light years we've all come from the Big Bang, all the billions of miles we've crossed since we were just primal matter. Don't go strange on me, Dell. Come on, let's see my brother. As they hurried through the rain between two rows of delivery trucks, Dell said, "How do you expect Guy to be able to help you? He's had to deal with gangs, so he knows about them. Gangs, cheap boys, Pomona boys, their kind." The New World Saigon Bakery operated in three eight-hour shifts. From 8 a.m. until 4 p.m., Tommy's father served as the shift manager. From 4 o'clock until midnight, the oldest Fan brother, Tom Tat, was the chief baker and shift manager. And from midnight until 8 in the morning, Gi Min filled those positions. Organized gangs intent on extortion preferred the cover of deep darkness for sabotage, which meant that Gi had been on duty during some of the nastier confrontations. For years, all three men had worked seven days a week, a full fifty-six hours each, because most of the bakery's customers needed fresh merchandise on a daily basis. When one of them needed to have a weekend off, the other two split his time between them and worked sixty-four-hour weeks without complaint. The family was finally training a cousin to serve as a shift manager on a rotating basis to allow everyone at the management level to work forty-hour weeks and at last have normal lives. They had resisted bringing in the cousin because for too long they had stubbornly waited for Tommy to return to the fold. Now, as he and Dell stepped through the back door of the New World Saigon Bakery, Tommy was conflicted. Simultaneously, he felt at home yet on dangerous ground. The air was redolent of baking bread, brown sugar, cinnamon, baker's cheese, bitter chocolate, and other tantalizing aromas less easily identifiable in the fragrant melange. This was the smell of his childhood, and it plunged him into a sensory river of wonderful memories, torrents of images from the past. This was also the smell of the future that he had rejected, and underneath the mouth-watering savor, Tommy detected a cloying sweetness that, by virtue of its very intensity, would in time sour the appetite, nauseate. Approximately forty employees in white uniforms and white caps were hard at work in the large main room. Pastry chefs. Bread bakers, assistant bakers, cleanup boys, amidst the assembly tables, dough mixing machines, cooktops, and ovens, the hot air chased away the chill of the night and rain. But at once, Tommy felt that the air was too hot to breathe comfortably. Which one's your brother? Dell asked. He's probably in the manager's office. Tommy realized Dell had removed the Santa hat. Thanks for not wearing the stupid hat. She withdrew it from a pocket in her leather jacket. I only took it off so the rain wouldn't ruin it. Please don't wear it. Don't embarrass me," he said. "You have no sense of style. Please, I want my brother to take me seriously. Doesn't your brother believe in Santa? Please, my family are very serious people. Please, please," she mocked him. But 
teasingly and without malice. Maybe they should be morticians instead of bakers. Tommy expected her to don the frivolous red flannel chapeau with characteristic defiance, but she crammed it into her pocket. She said, Take me to the somber and humorless Guy Minfan, infamous anti-Santa activist. Tommy led her along one side of the main room. The place was brightly lighted with banks of suspended fluorescent fixtures, and everything was nearly as well scrubbed as a hospital surgery. The manager's office was in the right front corner of the room, elevated four steps above the main floor. Two walls were glass, so the shift boss could see the bakery without getting up from his desk. More often than not, Guy would have been on the floor working elbow to elbow with the bakers and their apprentices. At the moment, however, he was at his computer with his back to the glass door at the top of the steps. Guy didn't turn around when Tommy and Dell entered. Minute, he said, and his fingers flew across the computer keyboard. Dell nudged Tommy and showed him the red flannel cap half out of her pocket. When he scowled, she grinned and put the cap away. When Guy finished typing, he spun around in his chair expecting to see an employee and gaped wide-eyed at his brother. Tommy! Surprise, Tommy said. Guy rose from his chair, a smile breaking across his face, but then he registered that the person with Tommy wasn't an employee either. As he turned his full attention to Dell, his smile froze. Guy, Tommy said, I would like you to meet Miss Dell Payne. Guy inclined his head politely toward her, and she held out her hand, and Guy took it after only a brief hesitation. Miss Payne? Charmed, she said. You're terribly wet, Guy told her. Yes, I like it, Dell said. Invigorating. After the first hour of a storm, the falling rain has scrubbed all the pollution from the air, and the water is so pure, so healthy, good for the skin. Yes, Guy said, looking dazed. Good for the hair, too. Tommy thought, please, God, stop her from warning him about prostate cancer. At five feet seven, Guy was three inches shorter than Tommy, and though as physically trim as his brother, he had a round face utterly unlike Tommy's. When he smiled, he resembled Buddha. Tommy wanted to hug his brother. He suspected that Guy would return his embrace, yet neither was able to display affection first, perhaps because they both feared rejection. Before Guy could speak, Tommy hurriedly said, Brother, I need your advice. My advice? Guy's stare was disconcertingly direct. My advice hasn't meant much to you for years. I'm in deep trouble. Guy glanced at Dell. She said, I'm not the trouble. Clearly, Guy doubted that assertion. In fact, Tommy said, she saved my life earlier tonight. Guy's face remained clouded. Beginning to worry that he was not going to be able to make this connection, Tommy found himself babbling. Really, she did. She saved my life, just put herself on the line for me, a total stranger, got her van bashed up because of me. She's the reason I'm even standing here, so I'd appreciate if you'd invite us to sit down and... Total stranger? Guy asked. Tommy had been plunging forward so rapidly that he had lost track of what he had said, and he didn't understand his brother's reaction. Huh? Total stranger? Guy repeated. He means, Dell explained, he thought I was your girlfriend. Tommy felt a blush, hot as oven steel, rising in his face. Guy's somber expression brightened slightly at the prospect that this was not the long-anticipated blonde who would break Mother Fawn's heart and divide the family forever. I'm not his girlfriend, Dell said to Guy. We've never dated. In fact, considering that he doesn't like my taste in hats, I don't see how we ever could date. I can't go out with a man who's critical of my taste in hats. A girl has to draw the line somewhere. Hats? Guy said, confused. Please, Tommy said, speaking as much to Dell as to Guy. Can we just sit down and talk about this? About what? Guy asked. About someone trying to kill me, that's what? Stunned. Guy Min Fan sat with his back to his computer. He indicated the two chairs on the other side of his desk. As Tommy and Dell sat, Tommy said, I think I'm in trouble with a Vietnamese gang. Don't know which one. I'm hoping you'll recognize their methods when I tell you what they've done. Guy was wearing a white shirt. He unbuttoned the left cuff, rolled up the sleeve, and showed Dell the underside of his muscular forearm, which bore a long, ugly red scar. 
38 stitches, Guy told her. How awful, she said, no longer flippant, genuinely concerned. Is worthless scum creep around, saying you have to pay them to stay in business insurance money? The police! They do what they can, not much. And if you pay the gangs what they ask, they'll want more and more, like politicians. So one night they came around, ten of them, all fast boys, cut our phone lines, figuring they could walk through the place and smash things while we would run and hide, but we surprised them. Some of us got hurt, but the gang boys got hurt worse. A lot of them were born here in the States, and they think they're tough, but they don't know suffering. They don't know what tough means. Able to repress her true nature no longer, Dell couldn't resist saying, It never pays to go up against a bunch of angry bakers. Well, the fast boys know now, Guy said with utmost seriousness. To Dell, Tommy said, Guy was 14 when we escaped Vietnam. After the fall of Saigon, the communists believe all teenage males were potential counter-revolutionaries. Guy and Don, that's my oldest brother, were arrested a few times for questioning about supposed anti-communist activities. Questioning was a euphemism for torture. At 14? Dell said, appalled. Guy shrugged. I was tortured when I was 12. Don thought my brother was 14 the first time. The police let them go each time. But then my father learned that Guy and Don were scheduled to be arrested and sent up country to a slave labor camp. We put to sea in a boat with 30 other people the night before they would have been taken away. Some of our employees are older than me, said Guy. They went through much worse back home. Dell turned in her chair to look out at the men on the bakery floor, all of whom appeared deceptively ordinary in their white caps and uniforms. Nothing's ever what it seems, she said thoughtfully. To Tommy, Guy said, Why would the gangs be after you? Maybe something I wrote when I still worked at the newspaper. So what have they done to you? Tommy glanced at Dell, and she rolled her eyes. Although Tommy had intended to tell Guy every detail of the night's events, he was now reluctant to risk disbelief and scorn. Guy was less of a traditionalist and more understanding than Don or their parents, yet he was a faithful son in the fullest Vietnamese sense, and he disapproved of the path Tommy had taken. His respect for his younger brother had declined steadily in recent years. Now Tommy was surprised by how desperately he wanted to avoid sinking further in Guy's esteem. He had thought he'd learned to live with his family's disapproval. But he was wrong. He was panicky at the prospect of Guy dismissing the tale of the doll thing as the ravings of a drug-addled mind. Family was the source of all blessings and the home of all sadness. If that wasn't a Vietnamese saying, it should have been. He might have risked speaking of the demon anyway, if he had come alone, but Dell's presence already prejudiced Guy against him. Therefore, Tommy thought carefully before he spoke. Guy, have you ever heard of any gang that sends something as a warning to people they intend to target? Warning? Tommy squirmed in his chair. Well, say like a doll. Frowning, Guy said. Doll? A rag doll. Guy looked at Dell for illumination. Ugly little rag doll, she said. With a message on a paper pinned to its hand, Tommy said. What was the message? I don't know. It was written in Vietnamese. You once could read Vietnamese, Guy reminded him in a tone of voice thick with disapproval. When I was little, Tommy agreed, not now. Let me see this doll, Guy said. It's... Well, I don't have it now, but I have the note. He slipped two fingers into the pocket of his flannel shirt and withdrew the sodden note, dismayed by its condition. Fortunately, the parchment-like paper had a high oil content, which prevented it from dissolving entirely into mush. When Tommy carefully unfolded it, he saw that the three columns of ideograms were still visible, though badly faded and smeared. Guy held the note in his cupped palm as if he were providing a perch for a weary and delicate butterfly. The ink has run. I can't read it easily. So many ideograms are alike, but with one small difference. Not like English letters, words. Each small difference in the stroke of the pen can create a whole new meaning. I'd have to dry this out, use a magnifying glass, study it. Leaning forward in his chair, Tommy said, How long to decipher it, if you can? A couple of hours? If I can. Guy raised his gaze from the note. 
You haven't told me what they did to you. Broke into my house, vandalized it, later ran me off the road and the car rolled twice. You weren't hurt? I'll be sore as hell in the morning, but I got out of the car without a cut. They chased me and I ran, and just when they almost nailed me, Dale pulled up in her van and got me out of there. You haven't gone to the police? No, they can't protect me. He nodded, not in the least surprised. Like most Vietnamese of his generation, he did not fully trust the police, even here in America. In their homeland, before the fall of Saigon, the police had been mostly corrupt, and after the communist takeover, they had been worse, sadistic torturers and murderers. There's a deadline, Tommy said, so it's really important that you figure out what that note says as soon as possible. They mean to get me before sunrise, and they'll stop at nothing to keep to that timetable. Guy said, you can stay here while I work on the message. No one can hurt you here. Not with all those men down on the floor to stand with you. Tommy shook his head and rose from his chair. I don't want to draw these... these gangsters here. Del got to her feet as well and moved to his side. I don't want to cause you trouble, Guy. We can handle them like before. I'd better keep moving so they can't find me. I'll call you in a couple hours to see if you've been able to translate the note. Guy rose from his chair. You came for advice, you said, not just to have this message translated. Well, my advice is, you're safer trusting in family. I do trust in you, Guy. But you trust a stranger more, Guy said pointedly. It saddens me to hear you say that, Guy. It saddens me to have to say it, his brother replied. Tommy and Dell left the office, went into the enormous bakery. He felt profoundly confused, petty, stubborn, stupid, guilty, and miserable, all emotions that the legendary private detective Chip Nguyen had never felt, had never been capable of feeling. The aromas of chocolate, cinnamon, brown sugar, nutmeg, yeasty baking bread, and hot lemon icing were no longer appealing. Indeed, he was half sickened by the stench. Tonight the smell of the bakery was the smell of loss and loneliness and foolish pride. As he and Dell passed the coolers and storerooms, heading toward the back of the building, she said, Thanks for preparing me for the glorious reception I received. I told you how it was with me and the family. You made it sound strained between you and them. It's more like the Capulets and Montagues and the Hatfields and the McCoys all thrown together and named Fawn. It's not that dramatic, he disagreed. Halfway across the room from the shift manager's office, Tommy stopped, turned, and looked back. Guy was standing at one of the big windows in that managerial roost, watching them. Tommy waved. When Guy didn't return the wave, the bakery stench seemed to intensify, and Tommy walked faster toward the rear exit. Lengthening her stride to keep up with him, Del Payne said, He thinks I'm the whore of Babylon. He disapproves of me, even if I did save your life. He thinks I'm a wicked, white temptress who's leading you straight into the fiery pit of eternal damnation. Just imagine what he'd think if you'd worn the Santa hat. What if I was a wicked, white temptress? She asked. What are you talking about? As they reached the rear exit, she halted Tommy before he could open the door. Would you be tempted? You are nuts. Have you forgotten the issue here? Sure, sure, the doll snake rat quick little monster thing. But listen, you're an attractive guy in spite of all your glowering, all your deep angst, all your playing at being Mr. Mysterious East. A girl could fall for you, but if she did, would you be available? Not if I'm dead, she smiled. That's a definite yes. He closed his eyes and counted to ten. When he was at four, Dell said, What are you doing? Counting to ten. Why? To calm down. Mm, what number are you at? Six. Mm, what number now? Seven. What number now? Eight. When he opened his eyes, she said, 
I do excite you, don't I? You scare me. How are we going to manage to keep this supernatural thing from killing us if you keep acting this way? What way? He took a deep breath, started to speak, decided there was no adequate reply, exhaled explosively, and said only, Have you ever been in an institution? Does the post office count? Muttering a curse, Tommy pushed open the metal door. He stepped into the skirling wind and the rain, and he immediately regretted doing so. In the bakery heat, he had gotten warm for the first time since scrambling out of the wrecked Corvette, and his clothes had begun to dry. Dell followed him into the storm as ebullient as any child. Hey, did you ever see Gene Kelly and Singing in the Rain? Don't start dancing, he warned. You need to be more spontaneous, Tommy. I'm very spontaneous, he said, tucking his head down to keep the rain out of his eyes. He bent into the wind and headed toward the battered, mural-bright van, which stood under a tall lamppost. You're about as spontaneous as a rock. Splashing through ankle-deep puddles, shivering, poised at the slippery slope of self-pity, he didn't bother to answer. Tommy, wait, she said and grabbed his arm again. Cold and wet and impatient, he demanded, Now what? It's here. No longer flirtatious or flippant. As alert as a deer scenting a wolf, she stared past Tommy. It. He followed the direction of her gaze. Where? In the van. Waiting for us in the van. Oil black rain briefly blazed as bright as molten gold down through lamplight, drizzled over the van, and then puddled black again around the tires. Where? Tommy asked, blinking rain out of his eyes, studying the murkiness beyond the van's windshield. She said, It's there, all right, in the van. I sense it. Suddenly you're psychic? Not suddenly. I've always had strong, reliable intuition. Thirty feet away, the Ford van was exactly as it had been when they had left it to go into the bakery. Tommy didn't feel what Dell felt. He perceived no sinister aura around the vehicle. She said, We have to go. Let's take one of these cars. An employee's car? She was already moving away from the van among the more than thirty vehicles that belonged to the bakery workers. Glancing warily back at the van, Tommy hurried to keep up with her. We can't do that. It's stealing. It's survival. She tried the door of a Chevy, locked. Let's go back into the bakery. The deadline is dawn, remember? She said, moving on to a Honda. The thing won't wait forever. It'll come in after us. She opened the driver's door of the Honda and slipped in behind the steering wheel. No keys dangled in the ignition. At the open door, Tommy said, Let's just walk out of here. We wouldn't get far on foot before it caught us. I'm going to have to hotwire this crate. Tommy glanced over his shoulder. Except for the rain, the night was deathly still around Dell's van. Come on, come on, Dell muttered to herself, fumbling with the wires. And then the Honda engine caught, revved. Tommy's stomach turned over at the sound, for he seemed to be sliding ever faster down a greased slope to destruction, if not at the hands of the demon, then by his own actions. Hurry, get in, Dell said as she released the handbrake. This is car theft, he argued. She pulled the driver's door shut, forcing him to step back. Under the tall sodium vapor lamp, the silent van appeared to be deserted. All the doors remained closed. Already its ominous aura had faded. Tommy had allowed himself to be infected by Dell's hysteria. The thing to do now was get control of himself, walk over to the van, and show her that it was safe. Dell drove forward. Tommy ran around to the passenger side, caught up with the car, pulled open the door, and jumped inside. Wait a second! No! She tramped the accelerator, and the car shot across the parking lot, and Tommy's door was flung shut. What if the cops stop us? He worried. At the end of the large building, before turning the corner, Dell braked hard. The car shrieked, fishtailing to a full stop. Studying her rearview mirror, she said, Look back! The van! Under the tall lamppost, falling rain danced on empty pavement.
the van was gone. Where did it go? Tommy asked. Maybe out to the alley, or maybe around the other side of the building, or maybe it's just behind those delivery trucks. I can't figure out why it didn't come straight after us. She drove along the other side of the bakery toward the front. Bewildered, Tommy said, but who's driving it? Not a who, a what? That's ridiculous, he said. It's a lot bigger now. And it's got a driver's license, huh? It's changed. Very different from what you've seen before. Yeah? What's it like now? I don't know. I didn't see it. I just know. It's different. Tommy tried to envision a monstrous entity, something like one of the ancient gods from an old H.P. Lovecraft story, with a bulbous skull, mean little scarlet eyes across its forehead, a sucking hole where the nose should be, and a wicked mouth surrounded by a ring of writhing tentacles, comfortably ensconced behind the steering wheel of the van, fumbling with a tentacle at the heater controls, punching the radio selector buttons in search of some old-fashioned rock and roll, and checking the glove box for breath mints. Better belt up, she said. We might be in for a bumpy ride. As Tommy buckled his safety harness, Dell drove speedily but warily across the front parking lot. Clearly, she expected the Art Deco van to bullet out of the night and crash into them. A debris-clogged storm train had allowed a lake to form at the exit from the lot. Dell slowed and turned right into the street through the dirty water. Theirs was the only vehicle in sight. Where did it go? Dell wondered. Why isn't it following us? Tommy checked his wristwatch. Eleven minutes past one o'clock. Dell said, I don't like this. Tick-tock. Half a mile from the bakery in the stolen Honda, Tommy broke a three-block silence. Where did you learn to hotwire a car? My mom taught me. What is she, a getaway driver for the mob? In her youth, she was a ballet dancer, long time ago. Of course, all ballet dancers can hotwire a car. Not all of them, Dell disagreed. What does your father do? Checking the rearview mirror for any sign of a pursuer, Dell said, Daddy plays poker with the angels. You're losing me again. He died when I was ten. Tommy regretted the sarcastic tone he had adopted. He felt coarse and insensitive. I'm sorry. That's tough, only ten. Mom shot him. Numbly, he said, Your mother, the ballerina, she shot him. Well, he asked her to. Tommy nodded, feeling stupid for having regretted his sarcasm. He slipped comfortably back into it. Of course he did. She couldn't refuse. It's a marital obligation in your religion, is it? To kill one's spouse upon request? He was dying of cancer, Dell said. Tommy felt chastened again. I'm so sorry. They were no longer in an industrial district. The broad avenue was lined with commercial enterprises. Dell said, Pancreatic cancer. When the pain got so bad, Daddy couldn't concentrate on the cards anymore. He was ready to go. Cards? I told you, Daddy was a professional poker player. No, you said he now plays poker with the angels. Well, why would he be playing poker with them if he wasn't a professional poker player? Point taken, Tommy said, because sometimes he was smart enough to know when he had been defeated. Daddy traveled all over the country, playing in high-stakes games, most illegal, though he played a lot of legal games in Vegas, too. Mom and I went with him everywhere, so by the time I was ten, I'd seen most of this country three times or more. Wishing he could just keep his mouth shut, but too fascinated to resist, Tommy said, So your mother shot him, huh? He was in the hospital, pretty bad by then, and he knew he was never getting out. Mom put the gun against his chest, over his heart, and Daddy told her he loved her more than any man had ever loved a woman, and she said she loved him and would see him on the other side, and then she pulled the trigger, and he died instantly. Aghast, Tommy said, You weren't there at the time, were you? Heavens, no. What kind of person do you think Mom is? She'd never have put me through something like that. I'm sorry. I should have... She told me all about it an hour later, before the cops came by the house to arrest her, and she gave me the expended cartridge from the round that killed him. 
Dell reached inside her wet uniform blouse and fished out a gold chain. The pendant suspended at the end of the chain was an empty brass shell casing. When I hold this, Dell said, wrapping her hand around the shell casing, I can feel the love, the incredible love they had for each other. Isn't that the most romantic thing ever? Ever, Tommy said. She sighed, tucking the pendant in her blouse. If Daddy hadn't gotten cancer until I hit puberty, he wouldn't have had to die. For a while, Tommy struggled to understand that one. But at last he said, Puberty? Well, it wasn't meant to be. Fate is fate, she said cryptically. Half a block ahead of them, on the far side of the wide street, a police cruiser was just starting to turn out of the westbound lane into the parking lot at an all-night diner. Cops, Tommy said, pointing. Better slow down. No, I'm worried about Scooty. We're in a stolen car, he reminded her. They breezed past the police cruiser without slowing. Tommy twisted in his seat to look through the back window. Don't worry about him, Dell said. He won't come after us. The squad car had braked when they shot past it. Who's Scooty? Tommy asked, still watching the patrol car. I told you before, my dog. Don't you ever listen? After a hesitation, the squad car continued to pull into the parking lot at the diner. The lure of coffee and donuts was apparently stronger than the call of duty. As Tommy let out a sigh of relief and faced front again, Dell said, Would you shoot me if I asked you to? Absolutely. She smiled at him. You're so sweet. Did your mother go to jail? Only till the trial was over. The jury deliberated only 14 minutes and they were crying like babies when the foreman read the verdict. The judge was crying too, and the bailiff. Not a dry eye in the courtroom. I'm not surprised. Tommy said. After all, it's an extremely touching story. He wasn't sure whether he was being sarcastic or not. Why are you worried about Scooty? There's some weird thing driving around in my van, so maybe it knows my address now and even knows how much I love my Scooty. You think it stopped chasing us so it could go kill your dog? She frowned. You're saying that's unlikely? It's me that's cursed. Me that it's been sent to get. Disapprovingly, she said, Well, look who's turned into Mr. Ego. You're not the center of the universe, you know. I am as far as this demon is concerned. I'm its whole reason for existence. I'm not taking any chances with Scooty, she said stubbornly. He's safer at home than with us. He's safest with me. She turned south on Harbor Boulevard. Even at that hour and in the rain, there was a steady flow of traffic. Anyway, she said, as far as I can see, you don't have any clever plan for survival that needs put into action this minute. Just keep moving, I think. When we stop, it's easier for the thing to find us. You can't know that for sure. I have intuition too, you know. Yeah, but it's mostly bogus. It is not, he disagreed. I'm very intuitive. Then why did you bring this devil doll into your house? And later, you thought you'd gotten away clean. You didn't know it was hitching a ride in the Corvette's engine compartment. No one's intuition is totally reliable. Now, honey, face it. Back there at the bakery, you would have gotten in the van. Tommy chose not to respond. With a computer, or even a pencil and paper, and enough time, he could have crafted a reply to refute her, to humble her with penetrating insights and dazzling wit. But he had neither a computer nor, with dawn rolling toward them out of the now black east, enough time. So we would have to spare her the punishing experience of his devastating verbal virtuosity. Placatingly, Dell said, We'll stop at my place just long enough to pick up Scooty, and then we'll hit the road again until it's time to call your brother and see if he's translated the note. Newport Harbor, home to one of the largest armadas of private yachts in the world, was enclosed on the north by the curve of the continental shoreline and on the south by a three-mile-long peninsula that extended west to east and separated the hundreds of protected boat docks and moorings from the surges of the Pacific. The homes on the shoreline and on the five islands within the harbor were among the priciest in Southern California. Dell lived on Balboa Peninsula in a sleek, three-story contemporary house that faced the harbor. As they approached the place, Tommy stared in astonishment. Because she had left her garage door opener in the van, Dell parked the stolen Honda on the street. 
Tommy continued to stare through the blurring rain after Dell switched off the wipers. In the glow of the landscape lighting that lit the queen palms, every corner of the house was softly rounded. The patinated copper windows had radius corners, and the white stucco was troweled so smoothly that it appeared to be as slick as marble, especially when wet with rain. It was less like a house than like a small, graceful cruise ship that had run aground. You live here? he asked wonderingly. She opened her door. Come on, Scooty's worried about me. Tommy followed her through the rain to a sculptured copper gate at one side of the house, where she entered a series of numbers, the disarming code, into a security keypad. The rent must be astronomical, he said. No rent, no mortgage. It's mine, she said, unlocking the gate with keys that she had fished from her purse. Following her along a covered, pale quartzite walkway, in which flecks of mica glimmered like diamond chips under the light from the low-path lamps, he said, But this must have cost a fortune. The walkway led into a romantic courtyard paved with the same quartzite, sheltered by more dramatically lighted queen palms. Bewildered, he said, I thought you were a waitress. Being a waitress is what I do. An artist is what I am. You sell your paintings? You didn't pay for this from tips. Lamps glowed in one downstairs room facing onto the courtyard. As Tommy followed Dell to the front door, those windows went dark. Wait, he whispered urgently. The lights. Maybe the thing got here ahead of us. No, that's just Scooty playing with me, she assured him. The dog can turn off the lights? She giggled. Wait till you see. She unlocked the front door and stepping into the foyer said, Lights on. Responding to her vocal command, the overhead fixture in two sconces glowed. The place is totally automated, and I have the software customized, so Scooty can turn the lights on in any room with one bark and turn them off with two. You could train him to do that? Tommy asked, closing the door behind him and engaging the thumb-turned deadbolt. Sure. Otherwise he never barks, so he can't confuse the system. Poor thing when he's here alone. He should be able to have it dark if he wants to nap and light if he's feeling lonely or spooked. Tommy had expected the dog to be waiting at the door, but it was not in sight. Where is he? Hiding, she said, putting her purse on a foyer table with a black granite top. He wants me to find him. A dog that plays hide and seek? Without hands, it's too frustrating to play Scrabble. Tommy's wet shoes squished and squeaked on the honed travertine floor. We're making a mess. It's not Chernobyl, it'll clean up. At one end of the generous foyer, a door stood ajar. Dell went to it, leaving wet shoe prints on the marble. Is my naughty little furball in the powder room? She asked in an annoyingly cute, coddling tone of voice. Hmm? Is my bad boy hiding from his mommy in the powder room? She opened the door, manually switched on the lights, but the dog wasn't there. I didn't think so, she said, leading Tommy into the living room. That was too easy. Lights on. The large travertine-floored living room was furnished with J. Robert Scott sofas and chairs upholstered in platinum and gold fabrics, blonde-finished tables in exotic woods, and bronze Art Deco lamps in the form of nymphs holding luminous crystal balls. The enormous Persian carpet was so softly colored that it must have been an antique. Dell's vocal command had switched on mood lighting low enough to minimize reflection on the glass wall and allow Tommy to see outside to the patio, the boat dock, and the rain-dimmed harbor lights. Scooty was not in the living room, study, or dining room. Following Dell through a swinging door, Tommy stepped into a large, stylish kitchen with black granite countertops. Oh, him not here either, Dell said, cooing again as if talking to a baby. Where could my Scooty Woodhams be? Tommy was riveted by a wall clock with a green neon rim. It was 1.44 in the morning. Time was running out, so the demon was sure to be seeking them with increasing fury. Let's find the dog and get out of here, he said nervously. Pointing to the section of cabinetry next to which Tommy stood, Dell said, Get me the broom out of there. It's the broom closet. Tommy opened the door. 
Squeezed into the broom closet was a huge midnight black creature with teeth bared and fat pink tongue lolling, and Tommy bolted backward, slipped in his own wet shoe prints, and fell on his butt before he realized that it wasn't the demon leering out at him. It was a dog. An enormous black Labrador. Dell laughed delightedly and clapped her hands. I knew you were in there, you naughty little furball. Scooty grinned out at them. I knew you'd give Tommy a good scare, she told the dog. Yeah, just what I needed, Tommy said, getting to his feet. Panting, Scooty came out of the closet. The space was so narrow and the dog so large that it was like a cork coming out of a wine bottle, and Tommy half expected to hear a pop. How'd he get in there? Tommy wondered. Tail wagging, Scooty went to Dell, and she dropped to her knees to pet him and scratched behind his ears. Him missed Mommy, did him? Hmm? Was him lonely? My fuzzy wuzzy baby, my cutie Scooty. He couldn't step in there and turn around, Tommy said. Not enough room. He probably backed into it, Dell said, hugging Scooty. Dogs don't back into things any more than motorcycles do. Besides, how did he open the cabinet in the first place? Pawed it open? He's clever. Why did you teach him to play hide and seek? Didn't teach him. He always liked to do it. Del puckered her lips and made kissing sounds. The dog took the cue and began to lick her face. That's disgusting, Tommy said. Giggling, Del said, <laughs> His mouth is cleaner than yours. I seriously doubt that. As if quoting from a medical journal, she said, The chemical composition of a dog's saliva makes its mouth a hostile environment for the spectrum of bacteria that are harmful to people. Bullshit. To Scooty, she said, He's jealous because he wants to lick me. Nonplussed, blushing, Tommy looked at the wall clock. Okay, we have the dog, so let's get out of here. Rising to her feet, Heading out of the kitchen, with the dog at her heels, Dell said, A waitress's uniform isn't suitable gear for a girl on the lam. Give me five minutes to change clothes. The longer we stay in one place, the quicker it'll find us. In a train, woman, dog, and man, they crossed the dining room. Relax, Tommy. There's always enough time if you think there is. What's that mean? Whatever you expect is what will be. So simply change your expectations she said, enigmatic once more. In the living room, he said, Damn it! Wait a minute! Dell turned to look at him. The dog turned to look at him. Tommy sighed, gave up. Okay, change your clothes, but hurry! To the dog, Dell said, You stay here and get acquainted with Tong Tommy. Then she went into the foyer and up the stairs. Scooty cocked his head, studying Tommy as if he were a strange and amusing form of life never seen before. Your mouth is not cleaner than mine, Tommy said. Scooty pricked one ear. You heard me, Tommy said. He crossed the room to the large glass sliding doors and gazed out at the harbor. Most of the houses on the far shore were dark. Where dock and landscape lamps glowed, attenuated reflections of gold and silver light glimmered hundreds of feet across the black water. After a few seconds, Tommy turned and saw the dog hiding behind the sofa, only its head revealed, observing him. I see you, Tommy said. Scooty pulled his head back out of sight. Tommy looked at the harbor again. He heard noises behind him and knew that Scooty was on the move. From elsewhere in the room came the sound of a fart. Bad dog, he said. The sound repeated. Finally, Tommy turned. Scooty was sitting on his hind quarters in one of the armchairs, staring at Tommy, both ears pricked, holding a large rubber hot dog in his mouth. Perhaps the rubber hot dog had once produced a squeak or a whistle, but now only a repulsive flatulence issued from it. Checking his watch, Tommy said, Come on, Dell! Then he went to an armchair that faced the one in which the dog sat, with the coffee table between them. He and Scooty stared at each other. The Labrador's eyes were dark and soulful. You're a strange dog, Tommy said. Scooty bit the hot dog again, producing the blatty noise. That's annoying, Scooty chomped on the toy. Don't! I'm warning you. Again, the dog bit the toy. Again, and a third time. Don't make me take it away from you, Tommy said. Scooty dropped the hot dog on the floor and barked twice. 
The room was plunged into darkness, and Tommy was startled out of his chair before he remembered that two closely spaced barks was the signal that told the computer to switch off the lights. Even as Tommy was bolting to his feet, Scooty was coming across the coffee table in the dark. The dog leaped, and Tommy was carried backward into the leather armchair. The dog was all over him, chuffing, licking his face. Stop! Damn it, stop! Get off me! Scooty scrambled off Tommy's lap onto the floor, but seized the heel of his right shoe and worried at it. Not wanting to kick at the mutt, afraid of hurting it, Tommy reached down, trying to get hold of its burly head. The rock port suddenly slipped off his foot. Scooty hustled away through the darkness with the shoe. Getting to his feet, Tommy said, Lights! The room remained dark, and then he remembered the complete command. Lights on! Scooty was gone. From the study, adjacent the living room, came a single bark, and light appeared beyond the open door. They're both crazy, Tommy muttered as he went around the coffee table and picked up the rubber bone. Scooty appeared in the study doorway, without the shoe. When he saw that he'd been seen, he retreated. Limping to the study, Tommy said, Maybe the dog wasn't always crazy. Maybe she made it crazy, the same way she's making me crazy. When he entered the study, he found the dog standing on the desk, like an absurdly oversized decorative accessory. Where's my shoe? Scooty cocked his head as if to say, What shoe? Brandishing the toy hot dog, Tommy said, I'll throw it in the harbor. It's late. I'm tired. My Corvette blew up. Some damned thing is after me, so I'm in no mood for games. Soulful eyes focused intently on the toy. Scooty whined. Tommy circled the desk, searching for his shoe. Atop the desk, Scooty turned, following him with interest. If I find it without your help, Tommy warned, then I won't give the hot dog back. Find what? Dell asked from the doorway. She had changed into blue jeans and a cranberry red turtleneck sweater. She was holding two big guns. What the hell are those? Tommy asked. Hefting the weapon in her right hand, she said, This is a short-barreled, pump-action, pistol-grip, 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun. Excellent home defense weapon. She raised the gun in her left hand. This beauty is a Desert Eagle 44 Magnum pistol, Israeli-made. It's a real doorbuster. It'll stop a charging bull. You run into a lot of charging bulls? Or the equivalent. I told you I lead an eventful life. He remembered how easily she had dismissed the damage to her van earlier in the evening. It comes with the territory. There's frequently damage. I've learned to roll with it. Tommy sensed a Satori. A sudden profound insight, looming like a tidal wave, and he waited breathlessly for it to wash over him. This woman was not what she appeared to be. Her eccentricities and her habit of peppering her conversation with cryptic babble had convinced him that she had a few screws loose, but now he suspected that the worst mistake he could make would be to write her off as a flake. She had depths that he was only beginning to perceive. He recalled another fragment of their conversation, and it seemed to have new import. Reality is perception. Perceptions change. Reality is fluid. So if by reality you mean reliably tangible objects and immutable events, then there's no such thing. He sensed that every screwball statement she made was not, in fact, as screwball as it seemed. Within Dell was hidden a different person, someone with a secret, who was cloaked by the ditzy image that she projected. The Satori, tidal wave of revelation, loomed and then began to recede without bringing him understanding. He had strained too hard. Sometimes enlightenment came only when it wasn't sought or welcomed. Dell stood in the doorway between the study and the living room, a gun in each hand, meeting Tommy's gaze so directly that he half suspected she knew what he was thinking. Frowning, he said, Who are you, Del Payne? Who is any of us? She countered. Don't start that again. Don't start what? That inscrutable crap. What are you doing with Scooty's rubber hot dog? Tommy glared at the Labrador on the desk. He took my shoe. Admonishingly, she said, Bad, Scooty! Give Tommy his shoe! Scooty studied Tommy, then chuffed dismissively. Give Tommy his shoe, 
Dell repeated firmly. Finally, the dog jumped down from the desk, patted to a potted palm, poked its head behind the celadon pot, and returned with the shoe in his mouth. He dropped it on the floor at Tommy's feet. When Tommy bent down to pick up his shoe, the dog put one paw on it and stared at the rubber hot dog. Tommy put the hot dog on the floor. The Labrador picked up the hot dog with his mouth and only then lifted his paw off the shoe. He padded into the living room, biting on the toy to produce the farting sound. Staring thoughtfully after Scooty, Tommy said, Where did you get that mutt? At the pound. From the living room came a veritable symphony of rubber hot dog flatulence. Tommy said, Where did you really get him? At a pet store? I don't believe that either. Put on your shoe, she said, and let's get out of here. He hobbled to a chair. Something strange about that dog. Okay, okay, Dell said flippantly. I'm a witch, and he's my familiar, an ancient supernatural entity who helps me make magic. I'd believe that before I'd believe you found him at the pound. He's got a demonic side to him. Oh, he's just a little jealous, Dell said. The two of you are going to get along famously. Slipping his foot into the shoe, Tommy said, What about the house? How can you afford this place? I'm an heiress, she said. He tied the shoelace and got to his feet. Heiress? I thought your father was a professional poker player. He was, a damn good one, and he invested his winnings wisely. When he died, he left $34 million. Tommy gaped at her. You're serious, aren't you? When am I not? That's the question, all right. You know how to use a pump-action shotgun? Sure, but guns aren't going to stop it. She handed the Mossberg to him. They might slow it down, like your pistol did. And these pack a lot more punch. Come on, let's hit the road. Lights out! Following her out of the now dark study, Tommy said, But when you're already a multimillionaire, why do you work as a waitress? To understand. Understand what? Moving toward the foyer, she said, Lights out! And the living room went dark. To understand what the average person's life is like to keep my feet on the ground. That's ridiculous. My paintings wouldn't have any soul if I didn't live part of my life the way most people do. She opened the door to the foyer closet and slipped a blue nylon ski jacket off a hanger. Labor, hard work is at the center of most people's lives. But most people have to work. You don't. So in the end, if it's only a choice for you, how can you really understand the necessity the rest of us feel? Don't be mean. I'm not being mean, he said. You are. I don't have to be a rabbit and get myself torn to pieces in order to understand how a poor bunny feels when a hungry fox chases it through a field. Actually, I suspect you do have to be the rabbit to really know that kind of terror. Shrugging into the ski jacket, she said, Well, I'm not a rabbit, and I'm not going to become a rabbit. What an absurd idea. If you want to know what that kind of terror feels like, then you become a rabbit. Befuddled, Tommy said, Stop twisting things around. We aren't talking about rabbits, for God's sake. Well, we certainly weren't talking about squirrels. Trying to get the discussion back on track, he said, Are you really an artist? Sorting through the other coats in the closet, she said, Is any of us really anything? Exasperated with her cryptograms, Tommy indulged in one himself. We're anything in the sense that we are everything. You finally said something sensible. I have. Behind Tommy, as if by way of comment, Scooty bit the rubber hot dog. <clears throat> Dell said, I'm afraid none of my jackets will fit you. I'll be okay. I've been cold and wet before. On the granite-topped foyer table beside Dell's purse were two boxes of ammunition, cartridges for the Desert Eagle and shells for the 12-gauge Mossberg that Tommy carried. She put down the pistol and began to fill the half-dozen zippered pockets of her ski jacket with spare rounds for both weapons. Tommy studied the painting that hung above the table, a bold work of abstract art in primary colors. Is this your painting? That would be tacky, don't you think? I keep all my canvases in my studio upstairs. I'd like to see them. I thought you were in a hurry. Tommy sensed that the paintings were the key that would unlock the mysteries of this strange woman. <coughs> and her strange dog. Something about her style or her subject matter would be a revelation, and upon seeing what she had painted, 
he would achieve the satori that had eluded him earlier. It'll only take five minutes, he pressed. Still jamming spare ammo into her pockets, she said, We've got to get out of here. Why are you suddenly so evasive? he asked. Zipping shut a pocket bulging with shotgun shells, she said, I'm not being evasive. Yes, you are. What the hell have you been painting up there? Why are you so nervous all of a sudden? I'm not. This is weird. Look me in the eyes, Del. Kittens, she said, avoiding his gaze. Kittens? That's what I've been painting. Stupid, tacky, sentimental crap. Because I'm not really very talented. Kittens with big eyes. Sad little kittens with big, sorrowful eyes, and happy little kittens with big, laughing eyes. That's why I don't want you to see them, Tommy. I'd be embarrassed. You're lying. He started toward the stairs. Two minutes is all I need. She snatched the Desert Eagle forty-four Magnum off the foyer table, swung toward him, and pointed the weapon at his face. Stop. Dell, that gun's loaded. I know. Don't point it at me. Get away from the stairs, Tommy. The muzzle of the Desert Eagle was only ten inches from Tommy and aligned with the bridge of his nose. He was looking at a new deliverance paint. Steely. His heart thudded hard enough to shake his entire body. You won't shoot me. I will, she said with icy conviction. Just to keep me from seeing some paintings? You're not ready to see them yet, she said. Meaning, someday you will want me to see them? When the time is right. Tommy's mouth was so dry that he had to work up some saliva to loosen his tongue. I won't ever see them if you blow my brains out. Good point, she said, aiming the pistol at his right knee. So, I'll shoot you in the leg. One round from that monster would blow my whole damn leg off. They make excellent prosthetic limbs these days. You're a total fruitcake, Dell. He meant what he said. To one extent or another, she had to be mentally unbalanced, even though she had told him earlier that she was the sanest person he knew. Nevertheless, though she scared him, she was enormously appealing as well. Tommy wondered what it said about his own sanity that he was strongly attracted to this basket case. He wanted to kiss her. Incredibly, she said, I think I'm going to fall in love with you, Tuong Tommy, so don't make me blow your leg off. Astonished into a blush, conflicted as never before, Tommy turned away from the stairs and went past Dell to the front door. She tracked him with the desert eagle. I'll wait until you're ready to show them to me, he said, but when I finally see them, they better be worth the wait. Just kittens she said, smiling and lowering her weapon. He was surprised that her smile could still warm him. I'm as crazy as you are, he said. Then you've probably got what it takes to make it till dawn. Slinging her purse over one shoulder, she said, Let's go. Do you have another car besides the van? No. Mom has quite a collection. If I need something besides the van, I borrow it from her, so we'll have to use the Honda. Opening the door, Tommy said, Lights off, and the foyer went dark. If a cop stops us in our stolen Honda, will you shoot him? Of course not, she said, following him and Scooty into the courtyard. That would be wrong. That would be wrong, Tommy said, still capable of being amazed by her. But it would have been right to shoot me? Regrettable, but right, she confirmed as she locked the door. I don't understand you at all. I know, she said, tucking the keys in her purse. Tommy checked his watch. Six minutes past two o'clock. Tick-tock. While they had been inside the house, the wind had died, but the power of the storm had not diminished. Though no thunder or lightning disturbed the night, cataracts still crashed down from the riven sky. The queen palms hung limp, drizzling from every frond. Scooty led them through the puddled courtyard. In the courtside paving, specks of mica glinted around the dog's splashing paws, almost as if his claws were striking sparks from the stone. 
The copper gate was cold against Tommy's hand as he pushed it open. The hinges rasped like small, whispering voices. On the sidewalk in front of the house, Scooty halted, pricked his ears, dropped his rubber hot dog, and growled softly. Alerted by the dog, Tommy brought up the shotgun. What is it? Dale asked, holding the gate open behind them. But for the splatter-splash gurgle plink of water, the lamplit street was silent. The houses were all dark. No traffic approached from either east or west. The white Honda stood fifteen feet to Tommy's right. Something could be crouched along the far side of it. Scooty was not interested in the Honda, however, and Tommy was inclined to trust the Labrador's senses more than his own. The dog was riveted by something directly across the street. In the storm, the slumbering houses huddled, and the blackness of their blind windows revealed not even a single pale face of any neighborhood insomniac. Palms, ficuses, and canopied carrot woods stood solemnly in the windless downpour. Scooty flattened his ears against his skull and growled again, and Tommy spotted the man in the hooded raincoat. The guy stood near one of the large carrot woods across the street, vaguely illumined. Dell had seen something else that surprised her. Tommy? He glanced at her, and she pointed east. Half a block away, on the far side of the street, her battered van was parked at the curb. Something about the imposing figure under the carrot wood tree was anachronistic as though he had stepped through a time warp, out of the medieval world into the late twentieth century. Then Tommy realized that the hooded raincoat was the source of that impression, for it resembled a monk's robe and cowl. Let's get to the Honda, Dell said. Before they could move toward the car, however, the observer stepped away from the carrot wood into the glow of the street lamp. His face remained hidden under the hood, yet he was naggingly familiar to Tommy, tall, heavy set, the way he moved. He was the Good Samaritan from earlier in the night, the man who had descended the embankment from MacArthur Boulevard and crossed the muddy field where the Corvette had crashed. He had been approaching the blazing car when Tommy ran from the fire and raptured demon. Let's see what he wants, Dell said. How the thing from the doll could now be riding the Samaritan, or hiding inside him, or posing as him, this was a mystery that Tommy was not able to fathom. But the fat man in that muddy field no longer existed. No, Tommy said. It's not a man. The Samaritan moved ponderously through the lamplight. Scooty's growl escalated into a snarl. The Samaritan stepped off the curb and splashed through the deep, fast-moving water in the gutter. Get back, Tommy said urgently. Back to the house, inside. Although his growl had been menacing and he had seemed prepared to attack, Scooty needed no further encouragement to retreat. He shot past Tommy and streaked through the gate that Dell held open. Dell followed the dog and Tommy back through the gate as well, holding the Mossberg in front of him. As the patinated copper panel fell shut, Tommy saw the Samaritan still heading toward them, but not breaking into a run, as if confident that they could not escape. The gate clacked shut. The electric security lock would buy only half a minute because the Samaritan would climb the barrier. When Tommy reached the courtyard, Dell was at the front entrance to the house. He was surprised that she had been able to get the door open so quickly. Evidently, Scooty was already inside. Following Dell into the house, Tommy heard the gate rattle out at the street. He closed the door, fumbled for the thumb turn, and engaged the deadbolt. Leave the lights off, Dell said. We can't defend this place. It's not a fort. Twelve-inch-wide, six-foot-tall side lights flanked the front door. Through those rain-spotted panes, Tommy was able to see a small portion of the courtyard. The flow of time seemed suspended. No tick, no talk. He was gripping the shotgun so tightly that his hands ached and the muscles began to twitch in his forearms. Remembering the reptilian eye and the torn cotton face of the doll, he dreaded meeting the demon in its larger incarnation. A moving shadow, swift and fluid and less geometric than those cast by the palm trees and ferns, swooped across one pane of glass. The fat man didn't knock because he wasn't a good Samaritan anymore. He slammed into the door, which shook violently in its frame, slammed into it again so hard that the hinges creaked and the lock mechanism made a half-broken rattling noise. Tommy's hammering heart drove him across the dark foyer and nailed him against the wall opposite the door. The side lights were too narrow to admit the fat man, but he smashed his fist through one. Tommy squeezed the trigger. The deafening roar of gunfire rebounded from the walls of the foyer. The shotgun Samaritan reeled back from the broken sidelight, but he didn't scream in pain. 
He wasn't a man anymore. Pain meant nothing to him. Her voice hollow and strange in the shivery echo of the blast, Dell shouted, No, Tommy! No! This place is just a trap! Come on! With tremendous force, the fat man slammed into the door again. The squeal of shearing metal rose from the tortured hinges. Tommy followed Dell across the dark living room, able to see her only because she was silhouetted against the wall of glass that faced the harbor lights. One of the large sliding glass doors was already open when they reached it. Apparently, Scooty had rolled it aside because he was waiting for them on the patio. Tommy wondered how the dog could have managed that feat. Then he heard the front door crash open at the other end of the house, and that frightful sound knocked all the curiosity out of him. Tommy had thought that Dell intended to escape by water across the harbor, but the back glow from the pier light that shone on her rain-soaked flag was bright enough to reveal that no boat was tied at her dock. In the empty slip was only rain-stippled black water. This way! She hurried left across the patio. The homes along the harbor were set close together on narrow lots, because the land on which they stood was enormously valuable. To preserve the multi-million dollar views, the property lines between neighbors' patios and backyards were delineated neither by high walls nor by dense masses of foliage, but by low shrubs or planter boxes or fences only two to three feet high. Scooty bounded over a foot-high planter wall that overflowed with vine geraniums. Dell and Tommy followed him onto the brick patio of the neighboring Cape Cod-style house. They leaped over a low, plumthorn hedge that delineated another property line, squished through a muddy flower bed, crossed another patio behind a stone and mahogany house that seemed inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, and clambered over more plumthorn that snagged the legs of Tommy's jeans. As they headed west along the peninsula, sprinting past the back of a brooding Spanish colonial home, a formidable dog penned in a narrow run between houses began to bark savagely at them. Ahead, still more barking arose from other dogs. Tommy didn't dare look back, for fear that the Samaritan was at his heels. In his mind's eye, he could see five fat fingers, as pale and cold as those of a corpse, reaching toward the nape of his neck. Behind a three-story ultra-modern house that was all angled glass and polished limestone cladding, blinding banks of flood lamps came on, evidently triggered by motion detectors in a security system. The shock of this sudden glare caused Tommy to stumble, but he kept his balance and maintained his grip on the shotgun. Gasping for breath, he plunged forward with Dell across a massive cast stone balustrade onto the unlighted patio of a Mediterranean-style house. The night was filled with uncountable barking dogs, all close but out of sight, as though they were falling with the rain, coming down through the black skies, soon to land in packs on all sides. Three houses beyond the ultra-modern pile with the flood lamps, the beam of a big flashlight suddenly speared out of the darkness and the rain, fixing on Dell. The man behind the light shouted, Stop right there! Another guy erupted from the gloom and blindsided Tommy. They skidded and went down on the slick concrete decking, and Tommy landed so hard that his breath was knocked out of him. He rolled into patio chairs that tumbled over with a tubular steel ringing. Stars swarmed behind his eyes, and he cracked his left elbow squarely on the ulnar nerve, sending a disabling, painful tingle the length of his arm. To the man with the flashlight, Del Payne said, Back off! I've got a gun! Back off! Tommy had dropped the Mossberg. In spite of the numbing pain in his left arm, he pushed onto his hands and knees. He was desperate to find the weapon. The foolhardy tackle was sprawled face down, groaning, apparently in even worse shape than Tommy. As far as Tommy was concerned, the stupid son of a bitch deserved to have a broken leg. At first he had assumed that the men were cops. But now he realized that they lived here and fancied themselves to be natural-born heroes ready to take on a pair of fleeing burglars. As Tommy crawled past the groaning man, he heard Dell say, Get that light out of my eyes or I'll shoot it out! The other would-be hero's courage wavered, and so did his flashlight, revealing the shotgun. Tommy crawled to the Mossberg. The man who tackled him had managed to sit up. He was spitting out something, possibly teeth, and cursing. Clutching at another patio table, Tommy pulled himself to his feet as Scooty began to bark loudly, urgently. Glancing east... Tommy saw the fat man two properties away, silhouetted against the bright black drop of flood lamps at the ultra-modern house. As the Samaritan raced toward them, leaping a low fence into the property next door, he was as graceful as a panther, raincoat billowing like a cape. Dell squeezed off three rounds as the Samaritan cleared a hedge and splashed onto this patio. Tommy expected the recoil of the powerful handgun to knock her flat, but she stood tall. With the first boom, the Samaritan stopped as if he'd run head-on into a brick wall, and with the second boom, he was half-lifted off his feet, and with the third, he spun and almost fell. 
The hero with the flashlight had thrown it aside and had fallen to the deck to get out of the line of fire. The tooth spitter was still sitting on the puddled concrete, legs splayed in an infantile posture, apparently frozen in terror. Edging toward Dell and Scooty, Tommy remained riveted by the wounded Samaritan who had taken three rounds from the forty-four Magnum, who swayed but did not drop, did not drop, did not drop. The fat man slowly turned to Tommy and Dell. His extraordinary eyes fixed on them and on the growling Labrador. They were radiant, green, inhuman eyes. Scooty's growl degenerated into a whimper. With admirable calm, made of sterner stuff than either Tommy or Scooty, Dell squeezed off shot after shot with a desert eagle. Every round appeared to hit the fat man. He jerked, twitched, executed a limb-flapping marionette-like spin, and at last went down. He landed on one side, knees drawn up in the fetal position, and the frosty beam of the would-be hero's flashlight, which lay discarded on the patio, illuminated one of the Samaritan's white, thick-fingered hands. He seemed to be dead, but certainly was not. Scooty was already on the move, leaping across a hedge into the backyard of the next house to the west. The roar of the forty-four Magnum had been so daunting that most of the barking dogs along the harbor had fallen silent. In the silvery beam of the flashlight, the Samaritan's plump white hand lay cupped, palm up, filling with rain. Then it spasmed, and the pale flesh grew mottled and dark. Impossibly, the fingers metamorphosed into spatula tentacles, and then into spiky insectile digits with wicked kittenous hooks at each knuckle. The fallen Samaritan was shifting, pulsating, changing. Seen enough, out of here! Dell said, hurrying after Scooty. Tommy searched for the courage to approach the creature and fire the shotgun point-blank into its brain, but intuitively he knew that no number of rounds from the Mossberg or any gun would destroy it. Tommy! Dell called from the patio of the house next door. Run! Get out of here! Tommy advised the homeowner who was prone on the concrete deck. The man seemed traumatized by the gunfire, confused. Run! Run for God's sake, run! Tommy urged the second man, the tooth spitter who continued to sit in a daze. Please, run! Heeding his own advice, he followed Dell. In the distance, a siren wailed. When Tommy, Dell, and the dog were two properties away from the scene of the confrontation, one of the would-be heroes screamed in the night behind them. Tommy skidded to a halt on a slate patio at a Tudor house and looked toward the cries. Not much could be seen in the rain and murk. Shadows thrashed, some were decidedly strange shadows, huge and quick, jagged and jittering, but he would have been indulging his fevered imagination if he had claimed to see a monster in the night. Now two men were screaming. Blood-freezing screams. They shrieked as though being wrenched limb from limb, torn apart. The demon would allow no witnesses. Perhaps a sound reached Tommy of which he was only subliminally aware, a voracious chewing or perhaps some quality of the two men's soul-curdling screams spoke to him on a primitive level, but somehow he knew that they were not merely being slaughtered. They were being devoured. When the police arrived, they might not find much left of the victims on that patio, perhaps nothing other than a little blood, and not even blood after a few more minutes of cleansing rain. The two men would seem to have vanished. Tommy's stomach twisted with nausea. More than one siren cleaved the night, and they were rapidly drawing nearer. Scooty ran, Dell ran, Tommy ran once more as one of the men stopped screaming, stopped being able to scream, and then the second man's cries choked off as well, and not a single dog was barking anymore, all silenced by the scent of something otherworldly. While the harbor gradually filled with an incoming tide and the earth rotated inexorably toward dawn. Under the roof of the silent and unmoving carousel, among the herd of colorful horses frozen in mid-gallop, Tommy and Dell sat on a two-person chariot with carved eagles on its sides. Scooty quietly prowled among the horses, circling the elevated platform, ready to warn them if the demon approached. The Balboa Fun Zone, arguably the heart of the peninsula's important tourist business, extended for a few blocks along Edgewater Avenue, a pedestrian mall that did not admit vehicular traffic west of Main Street. Numerous gift shops, ice cream stands, restaurants, arcades offering video games, boat rental operations, bumper cars, a Ferris wheel, the carousel on which Tommy and Dell sat, and other diversions lined Edgewater. 
with views of the dazzling harbor between the attractions on the north side. In spring, summer, and autumn, tourists and sun lovers strolled, skated, rollerbladed along this promenade, taking a break from the Pacific surf and from the beaches on the ocean side of the narrow peninsula, enjoying ice cream cones, popsicles, and cookies. At 2.30 on this stormy November morning, however, the fun zone was deserted. The only sounds were those made by the rain as it drummed hollowly on the carousel roof. The shops and other attractions were shuttered and dark, but for an occasional security lantern. The lamplight was strangely bleak. Extracting a shotgun shell from a pocket in her ski jacket, Dell spoke in a murmur that would not carry beyond the carousel. Here. You only fired one round, I think. Keep it fully loaded. Those poor men. What horrible deaths. It's not your fault, she said. They wouldn't have been there. The thing wouldn't have been there if I hadn't been there. It's upsetting, she agreed. But you were running for your life and they stepped in. Anyway, they were obviously marked for an unnatural extraction. Extraction? From this world. If the thing and the fat man hadn't gotten them, then they would have been taken in some other unusual way. Like spontaneous combustion? Or an encounter with a lycanthrope? Lycanthrope? Werewolf? He wasn't able to deal with her weirdness just now, so he changed the subject. Where the hell did you learn to shoot like that? Your mother again? Daddy. He taught Mom and me, wanting us to be prepared for anything. Pistols, revolvers, rifles, shotguns. I could handle an Uzi as if I was born with it. And when it comes to knife throwing... Knife throwing? Tommy realized he had raised his voice. I'm as good as any circus act, Dell continued in a murmur as she reloaded the Desert Eagle. He died when you were ten, Tommy said. So he taught you all this when you were just a little kid? Yeah. He was preparing me for the unusual life he knew I was going to have. How could he know? Rather than answer the question, pressing the last round into the forty-four magazine, she said, I sure do miss Daddy. He truly understood me, and not many people ever do. Tommy said, How could a little girl hold and fire a gun like that? The recoil. Oh, of course, we started with an air rifle, an air pistol, and then a twenty-two. she said, slamming the loaded magazine into the Israeli pistol. When we practiced with rifles or shotguns, Daddy patted my shoulders, crouched behind to brace me, and held the gun with me. He was only familiarizing me with the more powerful weapons, so I'd feel comfortable with them from an early age, wouldn't be afraid of them when the time came to actually handle them. He died before I really got good with the bigger stuff, and then Mom continued the lessons. Too bad he never got around to teaching you how to make bombs, Tommy said with mock dismay. I'm comfortable with dynamite and most plastic explosives, but they really aren't particularly useful for self-defense. Was your father a terrorist? Heavens no, he was so gentle. Basically, I learned explosives not to make bombs, but to disarm them if I had to. A task we're all faced with every month or so. No, she said, I've only had to do it twice. Tommy wanted to believe that she was kidding, but he decided not to ask. His brain was overloaded with new discoveries about her, and I thought my family was strange. Everyone thinks his family is strange. Dell said. But it's just that, because we're closer to the people we love, we tend to see them through a magnifying glass, through a thicker lens of emotion, and we exaggerate their eccentricities. Not in the case of your family, he said. Magnifying glass or no magnifying glass, it's a strange clan. As Dell zipped shut the pocket from which she had taken the ammunition, she said, The way I see it, your family might have a prejudice against blondes, but when they see how much I've got to offer, they'll learn to like me. Grateful that she couldn't see him blush in this gloom, Tommy checked his watch. 2.37. Maybe we better get moving again. Another siren rose in the distance. Dell said, Let's wait a while. We'll have to find new wheels and hit the road again, but I don't want to be hot-wiring a car when the streets around here are crawling with cops. If we stay too long in one place, we're okay for a while. You sleepy? Eyes itchy and burning? Yeah, he said, but I'll be okay. Your neck aches so bad you can hardly hold up your head, she said, as if she could feel his discomfort. I'm alert enough. Don't worry about me, he said. You're weary to the bone, poor baby. Turn away from me a little. 
Let me work on you. Move your butt, tofu boy. Come on. The chariot was narrow, but he was able to turn enough to allow her to massage his shoulders and the back of his neck. Her slender hands were surprisingly strong and effective. They were quiet for a minute, except for Tommy's occasional groan as Dell's fingers found another coil of tension and slowly unwound it. The diligent Scooty passed out of the edge of the platform as black as the night itself and as silent as a spirit. As she worked her thumbs up and down the nape of Tommy's neck, Dell said, Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Oh boy, here you go again, getting weird. You don't believe in extraterrestrial intelligences? The universe is so big there's got to be lots of intelligent species in it. But I don't believe they come across the galaxy to kidnap people and examine their genitals. They don't just examine the genitals. Yeah, sometimes they take the abductee to Chicago for pizza. She lightly, chastisingly slapped the back of his head. You're being sarcastic. It's not becoming to you. Listen, an alien species, vastly more intelligent than we are, wouldn't have any interest in us at all, and certainly wouldn't spend so much manpower harassing a bunch of ordinary citizens. Massaging his scalp now, Dell said, Personally, I believe in alien abductions. I am not surprised. I believe the aliens are worried about us. We're a troubled species, so confused, self-destructive. I think the aliens want to help us achieve enlightenment. By examining our genitals? Then those guys sitting ringside at nude dancing clubs only want to help the girls on the stage to achieve enlightenment. From behind him, she reached around to his forehead, drawing light circles on his brow with her fingers. You're such a wise guy. I write detective novels. Maybe you've even been abducted, she said. Not me. Just a wild shot in the dark here, but I bet you think you've been abducted. She stopped massaging his brow and pulled him around to face her again. Her murmur fell to a conspiratorial whisper. What if I told you there are a few nights when I've had missing hours, blank spots, where I just seem to have blacked out into a fugue state? All abductees report missing hours, these holes in their memories. Tell. Dear, sweet, loopy Dell, please don't be offended. Please understand I say this with affection. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that you had a couple of these missing hours every day of the week. Puzzled, she said. Why would I be offended? What about ghosts? he asked. Do you believe in ghosts? I've even met a few, she said brightly. What about the healing power of crystals? She nodded. Absolutely. Out-of-body experiences? I'm sure it can be done, but I like my body too much to want to leave it even for a short time. What about Bigfoot? She stifled a giggle. You're such a goof, Tuong Tommy. Bigfoot is bullshit. Invented by the tabloids to sell newspapers. He kissed her. She kissed him too. She kissed him better than he had ever been kissed before. She had a talent for it, like throwing knives. When at last he pulled back from her, Tommy said, I've never met anyone remotely like you, Deliverance Pain, and I'm not sure if that's good or bad. One thing's for sure. If any other woman had picked you up from your burning car, you wouldn't have lived half this long. That was inarguably true. No other woman, no other person he had ever met would have reacted with such equanimity when the demon had slammed against the van window and fastened itself to the glass with its hideous sucker pads. There is such a thing as fate, she told him. I suppose there might be. There is. Destiny. It's not written in stone, however. On a spiritual level, unconsciously, we make our destinies ourselves. Bewilderment and joy swelled in Tommy, and he felt as though he were a child just beginning to unwrap a wonderful gift. That doesn't sound as crazy to me as it would have an hour or two ago. Of course it doesn't. I suspect that while I wasn't looking, I've made you my destiny, and it's beginning to seem as if you've made me yours. Tommy had no answer to that. His heart was pounding. He had never felt this way before. 
Abruptly, his joyful mood and sense of impending transcendence were diminished when a strange, slithering sensation crept up the hollow of his spine. He shivered. Cold? she asked. No. As sometimes happens along the coast, the air temperature had bottomed out after midnight. It was rising again. The sea was an efficient heat sink that stored up the warmth of the sun during the balmy day and gradually released it after darkness fell. The slithering in the spine came again, and Tommy said, It's just a weird feeling. Maybe a premonition. Premonition? You're getting more interesting by the moment, Tuong Tommy. Premonition of what? He looked around uneasily at the tenebrous forms of the carousel horses. I don't quite know. Then he suddenly became aware that his neck and shoulders were no longer sore. His headache had passed, too. Astonished, he said, that was an incredible massage. In fact, no pain lingered in any muscle in his body, not even in those that he had bruised when he had been tackled on the concrete patio. He was not sleepy, either, and his eyes no longer itched and burned as before. Indeed, he felt wide awake, energetic. Frowning at Dell in the gloom, he said, Hey, how did... Scooty interrupted, whining fearfully. It's coming, Dell said, rising from the chariot. Tommy snatched the Mossberg off the carousel floor. Dell eased between the horses, using them for cover but moving closer to the edge of the platform for a better view of the promenade. Tommy joined her behind a great black stallion with bared teeth and wild eyes. Like a hunting dog spotting a pheasant, Scooty stood very still, staring east along lamplit Edgewater Avenue. Let's get out of here, Tommy whispered. Wait, I want to see it better, she said, indicating the three-globe street lamp past which the fat man would have to come. I have no desire to see it better, he whispered. Anyway, we have guns. We can knock it down again. We might not be lucky this time. Scooty can try to misdirect it. You mean lead it away from us? Dale didn't reply. Ears pricked, head held high, Scooty was clearly ready to do whatever his mistress demanded of him. Maybe the dog could outrun the creature. Although the thing posing as the portly Samaritan apparently was a supernatural entity, immortal and ultimately unstoppable, it too seemed bound by some of the laws of physics, which was why the hard impact of high-caliber ammunition could halt it, knock it down, delay it. Consequently, there was no reason to assume that it could move as fast as Scooty, who was smaller, lower to the ground, designed by nature for speed. But the thing won't be lured away by the dog, Tommy whispered. Dell, it only wants me, and maybe you now. In the wintry light from the frosted globes on the nearest lamp, the falling rain appeared to be sleet. Beyond the light, the rain darkened to tarnished silver and then to ash gray, and out of the grayness came the fat man, walking slowly along the center of the deserted promenade. At Tommy's side, Scooty twitched but made no sound. Holding the shotgun in both hands, Tommy hunched lower behind the carousel stallion. At the other end of the leaping stallion, Dell shrank herself too, watching the Samaritan from under the horse's neck. Like a dirigible easing along the ground toward its berth, the fat man advanced as if he were drifting rather than walking, making no splashing sounds on the puddled pavement. The Samaritan thing was slightly larger than before, but not as large as it should have been if it had devoured two men. Realizing how absurd it was to try to rationalize the biology of a supernatural entity, Tommy wondered again if his sanity had fled sometime earlier in the night. The Samaritan thing still wore the raincoat, though that garment was punctured and torn, apparently by gunfire. The hood lay rumpled at the back of its neck, and its head was exposed. Most likely, this was the moon-round face of the fat man who had stopped to lend assistance at the scene of the Corvette crash. The mind and soul of the fat man were long gone, however and the thing wearing his form was an entity of such pure hatred and savagery that it could not prevent its true nature from darkling through even the soft features of a face well-suited to smiles and laughter. The beast stopped under the lamp. Its eyes were dark and human one moment, radiant green and unearthly the next. From the center of the promenade, the creature surveyed the fun zone, beginning with the carousel, which was elevated two feet above the public walkway and screened by a low green wrought iron fence. The terrible eyes, serpent-bright and serpent-mean, seemed to fix on Tommy, and he could sense the beast's hellish hunger. But then the creature's gaze slid away from him. The demon looked north across the promenade to the dark Ferris wheel. It knows we're nearby, Tommy thought. 
Opposite the elevated carousel were lush palm trees gracing an open-air dining terrace with views of boat docks and the harbor beyond. Turning its back to the horses, the demon slowly surveyed the fixed tables, benches, and dripping trees. Finally, it focused once more on the carousel. Its radiant gaze traveled over the shadowed horses only briefly before it turned to stare east, back the way that it had come. It seemed confused. Indeed, its frustration was almost palpable. The thing sensed that they were close, but it could not catch their scent, or whatever more exotic spore it followed. Considering that the creature had tracked them many miles across the county to the New World Saigon Bakery, its current inability to detect them from only forty feet was baffling. The serpent-eyed Samaritan turned to the carousel, raised its plump hands, and moved its flattened palms in circles in the rain-filled air as though wiping off a dirty pane of glass. Seeking psychic impressions, some sign of us, trying to get a clearer view, Tommy thought. He tightened his grip on the Mossberg. Round and round, round and round, the pale hands moved like radar dishes, seeking signals. Tick-tock. Tommy sensed that their time and luck were rapidly running out, that the demon's inhuman senses would lock onto them any second. Sailing down from the night above the harbor, wings thrumming, as ethereal as an angel but as swift as a flash of light, a large seagull swooped past the demon's pale hands and arced up into the darkness from which it had come. The Samaritan thing lowered its hands. The gull plummeted once more. As radiant as a haunting spirit in the frost-white light, it swept past the demon's upraised hands again, rocketing heavenward in a spiral. The Samaritan thing peered up at the bird, turning to watch it as it wheeled across the sky. Something important was happening, something mysterious and profound, which Tommy could not comprehend. He glanced at Dell for her reaction, but her attention remained riveted on the demon, and he could not see her face. At Tommy's side, pressed against his leg, the Labrador quivered. The seagull circled back across the harbor and swooped down into the fun zone again. Flying only a few feet above the surface of the promenade, it sailed past the demon and disappeared between the shops and arcades to the east. The serpent-eyed Samaritan stared intently after the gull. From overhead and west, near the stilled Ferris wheel, came the thrumming of many wings as ten seagulls descended in a flock. The demon swung around to face them. Breaking out of their steep dive only a few feet above the ground, the gulls streaked after the first bird, swarming straight toward the demon and then parting into two groups that swept around it, disappearing east on Edgewater Avenue. But for the air-cutting whoosh of their wings, they passed in eerie silence. Captivated, curious, the Samaritan thing faced east to watch them depart. It took a step after them, another step, but halted. At the nearby docks, boats creaked on the rising tide, and a halyard clink-clink-clinked against a steel mast. The Samaritan thing again faced the carousel. Out of the swarming darkness above the harbor, birds descended once more, not merely ten, but hundreds. Seagulls and pigeons and sparrows and blackbirds and crows and hawks. Even several enormous prehistoric-looking blue heron, a river of feathers and shiny eyes, pouring down over the Ferris wheel, along the promenade, surging past the demon to disappear east between the shops and arcades. The drumming of frantic pinions reverberating off every hard surface with a volume that was reminiscent of a freight train rumble. On the carousel, Tommy felt the vibration of the wings, waves of pressure against his face and against his marveling eyes. The humid air carried the faint ammonia scent of damp feathers. Although the spectacle of the birds left Tommy as clueless as he was wonderstruck, he suspected that Dell understood what was happening. As though interpreting the winged visitation as a sign that it could not ignore, the beast broke into a run, drawn by the birds ahead of it, harried by the birds behind it. The torn raincoat flapped like great tattered wings, but the Samaritan thing remained earthbound, borne east by birds and bird shadows. For perhaps a minute after the Samaritan thing passed out of sight, the birds continued to descend from the stormy sky above the Ferris wheel to the west. Gradually, the flock grew thinner until it ended with a few hawks and two gulls. Tommy sucked in a deep, cool breath. What the hell was that? Birds, Dell said. I know they were birds. Even a blind man would know they were birds, but what were they doing? The dog patted to Dell, rubbing against her as if for comfort. Good, Scooty, she said, crouching to scratch the dog behind the ears. 
Him were so quiet, so still. Him good baby, him is. Mommy's little Scooty Woodums. Scooty wagged his tail happily and chuffed. To Tommy, Dell said, We better get out of here. You haven't answered my question. They were just birds agitated about something. More than that, he disagreed. Everything is more than it seems, but nothing is as mysterious as it appears to be. What the hell is going on here, Dell? What have I gotten into the middle of? What is this all about? She said, It might come back. We better get moving. Frustrated, he followed her and Scooty off the carousel and into the rain. They went down the steps to Edgewater Avenue, along which the thousands of birds had flocked. The beast was nowhere to be seen. The birds were gone as well. A few dozen feathers in different hues were stuck to the wet concrete or floated in the puddles. This way, Dell said, and she headed briskly west, the opposite direction from that in which the Samaritan thing had gone. Are you a witch? Tommy asked. Certainly not. I'm a child of the universe. As they passed the Ferris wheel, Tommy said exasperatedly, Dell, I listen, I really do, but nothing you say makes sense. You better make an appointment to see a good audiologist. But you sure do kiss a lot better than you hear, Tofu Boy. Her mention of the kiss left him speechless. Maybe that had been her intention. His lips burned with the memory of her lips, and he tasted the sweetness of her tongue as though it were still in his mouth. Just past the Ferris wheel at the intersection of Edgewater Avenue and Palm Street, Dell stopped as if not sure which way to go. Directly ahead, Edgewater was still a pedestrian promenade, though they were nearing the end of the fun zone. Palm Street entered from the left. Though no parking was allowed along it, the street was open to vehicular traffic because it terminated at the boarding ramp to the Balboa Ferry. At this hour, no traffic moved on Palm because the ferry was closed for the night. They could turn left on Palm and leave the fun zone for the next street to the south, which was Bay Avenue. In the immediate vicinity, it was not a residential street, but they might still find a parked car or two that Dell could hotwire. Tommy was thinking like a thief. Maybe blondes, or at least this blonde, were the corrupting influence that his mother had always believed them to be. He didn't care. He could still taste the kiss. Scooty growled, and Dell said, It's coming back! Bringing up the shotgun, Tommy spun around to face east. The promenade was deserted as far as he could see. It doesn't know exactly where we are yet, she said, but it's coming back this way. So we've got to find a car, he said still keeping a watch on the east end of the fun zone, expecting the Samaritan thing to come racing toward them, birdless and furious. Car? No, too dangerous out there on the boulevard. A cop might pass by and see us and think we're suspicious. We'll steal a boat instead. Her announcement startled him. A boat? It'll be fun, she said. Already she and Scooty were on the move, and Tommy glanced east along the deserted amusement area once more, before scrambling after the woman and the dog. Tommy didn't know how to sail, wasn't sure that he would be able to operate a motorboat, and didn't relish paddling out onto the dark, rain-lashed harbor in a kayak. I'd prefer a car. He followed Dell and Scooty through a gate and along a pier where the rain-soaked planks were slippery. They were in a small marina. Several boats, commercial party boats, some charter fishing craft, and a few private vessels big enough to be classified as yachts were tied up in the pounding rain, dimly revealed by the pier security lamps. Dell and Scooty hurried along a dockhead, serving several slips and moorings, looking over ten boats before stopping at a sleek white double-deck cruiser. This is good, she said as Tommy joined them. Are you kidding? You're going to take this? It's huge! Not so big. Blue Water 563, 56 foot. We can't handle this. How could we ever handle this? We need a whole crew to handle this, Tommy babbled. I can handle it, she assured him with her usual ebullience. These blue water yachts are sweet, about as easy as driving a car. Hold this. She handed him the forty-four Magnum and moved out along the finger of the dock to which the blue water was tied. Following her, he said, Dell, wait. Pausing briefly to untie the bow line from a dock cleat, she said, Don't worry. This baby's got less than two feet of draft, a windage-reducing profile, good turning leverage. She untied the stern line. You have real shaft angle efficiency with this, sweetheart. Twenty-one tons, but I'll make it pirouette. Twenty-one tons, he worried, following her back to midships. Where are you planning on taking this? Japan? No, it's just a coastal cruiser. 
Anyway, we're only going across the harbor to Balboa Island, where the police aren't all agitated. We can get a car there without being spotted. As Dell unzipped her ski jacket and stripped out of it, Tommy said, Is this piracy? Not if no one's aboard. Ordinary theft, she assured him, giving her ammo-laden jacket to him. I'm going to have my hands full with the boat. Position yourself on the bow deck, and if the thing shows up, do what's necessary to keep it from getting aboard. As the skin crawled on the nape of his neck, Tommy looked back across the dock. It's getting close, she assured him. She climbed aboard the yacht through a gap in the port railing. Already, Scooty was ascending the port side steps to the open upper deck. Tommy shoved the Desert Eagle under the waistband of his jeans and pulled himself aboard. As he started forward, another worry occurred to him, and he turned to Dell. Hey, don't you need keys or something to start it? I have my ways, she assured him. In spite of the deep gloom, he could see that her smile was even more enigmatic than any with which she had previously favored him. He went forward to the open bow deck. At the foremost point of the yacht, he stepped into the depressed well in which was mounted the anchor winch. He dropped the jacket, which wasn't going anywhere because it weighed about ten pounds with all the ammo in its pockets. He withdrew the pistol from his waistband and placed it atop the jacket, where he could easily get a hold of it if the need arose. The rain-swept docks were still deserted. A halyard rattled mutedly against a mast on a sailboat. Dock rollers creaked and rasped over concrete pilings, and jammed rubber fenders squeaked between a boat hull and a dock. The water was oil black and had a faint briny smell. He looked back at the dark windows of the enclosed lower deck, immediately behind him, wondering where Dell had gone. The smaller top deck began farther aft, and as he raised his gaze to it, soft light appeared at the windshield of the upper helm station. Then he glimpsed Dell as she slipped behind the wheel and looked over the instrumentation. When Tommy checked the docks again, nothing moved on them. The Blue Water's twin diesel engines coughed and then turned over with a powerful rumble. The foredeck vibrated under Tommy's shoes. He looked toward the top deck helm again and saw, beside Dell, Scooty's head, ears pricked. The Labrador was apparently standing with his forepaws on the instrument board, and Dell was patting his big head as if to say, Good dog. Oddly, Tommy was reminded of the swarming birds. Abruptly, he felt poised on the brink of a satori again, but the moment passed. This time, when he turned his attention to the docks, he saw the Samaritan thing hurtling through the gate at the seawall, no more than two hundred feet away, raincoat billowing like a cape. Go! Go! Tommy urged Dell as the yacht began to ease backward out of its slip. The demon descended to the dockhead and raced along the seawall, passing all of the boats that Dell had rejected. Standing in the anchor well, Tommy held the Mossberg in both hands. The yacht was halfway out of the slip and moving faster by the second. Over the thudding of his own heart, Tommy heard the hollow booming of the demon's footfalls on the dock planks. The yacht was three-quarters of the way out of the slip, and waves of black water rolled in where it had been, slapping the dock. Skidding on the wet planks, the fat man that wasn't a fat man reached the head of the slip and sprinted onto the port side finger, trying to catch them before they reversed into the channel. The blue water backed all the way out of the slip, churning through water now festooned with garlands of phosphorescent foam. The demon sprinted to the end of the port side finger of the slip just as the yacht pulled away. It leaped across the six-foot gap between the dock and the boat, slammed into the pulpit three feet in front of Tommy, and seized the railing with both hands. As the thing tried to pull aboard, Tommy squeezed off a round from the shotgun. In the glow of the running lights, he saw the fat man's face vanish in the blast, and he gagged in revulsion. The Samaritan thing should have been torn loose by the powerful hit that it had taken, but the relentless beast still hung from the bow and continued trying to drag, heave, roll itself onto the foredeck. Out of the raw, torn flesh left by the shotgun blast, the fat man's glistening white face miraculously reformed, undamaged, and the serpent eyes blinked open, radiant and fierce. The thick-lipped mouth gaped silently for a moment, and then the Samaritan thing screamed at Tommy, the piercing voice was not remotely human. Cast back on the faith of his youth, pleading with the Holy Virgin to save him, Tommy pumped another round into the breach, fired, fired, fired again from a distance of three feet. The hands on the railing metamorphosed into kittenous pincers with serrated edges and locked so fiercely that the stainless steel tubing actually appeared to be bending in the creature's grip. Tommy was dry-firing. The magazine of the Mossberg was empty. Shrieking again, 
The beast hauled itself higher on the pulpit railing as the bow of the reversing yacht came around to port and away from the dock. Tommy dropped the shotgun, snatched up the forty-four, slipped, and fell backward on the bow deck with his feet still in the anchor well. Shrieking in triumph, the serpentine Samaritan loomed over Tommy. The moon-round visage split open from chin to hairline, as if it wasn't a skull, but a strained sausage skin, and the halves of the bifurcated face peeled apart, with the demented green eyes bulging at either side. Out of this gash sprouted an obscene mass of writhing, glossy black tentacles, as thin as whips and as agitated as the appendages of a squid in a feeding frenzy. At the base of the squirming tentacles was a wet sucking hole full of clashing teeth. Nine times Tommy fired the forty-four Magnum. The recoil slammed through him hard enough to rattle his vertebrae. The creature shuddered with the impact of the shots and pitched backward over the pulpit railing. A pincer was still locked on the steel tubing, which gave way with a gong-like clang, and the beast plunged into the harbor. Tommy scrambled to the damaged railing and searched the black water. The creature had vanished. The yacht was cruising forward now, east along the channel, past the other boats in the moorings and the small marina. Moving aft along the short bow deck, clutching at the starboard railing, Tommy searched the waters on that side, but soon the area where the creature had disappeared was well behind them. He returned to the pulpit to retrieve the shotgun and the ski jacket. His hands shook so badly that he dropped the Mossberg twice. The yacht was cruising fast enough to stir up a wind of its own in the windless night. Rain snapped against Tommy's face. Carrying the guns and the ski jacket, he retreated along the narrow portside passway and climbed the stairs to the upper deck. The aft portion of the open-air top deck contained a built-in table for alfresco dining and an enormous elevated sunbathing pad across the entire stern. Scooty stood on the pad, gazing at the foaming wake that trailed from the stern. He didn't look at Tommy. Forward on the top deck, the upper helm station had a hardtop roof and a windshield. A custom-sewn vinyl enclosure was snug to the supporting rear framework of the hardtop, forming a weatherproofed cabin of sorts. Tommy pushed through the loose flaps, into the dim light beyond, which arose only from the control board. Dell was in the captain's seat. She glanced away from the rain-streaked windshield. Nice job! Putting the guns down on the console behind her, unzipping the pockets on the ski jacket, he said, It's still out there somewhere. He replenished the thirteen-shot capacity of the pistol as quickly as his trembling hands could cope with the cartridges. How long to cross the harbor? Bringing the blue water sharply and expertly around to port, she said, We're starting the run right now. Maybe two minutes. Reloading the Mossberg, he said, How'd you start the engines without keys? Hot-wired the sucker. She lied flippantly. Outside on the open top deck, Scooty began to bark ferociously. Tommy's stomach fluttered with dread. Here we go already. Armed with both the shotgun and the pistol, he pushed through the vinyl flaps into the night and rain. Scooty still stood vigilantly on the sunbathing pad, staring down at the churning wake. Balboa Peninsula was swiftly receding. Tommy stepped quickly past the dining table and the upholstered horseshoe bench to the platform on which the dog stood. He wriggled forward on his belly, across the wet canvas upholstered pad beside the barking Labrador, where he peered down at the turbulent wake. In the murk, he could see the wake, but nothing of the boat's stern, which was recessed beneath the top deck. Easing forward, Tommy squinted down and back at the lower portion of the yacht. Under Tommy, behind the enclosed first deck, was a back porch-type afterdeck. It was overhung by the sunbathing platform on which he lay and was therefore largely concealed. Sans raincoat, the fat man was climbing out of the harbor and over the afterdeck railing. He disappeared under the overhang before Tommy could take a shot at him. The dog scrambled to a closed stairhead hatch starboard of the sunbathing platform. Joining the Labrador, Tommy put down the pistol. Holding the Mossberg in one hand, he opened the hatch. A small light glowed at the bottom of molded fiberglass steps, revealing that the Samaritan thing was already clamoring upward. Tommy pumped the entire shotgun magazine into the beast. It clutched at a rail and held on tenaciously, but the last two blasts tore it loose and hurled it to the bottom of the steps. The thing rolled out of the stairwell onto the afterdeck again. Judging by experience, however, it wouldn't be out of action for long. There wasn't even any blood on the steps. Dropping the shotgun, Tommy retrieved the forty-four pistol. Thirteen rounds. There would be no time to reload. Dell appeared at his side, looking gaunt and more worried than she had been before. Give me the gun, she said urgently. Who's driving? I locked the wheel. Give me the gun and go forward, down the port stairs to the foredeck. What are you going to do? He demanded. I'll start a fire. You said fire distracted it. 
he remembered the enraptured minikin at the blazing corvette. Below, the recuperated Samaritan thing shrieked and entered the bottom of the stairwell. Give me that gun, she snarled, tearing it out of Tommy's grip. The Desert Eagle bucked in her hands four times, and the roar echoed back at them out of the stairwell like cannon fire. Squealing, the creature crashed down to the afterdeck again. To Tommy, Dell shouted, Go, damn it! Go! He stumbled across the open top deck to the port stairs farther forward, beside the helm station. More gunfire erupted behind him. Clutching the railing, he descended the open portside stairs, up which he had climbed earlier. At the bottom, the narrow railed passway led forward to the bow, but didn't lead back toward the stern, so there was no easy route by which the Samaritan thing could make its way to him directly from the afterdeck. More gunfire crashed above and aft. Tommy reached the bow deck, where only a few minutes ago he'd taken a stand against the Samaritan thing. In the night ahead, Balboa Island loomed. Holy shit! Tommy said, horrified by what was about to happen. They were approaching Balboa Island at considerable speed. With the wheel locked and the throttle set, they would pass between two large private docks and ram the seawall that surrounded the island. He turned, intending to go back to the helm and make Dell change course. But he halted when he saw that the aft end of the yacht was already ablaze. Orange and blue flames leaped into the night. Scooty padded along the port side and onto the bow deck. Dell was right behind the Labrador. The damn things in the stairwell burning in ecstasy, like you said. Creepy as hell. How did you set it on fire so quick? Tommy demanded, half shouting to be heard above the drumming rain and the engines. Diesel fuel, she said, raising her voice as well. Where did you get diesel fuel? There's 600 gallons aboard, but in tanks. Besides, diesel fuel doesn't burn that fiercely. So I used gasoline or napalm. You're lying to me again, he fumed. You're making it necessary. Sit on the deck, she instructed. Grab hold of the railing. You're some crazy gonzo Amazon witch or something. Whatever you say, just brace yourself because we're going to crash and you don't want to be thrown overboard. Tommy looked toward Balboa Island, which was clearly defined by the street lamps along the seawall and the dark shapes of houses beyond. Dear God, as soon as we run aground, she said, get up, get off the boat and follow me. She crossed to the starboard flank of the bow deck, sat with her legs splayed in front of her, and grabbed hold of the railing with her right hand. Scooty clambered into her lap, and she put her left arm around him. Following Dell's example, Tommy sat on the deck, facing forward. He gripped the port railing with both hands. Sleek and swift, the yacht cruised through the rainy darkness toward doom. If Dell had set the fuel tanks on fire, the engines wouldn't be running, would they? Don't think. Just hold on. Maybe the fire had come from the same place as the seething flock of birds, which was... Where? Just hold on. He expected the boat to explode under him. He closed his eyes. If he had just gone to his mother's for com de com and stir-fried vegetables with nook mama sauce, he might not have been home when the doorbell rang, might never have found the doll, might now be in bed, sleeping, peacefully, dreaming about the land of bliss at the peak of fabled Mount Philae where everyone was immortal and beautiful and deliriously happy 24 hours a day. But no, that wasn't good enough for him. No, he had to offend his mother and make a statement about his independence by going instead to a diner for cheeseburgers. Mr. Big Shot with his own car phone and his new Corvette. Intrigued by the blonde waitress, flirting with her when the world was filled with beautiful and intelligent and charming Vietnamese girls who never called you tofu boy, never hot-wired cars, didn't think they had been abducted by aliens, never stole yachts and set them on fire. Gorgeous Vietnamese women who did not talk in riddles, didn't have any expertise with throwing knives, didn't run around with big smart-ass hounds from hell with farting rubber hot dogs. He couldn't go home and eat com de com, had to write stupid detective novels instead of becoming a doctor or a baker, and now, for his selfishness and arrogance, he was going to die! He opened his eyes. Shouldn't have done that. Balboa Island, where no structure was taller than three stories, seemed as large as Manhattan, towering. 
Screws turning furiously, the 56-foot, merrily blazing blue water yacht came into the island at extreme high tide, drawing less than two feet, came in between two docks, and struck the steel-reinforced concrete seawall with a shattering, ripping, screeching, booming noise that made Tommy cry out in fear. At the waterline, the hull, although as strong as any, was crushed and torn open at the bow. The impact dramatically slowed the yacht, but the diesel engines provided such enormous thrust that the vessel surged forward, striving to climb the wall, angling up at the bow, up over the wide public promenade that ringed the island as though it might churn all the way out of the harbor and sail through the front of one of the houses that lined the waterfront. Then at last it shuddered to a halt securely hung up on the seawall and badly weighed down by tons of water pouring through the broken hull into the lower holds. Tommy had held fast to the railing. When the yacht was at rest, he rose into a crouch and crabbed sideways across the bow to Dell. She was on her feet. Let's get out of here! The stern of the yacht burned brighter than ever. The fire was spreading forward. An eerie and chilling ululation arose from deep within the crackling blaze, the crooning of the enraptured demon. The bow deck was canted a few degrees because the boat was rammed on the seawall. They walked uphill to the pulpit, which thrust out of the water and over the deserted pedestrian promenade. All along the recently slumbering waterfront, lights began to blink on in the closely spaced houses. Scooty hesitated at the gap in the pulpit railing, then leaped down onto the concrete sward on the island side of the seawall. Dell and Tommy followed him. From the pulpit to the sidewalk was about a ten-foot drop. The dog sprinted west along the promenade. Dell followed the Labrador, and Tommy followed Dell. He glanced back once, and in spite of all the outrageous incidents of the night, which should have inured him to spectacle, he was awestruck at the sight of the enormous boat balanced on the seawall, overhanging the public walkway, as if it were the ark washed ashore after the flood. As worried faces appeared at windows, but before frightened voices rose in the night, Tommy and Dell and the dog found the nearest street leading from the promenade toward the center of the island. Although Tommy looked over his shoulder, expecting a serpent-eyed fat man or worse, no creature swaddled in fire pursued them. Hundreds of houses crowded the small lots on Balboa Island, and the narrow streets were lined with parked cars. Dell was attracted to a red Ferrari Testarossa, as they stood under the cloaking boughs of an old pot of carpus on a deserted street, Tommy pointed to another vehicle. Why not that Geo? The Ferrari is cool. It costs as much as a house. Why not destroy a cheaper car? Tommy, dear, who said anything about destroying it? You're hard on machinery, he reminded her. From the far end of the island came the sirens of fire engines. Above the silhouettes of the tightly packed houses, the night sky to the south was brightened by the glow of the burning yacht. Keep a lookout, she said. With Scooty, she went boldly to the Ferrari. She tried the door, and it was unlocked. Scooty entered the car ahead of her, and the Ferrari engine started even as Dell settled behind the wheel. Two seconds flat. A true master criminal, Tommy murmured to himself as he went to the car and opened the other door. Dell said, Scooty is willing to share the passenger seat. He's a sweetheart, Tommy said. Scooty sat with his rump in Tommy's lap, his hind legs on the seat, and his forepaws on the dashboard. Hug him, Dell said as she switched on the headlights. So he doesn't go through the windshield if we stop suddenly. I thought you weren't going to destroy the car. You never know when you might have to stop suddenly. Tommy put his arms around the Labrador. Where are we going? As Dell pulled the Ferrari away from the curb and into the street, she said, We'll leave this crate at Mom's place, and she can have it brought back here. We'll borrow one of her cars. You got an understanding mother. She's a peach. How did you get the car started so quickly? He asked. The keys were in it. With the big dog in his lap, Tommy couldn't see much of the street ahead of them, but he could see the ignition, in which no key was inserted. Where are the keys now? he asked. What keys? The ones you started the car with. I hotwired it, she said, grinning as she turned left onto a divided street that led to Marine Avenue, the island's main drag. What do you think that yacht cost? Oh, about 750000 I'll offer it for the people who owned it. No sweat. 
It's my boat. He gaped at her. Since encountering deliverance pain, staring agape had become his most used expression. As she stopped at the Marine Avenue intersection, she smiled at him and said, Only owned it since July. He managed to rehinge his jaw to ask, If it's your boat, why wasn't it docked at your house? It's so big it blocks my view. So I rent that slip where it was tied up. Tommy said, So you blew up your own boat. Turning left on Marine Avenue, which was the commercial center of the island, Dell said, Didn't blow it up, just set it on fire. You have a tendency to exaggeration, Tommy. At this rate, even your inheritance won't last long. I don't set yachts on fire every day, you know. They were reaching the end of Marine Avenue. The bridge across the back channel to the mainland lay less than a block ahead. He said, Truth, how did you start this car? Didn't I say the keys were in the ignition? Scooty made a weird wheezing sound, like doggy laughter. A police cruiser appeared on the arched bridge ahead of them, entering the island from the mainland. Truth, where did the birds come from? Tommy asked. Well, it's the eternal mystery, isn't it? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The oncoming patrol car stopped at the foot of the bridge and flashed its headlights at them. Thinks we might be bad guys, Dell said, stopping beside the cruiser. Just relax. Be cool. The electric window purred down. The cop had already lowered his window. He sounded surprised when he said, Dell, I didn't realize it was you. New car? Hi, Marty. You like it? Real beauty. Yours or your mom's? You know mom. Don't you go breaking any speed limits. If I do, will you personally paddle me? Marty, the cop, laughed. I'd be delighted. What's all the hubbub? Dell asked innocently. Some fool rammed a big damn boat high speed into the seawall. Well... Tell your mom we'll be watching for her in that car. You might not see her, but you'll sure hear the sonic boom. Laughing, Marty drove away, and Dell continued onto the bridge over the back channel to the mainland. Tommy said, What happens when he discovers the yacht on the seawall is yours? He won't. It's registered to our offshore corporation. Offshore corporation? How far off? Mars? And what happens when this car is reported stolen? It won't be. Mom will have it brought back before it's missed. Truth. Was it just chance that you happened to be driving by when I rolled the Corvette, or did you know I was going to be there? <laughs> of course I didn't know. Like I said, though, we're clearly each other's destiny. God, you're infuriating, Tommy said. You don't mean that. Yes, I do. Poor, confused Tommy. Infuriating. Actually, you mean to say interesting. Infuriating. Interesting. In fact, you're enthralled with me. He sighed. Aren't you? She teased. Enthralled? He sighed again. Yes. You're so sweet, she said. Such a sweet man. You want me to shoot you? Not yet. Wait till I'm dying. That's not going to be easy. Dell's mother lived in a private guard-gated community on a hill overlooking Newport Beach. The guardhouse was finished in mottled pastel stucco with cast stone wainscot, and it stood under several enormous theatrically lighted phoenix palms. Because no resident sticker adorned the Ferrari windshield, the young guard had to open the gatehouse door and lean out to ask whom Dell was visiting. He was slack-faced and sleepy-eyed when he first appeared, but the moment he saw her, his eyes brightened. Miss Payne? New car? She said, Maybe. We're test driving it, Mickey. The guard came out of the gatehouse, into the rain, and stooped beside Dell's open window to be at her level. Quite a machine! My mom could make it go to the moon. If she had this, the guard said, the community would have to put in speed bumps the size of garbage dumpsters to slow her down. How's Emmy? 
although Mickey was not wearing a raincoat. He seemed to be oblivious of the downpour, as though Dell so completely commanded his awareness that he simply didn't have the capacity also to notice the inclement weather. Emmy's great! The cancer's in total remission. The doctors can't believe it. I told you not to lose hope, didn't I? If the tests keep coming back clear as they do now, they'll probably release her from the hospital in about three days. She'll be fine, Mickey. It's so nice of you to go visit her the way you do. Oh, I adore her, Mickey. She's an absolute angel. She thinks the world of you, Miss Payne. She sure loved that storybook you brought her. Looking past Dell, he said, Hi, Scooty. The Labrador chuffed. Dell said, Mickey, this is my friend, Tommy Tofu. Mickey said, Glad to meet you, Mr. Tofu. Peering between Dell and the dog, Tommy said, Likewise. You're getting soaked, Mickey. Am I? Yes, you are, Dell said. You better get back inside, dear. Tell Emmy I'll see her soon. I sure will, Miss Payne. Dripping, Mickey returned to the gatehouse, and Dell put up the car window. In front of them, a massive iron gate ornamented with gilded balls rolled out of the way, admitting them to the private community. As the Ferrari swept through the gate, Tommy said, Who's Emmy? His little girl. Eight years old, cute as a button. That's tough. Eight years old and hit with cancer. She'll be absolutely fine now, won't she, Scooty Woodums? The Labrador leaned over to nuzzle her neck, and she giggled. They cruised along winding streets lined with enormous houses behind deep and lushly landscaped grounds. Oh, I'm sorry we have to wake your mother at 3.30 in the morning, Tommy said. You're just so delightfully thoughtful and polite, Dell said, reaching over to pinch his cheek. But Mom will be awake and busy. Oh, she's a night person, huh? She's an around-the-clock person. She never sleeps. Never? Well, not since Tonopah, Dell lamented. Tonopah, Nevada? Actually, outside Tonopah. Close. Mud Lake. Approximately. I'm 27. Your mother hasn't slept since before you were born? She was 23 then. Everyone has to sleep, Tommy said. Not everyone. You've been up all night. Are you sleepy? I was earlier, but here we are, she said happily, turning a corner and driving into a cul-de-sac. At the end of the short street stood a grove of palm trees, and behind them, a stone estate wall illuminated by landscape lighting so subtle that Tommy couldn't always discern the source. Set on the wall was a tall bronze gate with two-inch square pickets. Dell stopped, put down her window, and pushed a call button on an intercom box set in a stone post. From the speaker came a solemn male voice with a British accent. Who's calling, please? It's me, Mummingford. Good morning, Miss Payne, said the voice on the intercom. The gate rolled open ponderously. Mummingford, Tommy asked. As she put up her window, Dell said, The butler. He's on duty at this hour? Someone's always on duty. Mummingford prefers the night shift, actually, because it's usually more interesting here, Dell explained as she drove forward through the gateway arch. Solemnly, she added, and now, the great pile, Tommy said, excuse me. That's the name of the house. Look. The Payne Mansion, standing on perhaps three acres of grounds behind the estate wall, was an enormous, sprawling, wildly romantic Mediterranean villa with deep loges behind colonnades, arches upon arches, balustrated balconies shaded by trellises groaning under bougainvillea vines, bell towers and cupolas, and steeply pitched barrel tile roofs. The scene was so cunningly and romantically lighted that it could well have been the most insanely ornate stage setting in the most maniacally extravagant Andrew Lloyd Webber musical that the singular British genius of Broadway kitsch had ever created. The driveway descended into a spacious stone-paved motor court, at the center of which stood a four-tiered fountain, featuring fifteen life-size marble maidens in togas pouring water from vases. As she drove the Ferrari around the astonishing fountain to the front door, Dell said, 
Mom wanted to build a more modern place. But the community's architectural guidelines specified Mediterranean, and the architectural committee had a very narrow definition of the word. She became so frustrated by the approval process that she designed the most ridiculously exaggerated Mediterranean house the world had ever seen, thinking they'd be appalled and reconsider her previous plans. But they loved it. By then it seemed a good joke to her, so she built the place. She built all this as a joke? My mom's nothing if not cool. Anyway, some people in this neighborhood have named their houses, so mom called this place the Great Pile. She parked in front of an arched portico supported by marble columns featuring carved vines and bunches of grapes. Warm amber and rose-colored light seemed to glow behind every beveled pane of every leaded glass window in the house. Is she having a party at this hour? Party? No. No, no. She just likes the place to be lit up like, as she puts it, a cruise ship on a dark sea, to remind herself that we're all passengers on an endless and magical journey. She sure sounds like your mother. The limestone front walk was bordered by inlaid mosaic patterns. Tail wagging, Scooty raced ahead of Dell and Tommy. The massive mahogany door swung open as they reached it, and a tall, silver-haired man in a white shirt black tie, black suit, and mirror-polished black shoes stood just beyond the threshold. A white beach towel was folded over his left arm. With a reverberant British accent, he said, Welcome to the Great Pile. Is Mom still making you say that, Mummingford? I shall never tire of it, Miss Payne. Mummingford, this is my friend, Tommy Fawn. Tommy was surprised to hear her say his name correctly. Honored to meet you, Mr. Fawn, Mummingford said, half bowing from the waist as he stepped back from the doorway. Thank you, Tommy said, nodding in acknowledgment of the bow. Scooty preceded them through the doorway. Mummingford led the dog aside, dropped to one knee, and began to dry the mutt and blot its paws with the beach towel. As Dell closed the door, Tommy said, I'm afraid we're as soaked as Scooty. We're going to make a mess. Alas... You are, said Mummingford dryly. But I must tolerate Miss Payne to an extent. I'm not obliged to tolerate the dog. And her friends enjoy sufferance as well. Where's Mom? Dell asked. She awaits you in the music room, Miss Payne. I'll send his nibs along to join you as soon as he's presentably dry. Scooty grinned out of a cowl of white cotton, enjoying his rubdown. We can't stay long, Dell told the butler. We're on the lamb from a doll snake rat quick monster thing, but could we please have coffee and a tray of breakfast pastries? In a trice, Miss Payne. You're a dear Mummingford. The Grand Hall at least a hundred feet long, was floored with highly polished black granite on which their wet rubber-soled shoes squeaked with each step. The white walls were hung with enormous unframed canvases, all abstract art full of motion and color. The ceiling was paneled with bands of brushed steel. Sensing Tommy's amazement, Dell said, Mom built the outside of the house to please the community architectural committee, but inside it's as modern as a spaceship and as Mediterranean as Coca-Cola. The music room was two-thirds of the way along the main hall on the left. A black lacquer door opened onto a space floored with polished white limestone. The sound-baffled ceiling and walls were padded and then upholstered in charcoal gray fabric as if this were a recording studio. The chamber was huge, approximately 40 by 60 feet. In the center was a custom carpet on which stood a black leather sofa and four armchairs arranged around a solid rectangular block coffee table veneered with a parquetry of faux ivory squares. Although a hundred music lovers could have been seated in the room for a piano recital, no piano was provided. The music, Glenn Miller's Moonlight Serenade, didn't issue from a state-of-the-art entertainment system with surround sound speakers, either. It came, instead, from what appeared to be a small, table-model, Art Deco radio that stood in the center of the coffee table. The tinny and static-spotted quality of the sound suggested that the radio was actually a cassette or CD player loaded with one of those authentic, as-recorded-live-on-dance-night-in-the-40s radio programs. 
Dell's mother sat in one of the chairs, eyes closed, smiling, swaying her head in time with the music. Although only fifty, she looked ten years younger, a striking woman, olive skin with jet black hair, delicate features, and a swan-like neck. When Dell lowered the volume on the radio, Mrs. Payne opened her eyes. They were as blue as Dell's and even deeper. Her smile widened. Good heavens, dear, you look like a drowned rat. She rose from the chair and regarded Tommy. And so do you, young man. Tommy was surprised to see that Mrs. Payne was wearing an aoyai, a flowing silk tunic and pants ensemble similar to those that his own mother wore at times. Dell said, Mom, I'd like you to meet Tommy Fawn. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Payne. Taking his offered hand in both of hers, Dell's mother said, Call me Julia. Thank you, Julia. I'm... Oh, Rosalind. Excuse me? Oh, Winona. Or even Lilith. They're all names I quite like. Not sure how to respond to her offer of four names, Tommy said, That's a beautiful Aoya you're wearing. Thank you, dear. It is lovely, isn't it? And so comfortable. There's a charming lady in Garden Grove who hand sews them. I think my mother buys from the same woman. Dell said, Mom... Tommy is the one. Julia Rosalind Winona Lilith Payne, or whatever her name was, raised her eyebrows. Is he? Absolutely, said Dell. Mrs. Payne let go of Tommy's hand and, oblivious of his wet clothes, embraced him, hugged him tightly, and kissed his cheek. This is wonderful. Just wonderful. Tommy wasn't sure what was happening. Releasing him, Mrs. Payne turned to her daughter. They hugged and laughed like excited schoolgirls. We've had the most wonderful night, Dell said. Her mother said, tell me, tell me. I set the yacht on fire and crashed it into the Balboa Island seawall. Mrs. Payne gasped. Deliverance, how exciting! You must tell me all about it. Tommy rolled his new corvette. Wide-eyed, apparently delighted, Mrs. Payne regarded him with what might have been admiration. Rolled a new corvette. I didn't plan to, he assured her. How many times did you roll it? At least twice. And then, Dell said, it burst into flames. All this in one night, Mrs. Payne exclaimed. Sit down, sit down, I must have all the details. We can't stay long, Tommy said. We've got to keep moving. We'll be safe here for a little while, Dell said, plopping into one of the commodious leather armchairs. As Mrs. Payne returned to her chair, she said, We should have coffee, or brandy if you need it. Mummingford is already bringing coffee and pastries, Dell said. Scooty entered the room and padded directly to Mrs. Payne. She was so petite and the chair was so wide that there was room for both her and the Labrador. Scooty Woodhams have fun too? Mrs. Payne asked as she petted the mutt. Indicating the radio, she said, Oh, this is a lovely number. Although the volume was low, she could identify the tune. Audi Shaw, begin the begin. Dell said, I like it too. By the way, mother, it's not just burning yachts and cars. There's an entity involved. An entity? This just gets better and better, said Mrs. Payne. What sort of entity? Well, I haven't identified it yet, haven't had time, what with all the running and chasing, Dell said. But it started out as a devil doll with a curse note pinned to the hand. To Tommy, Mrs. Payne said, This doll was delivered to you? Yes, I... By whom? It was left on my doorstep. I think Vietnamese gangs... And you picked it up and brought it into your house. <gasps> Mrs. Payne clucked her tongue. Dear boy, you shouldn't have brought it into your house. In this sort of situation, the entity can't become animate and do you harm unless you invite it across your threshold. But it was just a little rag doll. Yes, of course, a little rag doll. But that's not what it is now, is it? Agitated, Tommy said, I'm amazed that you just accept all of this so easily. Mrs. Payne was clearly surprised by his statement. If Dell says there's an entity, I'm sure there's an entity. Dell is no fool. Mummingford entered the music room, pushing a tea cart laden with china, a silver coffee urn, and pastries. To her mother, Dell said, 
Tommy suffers from an excess of skepticism. For instance, he doesn't believe in alien abductions. They're real, Mrs. Payne assured Tommy with a smile. He doesn't believe in ghosts, Dell said. Real, said Mrs. Payne. Or lycanthropy. Real. Or remote viewing. Real. Listening to them made Tommy dizzy. He closed his eyes. Though he does believe in Bigfoot, Dell said teasingly. How odd, said Mrs. Payne. I do not believe in Bigfoot, Tommy corrected. Bigfoot, said Julia Rosalind Winona Lilith Payne, is nothing but tabloid trash. Exactly, said Dell. Tommy had to open his eyes to accept a cup of coffee from the apparently imperturbable Mummingford. From the old-looking radio on the faux ivory coffee table came an announcer's voice, identifying the broadcast as originating live from the fabulous Empire Ballroom, where Glenn Miller and his big band bring the stars out when they play, followed by a commercial for Lucky Strike cigarettes. Dell said, if Tommy can stay alive until dawn, then the curse fails and he's okay, or at least that's what we think. Little more than an hour and a half, said Mrs. Payne. It's just a hunch, Dell ventured, but I don't think Tommy is scheduled for unnatural extraction. He's probably got a 60% chance of living through this. He feels as if he has a full-life destiny with a natural departure. Addressing him in a reassuring tone, Mrs. Payne said, Well, Tommy dear, even if the worst were to happen, death isn't final. It's only a transitional phase. You're sure of that, are you? Oh, yes. I talk to Ned more nights than not. Who? She means Daddy, Dell clarified. He appears on the David Letterman show, Mrs. Payne said. Mummingford passed a tray of pastries to Dell first, and then to Tommy. Tommy initially selected a bran muffin, but reconsidered and asked for a chocolate croissant. If he only had an hour and a half to live, worrying about his cholesterol level seemed pointless. As Mummingford used pastry tongs to transfer the croissant to a plate, Tommy asked Dell's mother for clarification. Your late husband appears on the David Letterman show? It's a late-night talk show. Yes, I know. Sometime David announces a guest, but instead of the movie star or whoever it's supposed to be, my net comes out and sits in the guest chair. Then the program freezes as if time has stopped. David and the audience of the band frozen in place, and Ned talks to me. Tommy tasted his chocolate croissant. It was delicious. Of course, said Mrs. Payne, this appears only on my personal TV, not all over the country. I'm the only one who sees Ned. Oh, Mummingford, Dell said. I almost forgot. There's a stolen Ferrari in the driveway. What would you like done with it, Miss Payne? Could you have it returned to Balboa Island within the hour? I can tell you exactly where it was parked. Yes, Miss Payne. I'll just refresh everyone's coffee and then attend to it. As Dell's mother fed pieces of a crawler to Scooty, she said, What vehicle would you like brought up from the garage, Dell? Dell said, The Jaguar 2 plus 2 has the maneuverability and power we need for work like this. I'll have it brought around at once, Mummingford said. Before you do, could you please bring a telephone? Dell asked. Certainly, Miss Payne, the butler said, and he departed. Having finished his croissant, Tommy went to the tea cart and selected a cheese Danish. He had decided to concentrate on eating and not try to be part of the conversation. Both women made him crazy, and life was too short to let them upset him. From the radio issued Glenn Miller's String of Pearls. Dell's mother said, I should have had you children change into bathrobes the moment you arrived. Then we could have thrown your clothes in the dryer. They'd be dry and warm by now. We'll only get wet again when we leave, Dell said. No, dear, the rain will be stopping in another four minutes. Having returned to his chair, Tommy took a bite of the Danish and looked at his watch. Tell me more about the entity, Mrs. Payne said. What it looks like, what its capabilities are. I'm afraid that'll have to wait till later, Mom. I need to use the bathroom quick and then we'd better run. While you're in there, comb your hair, dear, it's kinking. Dell left the room and Julia, Rosalind, Winona, Lilith, and the dog stared at Tommy as he ate the Danish. Then Mrs. Payne said, So you are the one. Tommy swallowed a mouthful of pastry. What does that mean? The one? Why, of course, dear boy, it means precisely what it says. You're the one. The one. There's something ominous about it. 
she seemed genuinely baffled. Ominous? Like a term some lost tribe of volcano-worshipping South Sea Islanders might use before they throw the virgin into the fiery pit. Mrs. Payne laughed with obvious delight. Oh, 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 you are precious. A sense of humor quite like Ned's. Tell me about the one, he insisted. Well, of course, deliverance merely meant that you're the one for her. The one she should spend the rest of her life with. Tommy felt a hot blush rising faster than the mercury in a thermometer bathed with August sunshine. Evidently, Julia Rosalind Winona Lilith saw the blush, for she said, My heavens, you are the sweetest young man. Scooty chuffed, as if in agreement. Blushing so brightly that he was beginning to sweat, Tommy changed the subject. So you haven't slept since Mud Lake? Mrs. Payne nodded. Just south of Tonopah. Twenty-seven years with no sleep. Almost twenty-eight, since the night that my deliverance was conceived. You must be tired. Not at all, she said. Sleep isn't a necessity for me now. It's a choice, and I don't choose to do it because it's boring. What happened in Mud Lake? If Dell didn't tell you, said Mrs. Payne, then it's certainly not my place to do so. I'll leave it to her in her own good time. Mummingford entered the room with a portable telephone, per Dell's request, and put it on the coffee table. He retreated without comment. He had to deal with a stolen Ferrari, after all. Tommy looked at his watch. Personally, Tommy dear, I think your chances of living until dawn are a hundred percent. Well, if I don't make it, Rosalind, I'll visit you on the David Letterman show. <gasps> I'd adore that, she said and clapped her hands to express her pleasure at the thought. On the radio, Glenn Miller's band was playing American Patrol. Tommy said, Is this your favorite kind of music? Oh, yes. It's the music that might redeem our planet if it could be redeemed by music alone. This is the music that appeals to the galaxy. You're so like your daughter, he said. Beaming, Mrs. Payne said, I love you too, Tommy. So you collect old radio programs. When she seemed baffled, he indicated the radio on the coffee table. Is it a cassette player, or are they issuing those collectibles on CDs now? No, dear. We're listening to the original program live. You mean live on tape? Glenn Miller died in World War II. Yes, Mrs. Payne said, in 1945. I'm surprised anyone of your age would remember him, or when he died. Swing music is so American, Tommy said. I love everything American, I really do. That's one reason you're drawn to Dell, she said happily. Deliverance is so thoroughly American, so open to possibilities. Back to Glenn Miller, if we may. He died more than fifty years ago. Mrs. Payne raised her eyebrows. Oh, I see your confusion. Only one small part of it. Excuse me, dear. At this point, no one alive is capable of grasping the enormous dimensions of my confusion, Tommy assured her. Well, at least allow me to clear up this one little Glenn Miller confusion, she said. We're listening to this broadcast live because my radio has trans-temporal tuning capabilities. Trans-temporal, he asked. Cross time, yes. Earlier I was listening to Jack Benny live. He was an enormously funny man. No one like him today. Who sells radios with trans-temporal tuning capabilities, Winona? Sears? Do they? I don't think so. As for how I got my little radio, I'll let Deliverance explain. It's related to Mud Lake, you know. Trans-temporal radio, Tommy mused. I think I prefer to believe in Bigfoot. Oh, you can't possibly, Mrs. Payne said disapprovingly. Tommy checked his wristwatch again. It's still raining. She cocked her head and listened to the faint drumming of the rain on the well-insulated roof of the great pile, and Scooty cocked his head as well. She said, Yes, it is. Such a restful sound. You told Dell the rain would stop in four minutes. You were so precise about it, but it's still raining. Oh, four minutes hasn't passed yet. Tommy tapped his watch. She said, dear, your watch is wrong. 
It's taken a lot of battering tonight. Tommy held the wristwatch to his ear, listened. Tick-tock. Ten seconds yet, she insisted. He counted them off, then looked at her and smiled ruefully. At fifteen seconds, the rain abruptly stopped. Tommy's smile faded, and Mrs. Payne's returned. Slumping back in his armchair, Tommy said, I'm never going to doubt a pain woman again. That's a wise decision, dear. What's a wise decision? Dell asked as she returned. Mrs. Payne said, He's decided never to doubt a pain woman. Never doubting a pain woman, Dell said, is not just wise, it's the prerequisite for survival. Although, Tommy said, I keep thinking about the female praying mantis. After she mates, she bites the head off her partner and eats him alive. Mrs. Payne said, I think you'll discover that Payne women will usually settle for a cup of tea and a scone. Indicating the portable telephone on the coffee table, Dell said, Did you make the call to your brother, Tommy? He had completely forgotten Guy. Dell handed him the phone and he punched in the number for the back office line at the New World Saigon Bakery. Leaning forward in her chair without disturbing Scooty, Mrs. Payne switched off the trans-temporal radio, silencing the Glenn Miller band in the middle of Little Brown Jug. Guy answered on the second ring, and when he heard Tommy's voice, he said, I was expecting you to call an hour ago. I was delayed by a yacht wreck. Have you translated the note? Guy said, You're still with that blonde, aren't you? I wish you weren't with her. Tommy looked at Tell. To Guy, he said, well, here I am. She's bad news, Tommy. More like the comics pages. If Jeffrey Dahmer were a cartoonist, Guy was silent. It was the silence of confusion with which Tommy was too familiar. Tommy said, were you able to translate the note? It didn't dry out as well as I hoped. I can't give you an entire translation of it, but I figured out enough to scare me. It's not any gang that's after you, Tommy. Who? I'm not sure. What you've got to do is, you've got to go see Mom right away. Tommy blinked in surprise and rose from his armchair. His hands were suddenly clammy with the sweat of familial guilt. Mom? The longer I worked on the note, the more it worried me. And finally I called her for some advice. You woke, Mom? Tommy asked in disbelief. When I told her about the note, she got scared too. Pacing nervously, glancing at Dell and her mother, Tommy said, I really didn't want Mom to know about this, Guy. She understands the old world, Tommy, and this thing is more a part of the old world than it is of this one. She'll say I've been drinking whiskey. She's waiting for you, Tommy. You don't have much time. You better get there as fast as you can. But don't take the blonde. I have to. She's bad news, Tommy. Tommy glanced at Dell. She sure didn't look like bad news. She had combed her hair. Her smile was sweet. She winked at him. Bad news, Guy repeated. We've been on this page before, Guy. Guy sighed. Well, at least cut Mom a little slack. She's had a terrible day. Mine hasn't exactly been a piece of cake. Mai eloped. Mai was their younger sister. Eloped? Tommy said, thunderstruck. Eloped with whom? A magician. What magician? Guy sighed. None of us knew she was dating a magician. This is the first time I've heard she was dating any magician, Tommy said, eager to establish that he could not be accused of complicity in his sister's astounding act of independence. From her armchair, the ex-ballerina who hadn't slept since Mud Lake said, A magician. How romantic. Guy said, His name is Roland Ironwright. Doesn't sound Vietnamese, Tommy worried. He isn't. Oh, God. Tommy could imagine the mood in which his mother would be stewing when he arrived at her doorstep with Del Payne. Guy said, He performs in Vegas a lot. He and Mai hopped a plane to Vegas and got married, and Mom only learned about it this evening, didn't tell me about it until I called her a little while ago. So cut her some slack. Tommy was overwhelmed by remorse. I should have gone to dinner at Comte Com. Go now, Tommy, he said. She might be able to help you. She said, hurry. 
I love you, Ki. Well, sure. I love you, Tommy. I love Tom and Mai and Mom and Dad. I really do. I love all of you so much. But I've got to be free. I know, brother. I know. Listen, I'll call Mom and tell her you're on your way. Now get moving. You're almost out of time. When Tommy hung up, he saw that Dell's mother was blotting tears from the corners of her eyes. With a tremor in her voice, she said, I haven't been so touched since Ned's funeral, when Frank Sinatra gave the eulogy. Dell moved beside her mother's chair and put a hand on the older woman's shoulder. Now, now, it's okay, Mom. Winona said, Frank was so eloquent. Wasn't he eloquent, Dell? As always, Dell said. He was a class act. Even my policemen were moved to tears, Mrs. Payne said. I had to attend the funeral between these two burly guards, of course, because I was under arrest for murder. I understand, Tommy assured her. I never held that against them, said Mrs. Payne. They knew I'd shot Ned through the heart, and they couldn't see it as anything but murder. They were so blind to the truth, but everything turned out all right. Anyway... These two dear policemen were so moved by all the lovely things Frank had to say about Ned. And then, when he began to sing, it was a very good year. They just broke down and sobbed like babies. I let them share my little pack of Kleenex. At a loss for comforting words, Tommy could think of nothing to say except, Such a tragedy, dying so young. Oh said Dell's mother. Ned wasn't all that young. Sixty-three when I shot him. Fascinated by this peculiar family, even as his personal clock of doom ticked rapidly toward the fatal hour, Tommy did some quick mental calculations. If he died eighteen years ago when Dell was ten, you would have been thirty-two and he was sixty-three? Nudging Scooty to the floor, rising from her armchair, Julio Rosalind Winona Lilith said, It was a May-December romance. I was twenty when we met, and he was over fifty. But from the first moment I saw Ned, I knew he was the one. I wasn't your ordinary young girl, Tommy dear. Oh, I was fiercely hungry for experience, for knowledge. I wanted to devour life. I needed an older man who had been around, who had seen it all, someone who could teach me. Ned was glorious. With Elvis singing Blue Hawaii, well, the poor dear had a bad cold, but he came to sing anyway. We married at a chapel in Vegas, 19 hours after we met, and never regretted it for one minute. On our honeymoon, we parachuted into the heart of the Campeche jungle on the Yucatan Peninsula with only two sharp knives, a coil of rope, a map, a compass, and a bottle of good red wine and we made it out safely to civilization in only fifteen days, more madly in love than ever. You sure were right, Tommy told Dell. Your mother's a hoot. Smiling radiantly at her daughter, Winona said, oh, Deliverance, did you really say that about me, dear? The two women embraced. Then Tommy hugged Dell's mother and said, I hope you'll invite me over some night to watch the David Letterman show. Of course, dear boy, and I hope you'll live long enough to have a chance to see it. Now, Dell said to Tommy, it's my turn to meet your mother. Mrs. Payne walked them out of the music room, down the great hall to the front door. The Jaguar 2 plus 2 was waiting in the now rainless November night. When Tommy opened the passenger side door and pulled the seat forward, Scooty romped into the back. As Dell went around to the driver's side, Mrs. Payne called to her daughter from the front door of the great pile. When you bite his head off and eat him alive, try to make it quick and painless. He's such a nice boy. Tommy locked eyes with Dell across the roof of the car. Dell said, It'll be over before you realize what's happening. I promise. At the Fawn House in Huntington Beach, Tommy's mother waited in the driveway. Although the clouds had begun to shred in the night sky, she wore ankle-high rubber boots, black slacks, a raincoat, and a plastic rain scarf. Her ability to predict the weather was not as impressive as Mrs. Payne's. 
Dale stayed behind the wheel with the engine running. Getting out of the Jaguar, Tommy said, Mom, I don't... Interrupting him, she said, Get in back seat. I sit up front with terrible woman. When he hesitated, she said, Go, go, foolish boy. Less than hour to dawn. Tommy scrambled into the back seat with Scooty. When his mother got in beside Dell and pulled the passenger door shut, Tommy leaned forward from the back and said, Mom, I'd like you to meet Deliverance Payne. Dell, this... Glowering at Dell, his mother said, I don't like you. Grinning, Dell said, Really? Already I like you a lot. Let's go, Tommy's mother said. Backing into the street, Dell said, Where? Go left. Just drive, I tell you when turn. He say you saved Tommy's life. She saved my life more than once, Tommy said. She don't think you saved my son's life, then I like you, Tommy's mother warned Dell. Earlier I almost shot him. Okay, maybe could like you a little, Tommy's mother grumbled. Glancing back at Tommy, Dell said, She's a hoot. He say you total stranger to Tommy. I've only known him a few hours, Dell confirmed. No dating? Good, don't date. Here, turn right. Where are we going? Tommy asked. Hairdresser, said his mother. We're going to the hairdresser? Why? You wait, you see, said his mother. Then to Dell, he's a bad boy, break your heart. Mom, he said, mortified. Can't break my heart if I don't date him, Dell said. Smart girl, said Mother Fawn. Scooty squeezed past Tommy and thrust his big head into the front seat, sniffing suspiciously at the new passenger. Turning in her seat, Tommy's mother met the dog face to face. Scooty grinned, tongue lolling. Don't like dog, she said. Dirty animals, always licking. You lick me, lose tongue. Scooty still grinned at her and slowly eased his head closer, sniffing, surely on the verge of licking. Baring her teeth at the Labrador, Tommy's mother made a warning sound low in her throat. Startled, Scooty twitched, drew back, but then bared his teeth and growled in response, his ears flattened against his skull. Tommy's mother bared her teeth further and issued a growl meaner than the dog's. Whimpering, Scooty retreated to a corner of the back seat. Turn left, next block. Hoping to ingratiate himself, Tommy said, Mom... I was so sorry to hear about Mai. What could have gotten into her, running away with a magician? Glowering at Tommy in the rearview mirror, she said, Brother was bad example. Young girl ruined by brother's bad example. Future destroyed by brother's bad example. Mom, that's not fair. Yeah, Dell said. Tommy's never run off with a magician. She glanced away from the street at Tommy. Uh, have you, Tofu Boy? Mother Fawn said, Marriage already arranged, future bright, now good Vietnamese boy left without bride. An arranged marriage? Dell marveled. Nguyen boy, nice boy, said Tommy's mother. Chip Nguyen? Dell wondered. Tommy's mother hissed with disgust. Not silly, Detective Chase Blonde, shoot everyone. Nguyen is the Vietnamese equivalent of Smith, Tommy told Dell. So why didn't you call your detective Chip Smith? I probably should have. I'll tell you why you didn't, Dell said. You're proud of your heritage. He pissed on heritage, Tommy's mother said. Mom! Tommy was so shocked by her language that his chest tightened, and he had to struggle to draw a breath. She never used foul words. That she had done so now was proof of an anger greater than she had ever displayed before. Dell said, Actually, Mrs. Fawn, you misunderstand Tommy. Family is very important to him. If you'd give him a chance, did I say don't like you? I believe you mentioned it, Dell said. More you talk, less I like. Mom, I've never seen you be so rude to anyone before. Anyone not in the family. Just watch. Turn left, girl. As Dell followed instructions, Tommy's mother let out a quavery sigh of regret. Boy, for my not silly Chip Nguyen, this Nguyen Hu Fan, family and donut business, have many donut shop. Perfect for my. Could have been many grandchildren pretty as my. Now, strange magician children. Isn't that what it's all about? 
Estelle asked. What do you say? Strange magician children. If there are three words that sum up what life should be all about, it's strange magician children. Life shouldn't be too predictable. It should be full of chance and mystery, new people, new ways, new hopes, new dreams, always with respect for the old ways, always built on tradition, but always new. That's what makes life interesting. More you talk, less I like. Yes, you said. Tommy curled up in the back seat in the corner opposite the dog, aware that he could not compete in this conversation. His mother said to Dell, You bad news. I'm the weather. Neither good nor bad. Just there. Tornado just there, but bad. I'd rather be weather than geology, Dell said. What mean? Better to be a tornado than a mountain of rock. Tornado come and go. Mountain always there. The mountain is not always there. Mountain always there, Mother Fawn insisted. Dell shook her head. Not always. Where it go? With singular elan, Dell said, The sun explodes, goes nova, and the earth blows away. You crazy woman. Wait around a billion years and see. Tommy and Scooty locked eyes. Only minutes ago, he wouldn't have believed that he could have ever felt such a kinship with the Labrador as he felt now. Dell said to Tommy's mother, And as the mountain blows away, there will be tornadoes of fire. The mountain will be gone, but the tornadoes still whirling. You the same as damn magician. Glancing at the rearview mirror, Dell said, Hey guys, we're being followed. They were on a residential street lined with ficus trees. The houses were neat but modest. Tommy sat up and peered out the rear window of the teardrop-shaped sports car. Looming behind them was a massive Peterbilt tractor and trailer, like a juggernaut, no more than twenty feet away. What's he doing in a residential neighborhood at this hour? Tommy wondered. Killing you, Dell said, tramping on the accelerator. The behemoth of a truck accelerated to match their pace, and a yellow glow of sodium vapor street lamps flickering across its windshield revealed the portly Samaritan behind the wheel. This can't be happening, Tommy said. Is, Dell said. Boy, I wish Mom was here. You have mother? Tommy's mom asked. Actually, Dell said, I hatched from an insect egg. I was a mere larva, not a child. You're right. I had no mother. You a smart mouth girl. Thank you. This is smart mouth girl, Tommy's mother told him. Bracing himself for impact, he said, Yes, I know. Engine shrieking, the truck rocketed forward and smashed into their rear bumper. The Jaguar shuddered and weaved along the street. Dell fought the steering wheel, which wrenched left and right, but she maintained control. The Peterbilt crashed into them again, and the rear bumper of the Jaguar tore away, clanging across the street into the front yard of a craftsman-style bungalow. Next block, turn right, Tommy's mom said. Accelerating, briefly putting distance between them and the Peterbilt, Dell waited until the last possible moment to make the turn. She slid through it, entering the new street back end first, tires screaming and smoking, and the car went into a spin. With a sharp little yelp better suited to a dog one quarter his size, Scooty shot off the back seat and tumbled onto the floor. Tommy thought they were going to roll, but under Dell's guidance, the Jaguar held the pavement tenaciously and shrieked to a shuddering halt as it came out of a complete 360-degree spin. Not a stupid dog, wanting to avoid being pitched off the seat again, Scooty waited on the floor until Dell jammed her foot down on the accelerator. Only after the car rocketed forward did he scramble up beside Tommy. Looking out the rear window, Tommy saw the Peterbilt breaking aggressively on the street they had left. Even the superior driving skills of a supernatural entity couldn't finesse the huge truck into making such a sharp and sudden turn. Basic physics still applied. The Samaritan thing was trying only to bring the vehicle to a stop. With its tires locked, the Peterbilt shot past the intersection and disappeared into the next block. Tommy prayed that it would jackknife. In the front seat, as the Jaguar accelerated to 70, Mother Fawn said, Girl, you drive like crazy maniac detective in book. Thank you, Dell said. Mother Fawn withdrew something from her purse. Tommy couldn't quite see what she held in her hand, but he heard a series of telltale electronic tones. What are you doing, Mom? Calling ahead. What have you got there? Cellular phone, she said blithely. 
Astonished, he said, "You own a cellular phone? Why not? I thought cellular phones were for big shots. Not anymore. Everybody got one. Oh, I thought it was too dangerous to use a phone and drive." As she finished punching in the number, she explained, "I'm not driving. Riding." Dell said, "For heaven's sake, Tommy! You sound as if you live in the Middle Ages." He glanced out the rear window. A full block behind them, the Peterbilt reversed into sight on the street that they had left. Someone must have answered Mother Fon's call because she identified herself and spoke into the telephone in Vietnamese. Less than a block and a half behind them, the Peterbilt swung through the intersection. Tommy consulted his watch. What time's dawn? I don't know, Dell said. Maybe half an hour. Your mom would know to the minute, to the second. Probably, Dell agreed. Although Tommy couldn't understand more than an occasional word of what his mother was saying, he had no doubt that she was furious with the person on the other end of the line. He winced at her tone and was relieved that he wasn't on the receiving end of her anger. Behind them, the Peterbilt was gaining. It had closed the gap to only a block. Tommy said worriedly, "Dell, I see it." She assured him, checking her side mirror and then accelerating, though they were already traveling dangerously fast. With a final burst of invective in Vietnamese, Tommy's mother switched off the cellular phone. "Stupid woman," she said. "Give it a rest," Dell advised. "Not you," said Mother Fan. "You, bad news, wicked, dangerous, but not stupid. I mean, Mrs. Ki Trang Dai, stupid woman." Tommy said, "Who's Ki Trang Dai? Stupid woman. Aside from being a stupid woman, who is she? Hairdresser." Tommy said. I still don't understand why we're going to the hairdresser. You need a trim, Dell told him. The Jaguar engine was roaring so loudly that Mother Fan had to raise her voice to be heard. She not only hairdresser, she friend, play mahjong with her and other lady every week and sometimes bridge. We're going for breakfast and a nice game of mahjong, Dell told Tommy. Mother Fan said, "Key my age but different. Different how?" Tommy asked. Ki so old-fashioned, stuck in ways of Vietnam, can't adjust to new world. Never want anything to change. Oh, I see," Tommy said. "Utterly different from you, Mom." He turned in his seat to peer out the rear window. The truck was bearing down on them, perhaps two thirds of a block away. Ki said, "Mother Fan, not from Saigon like our family. Not born city person. She from sticks. Nowhere village on Shan River near border Laos and Cambodia." All jungle out there on Shan River. Some people there strange have strange knowledge. Sort of like Pittsburgh, Dell said. What strange knowledge? Tommy asked. Magic, but not magic like stupid roll and iron right pulls rabbit from hat and my thinks clever. Magic, Tommy said numbly. This magic like making potion. To win love of girl, making charm to succeed in business, but also worse. Worse? How? Talking to dead, Mother Fan said ominously. Learning secret about land of dead, making dead walk and work as slave. The Peterbilt was half a block behind them. As it approached, the roar of its engines was growing louder than that of the Jaguar. Tommy's mother said, "Shan River magic brings spirit from dark underworld. Put curse on sorcerer's enemy." This Shan River, Dell declared, is definitely a part of the planet that's under the influence of evil extraterrestrial powers. Ki Trang Dai know this magic," said Mother Fan. "How to make a dead man dig up out of his grave and kill who told to kill? How to use frog gonad in potion to make enemy heart and liver melt into mud?" How to put curse on woman who sleep with your husband, so she give birth to baby with human head, dog body, and lobster hand? And you played mahjong with this woman? Tommy demanded, outraged. Sometimes bridge, said Mother Fan. But how could you associate with this monster? Be respectful, boy. Give your elder by many years. Earn respect. She no monster. Aside from this stupid thing she do with the rag doll, she nice lady. She's trying to kill me. Not trying to kill you. She is trying to kill me. Don't shout and be crazy like maniac drunk detective. She only trying to scare you so you'll be more respectful of Vietnamese way. Behind them, the Samaritan thing blew the Peterbilt's air horn, 
Three long blasts gleefully closing in for the kill. Mom, this creature murdered three innocent bystanders already tonight, and it sure as hell will kill me if it can. Tommy's mother sighed regretfully. Ki <sighs> Trung Dai, not always as good at magic as she think. Probably make ragdoll with one missing ingredient, someone demon with one wrong word. Mistake. Mistake? Everybody make mistakes sometime, Dell said. That's why they make erasers. I'll kill this Mrs. Dye, I swear, Tommy announced. Don't be stupid, Mother Fawn said. Ki Trung Dye, nice lady, you not kill nice lady. She is not a nice lady, damn it, Dell said disapprovingly. Tommy, I've never heard you be so judgmental. I'll kill her. Tommy repeated defiantly. Mother Fawn said, Ki never use magic for herself. Not make herself rich with magic, work hard as hairdresser. Only use magic once or twice a year to help other. Well, I sure haven't been helped by all this, Tommy said. Ah, oh, Del said knowingly. I see. Tommy said, What? What do you see? The air horn of the Peterbilt blared again. To Tommy's mother, Del said, are you going to tell him? I don't like you, Mother Fawn reminded her. You just don't know me well enough yet. Never going to know you better. Let's do lunch and see how it goes. Almost blinded by a flash of insight, Tommy blinked fiercely and said, Mom, good God, did you ask this monster, this nutball die woman to make that rag doll? No, his mother said. She turned to meet his eyes as he leaned forward from the back seat. Never. You a thoughtless son sometime. Won't be doctor. Won't work in bakery. Head full of stupid dream. But in your heart, you not bad boy. Never bad boy. He was actually touched by what she had said. Over the years, she had sparingly administered praise with an eyedropper. Therefore, hearing her acknowledge that he was... Although thoughtless, not truly an evil boy, well, this was like being fed a bowl of motherly love. Ki Trang Dai and other lady, we play mahjong. We play card. While we play, we talk. Talk about whose son joined gang, whose husband faithless. Talk about what children doing, what cute thing grandchildren say. I talk about you. How you... Become so far from family, from who you are, losing root. Try to be American, but never can. Going to end up lost. I am an American, Tommy said. Can never be, she assured him, and her eyes were full of love and fear for him. Tommy was overcome by a terrible sadness. What his mother meant was that she could never feel herself to be a complete American, that she was lost. Her homeland had been taken from her, and she had been transplanted to a world in which she could never feel entirely native and welcome, even though it was such a glorious land of great plenty and hospitality and freedom. The American dream, which Tommy strove with such passion to experience to the fullest, was achievable for her only to a limited extent. He had arrived on these shores young enough to remake himself entirely, but she would forever hold within her heart the old world, its pleasures and beauty amplified by time and distance, and this nostalgia was a melancholy spell from which she could never fully awaken. Because she could not become American in her soul, she found it difficult, if not impossible, to believe that her children could be so transformed, and she worried that their aspirations would lead only to disappointment and bitterness. I am American, Tommy repeated softly. Didn't ask stupid Ki Trong Dai to make rag doll. Was her own idea to scare you. I hear about it only one, two hours ago. I believe you, Tommy assured her. Good boy. He reached one hand into the front seat. His mother gripped his hand and squeezed it. Good thing I'm not as sentimental as my mother, 
Dell said. I'd be bawling so hard I couldn't see to drive. The interior of the car was filled with the brightness of the headlights from the Peterbilts behind it. The air horn blared, and the Jaguar vibrated under the sonic assault. Tommy didn't have the courage to look back. Always worry about you, said Mrs. Fawn, raising her voice over the airliner loud roar of the truck engine. Never see problem with my. Sweet my, always so quiet, always so obedient. Now we die. And terrible magician in Vegas laugh at stupid old Vietnamese mother and make strange magician babies with ruined daughter. Too bad Norman Rockwell isn't alive, Dell said. He could make such a wonderful painting out of this. I don't like this woman, Mother Fawn told Tommy. I know, Mom. She bad news. You sure she told a stranger? Only met her tonight. Turn left next corner, Mother Fawn told Dell. We almost to House of Ki Trong Dai. I have to slow down to make the turn, and if I slow down, Mrs. Dai's demon is going to run right over us. Drive better, Mother Fawn advised. Dell glared at her. Listen, lady. I'm a world-class race car driver, competed all over the world. No one drives better than I do, except maybe my mother. Holding out the cellular phone, Mother Fawn said, Then call Mother. Hear what she say to do. Grim-faced, Dell said, Brace yourselves! Tommy let go of his mother's hand, slid backward in his seat, and fumbled for his safety belt. It was tangled. Scooty took refuge on the floor in front of his seat, directly behind Dell. Unable to disentangle the belt quickly enough to save himself, Tommy followed the dog's example, huddling, squeezing into the floor space between the front and back seats on his side of the car to avoid being catapulted into his mother's lap when the crash came. Dell braked the Jaguar. The tires barked, and Tommy could smell burning rubber. The Peterbilt rammed them, and sheet metal screamed, and the Jaguar shuddered as though it would fly apart like a sprung clock, and Tommy thumped his head against the back of the front seat. The car was so awash in the glow of the truck's headlights that Tommy could clearly see the Labrador's face across the floor from him. Scooty was grinning. Dell braked again, swung hard to the right, but that was only a feint to lead the Peterbilt in the wrong direction because the truck couldn't maneuver as quickly as the car. Then she swung sharply to the left, as Mother Fawn had instructed. Tommy couldn't see anything from his dog-level view, but he knew that Dell hadn't been able to get entirely out of the truck's path because as they made the left turn, they were struck again clipped only at the extreme back end of the vehicle, but hit with tremendous force, an impact that made Tommy's ears ring and jarred through every bone. The Jaguar spun. They went through one full revolution, and then another, perhaps a third, and Tommy felt as though he had been tossed into an industrial-sized clothes dryer. Tires stuttered across the pavement, tires exploded, rubber remnants slapped loudly against fender walls, and steel wheel rims scraped shrieked across the pavement. Pieces of the car tore free, clattered along the undercarriage, and were gone. The Jaguar came out of the spin, rattling and pinging, lurching like a hobbled horse, but on all four wheels. Tommy extracted himself from the cramped floor space between front and back seats, scrambled up, and looked out the rear window. As before, the Peterbilt had overshot the intersection. How was that for driving? Dell demanded. Mother Fawn said, You'll never get insurance again. Even Deliverance Payne was not going to be able to coax any speed out of the Jaguar in its current debilitated condition. The sports car chugged forward, loudly rattling and clanking, hissing, pinging, pitching and yawing, spouting steam, hemorrhaging fluids, like one of those rattle-trap pickup trucks that comic hillbillies always drove in the movies. Behind them, the huge Peterbilt reversed into the intersection through which they had just been flung. We've got at least two blown tires, Dell said, and the oil pressure is dropping fast. Not far, said Tommy's mother. Garage door be open. You pull in, all safe. What garage door? Dell asked. Garage door at Guy's house. Oh, yes, the hairdresser witch. She no witch. Just come from Shan River, learned few things when she was girl. There, see two houses ahead on right, light on. Garage door open, you pull in. Kidai closed door, all safe. The demon driver shifted gears, and the Peterbilt pulled into the street behind them. Its headlights swept across the rear window across Tommy. Scooty whimpered. Tommy said, how can I be safe? It's not dawn yet. The thing will see where we've gone. Can't follow there, his mother said. It'll drive straight through the house, he predicted. No, Key is one who made doll. 
cold spirit from underworld, so it's not allowed to hurt her. Can't enter house if Key Trunk die herself. Don't make invitation. With all due respect, Mom, I don't think we can count on demons being quite that polite. No, your mother's probably right, Dell said. The supernatural world operates on its own laws, rather like we operate under the laws of physics. As the inside of the car grew bright from the headlights behind, Tommy said, "If the damn thing drives the truck into the house and kills me, who do I complain to? Albert Einstein or the Pope?" Dell turned right into the driveway, and the car creaked, clanked, clanged, wobbled, rolled, rocked, heaved into the open, lighted garage. When she braked to a stop, the engine coughed and stalled. The rear axle snapped, and the back of the Jaguar crashed to the garage floor. Behind them, the big door rolled down. Tommy's mother climbed out of the car. When he followed her, he heard the shrill air brakes of the Peterbilt. Judging by the sound, the truck had pulled to the curb and stopped in front of the house. A slender, bird-like Vietnamese woman, about the size of a twelve-year-old girl, with a face as sweet as butterscotch pudding, stood at the interior door between the garage and the house. She was wearing a pink jogging suit and athletic shoes. Mother Phan spoke to this woman briefly in Vietnamese and then introduced her as Ki Trang Dai. Mrs. Dai appeared crestfallen when she faced Tommy. So sorry about the mistake. Terrible, dumb mistake. Feel like stupid, worthless, ignorant old fool. Want to throw myself in pit of river viper, but have no pit here and no viper either. Her dark eyes welled with tears. Want to throw myself in pit so bad. Well, Dell said to Tommy, "Are you going to kill her?" Outside, the Peterbilt was still idling. Blinking back her tears, her expression toughening, Mrs. Dye turned to Dell and said suspiciously, "Who are you? A total stranger." Mrs. Dye raised an eyebrow quizzically at Tommy. Is true, not dating. All I know about him is his name, Dell said, and she doesn't get that right half the time. Tommy assured Mrs. Dye. He glanced at the big garage door, certain that the truck engine outside would suddenly rev. Are we really safe here? Safe here. Safe all in house, but. Mrs. Dye squinted at Dell, as though reluctant to grant admittance to this obvious corrupter of Vietnamese male youth. To Tommy, Dell said, "I think I could find some vipers if you'd be willing to dig a pit." Mother Phan spoke to Ki Trang Dai in Vietnamese. The hairdresser witch lowered her eyes guiltily. "Okay, you come inside, but I keep clean house. Is dog broke?" "He wasn't broken, but I had him fixed." Dell said. She winked at Tommy. "Couldn't resist." Mrs. Dai led them into the house. Through the laundry room, kitchen, and dining room, Tommy noticed that the heels of her running shoes contained light-emitting diodes that blinked in sequence from right to left, ostensibly a safety feature for the athletically minded who took their exercise at night, though the effect was footgear with a Vegas flare. In the living room, Mrs. Dye said, "We wait here for dawn. Evil spirit have to go at sunrise. All be fine." The living room reflected the history of Vietnam as occupied territory, a mix of simple Chinese and French furniture with two pieces of contemporary American upholstery. On the wall over the sofa was a painting of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In a corner stood a Buddhist shrine. Mrs. Dye sat in an oversized black chinoiserie chair so large that the diminutive, pink-clad woman appeared even more childlike. Her twinkling shoes didn't quite reach the floor. Taking off her plastic rain scarf, but not her coat, Mother Fawn settled into a Berger-style chair. Tommy and Dell perched on the edge of the sofa, and Scooty sat on the floor in front of them, looking curiously from Mother Fawn to Mrs. Dye to Mother Fawn again. Outside, the Peterbilt engine still idled. Tommy could see part of the truck, all of its running lights aglow, through one of the windows that flanked the front door, but he couldn't see the driver's cab or the Samaritan thing. Consulting her watch, Mrs. Dye said, "Twenty-two minutes till dawn. Then no one have to worry. No one angry with friends no more. Anyone like tea?" Everyone politely declined tea. "No trouble to make," said Mrs. Dye. Again, everyone politely declined. Dell said, "So you were born and raised along the Shan River?"
Mrs. Dye brightened. Oh, it's beautiful land. You been there? No, Dell said. Though I've always wanted to go. Beautiful, beautiful. Mrs. Dye rhapsodized. Jungle so green and dark. Air heavy as steam. Smell of growing thing. Can hardly breathe for stink of growing thing. So many flower and snake. All red gold mist in morning. Leeches thick and long as hot dog. Tommy muttered, "Lovely, lovely!" With all the resurrected dead men slaving in the rice paddies. Glowering at Tommy, his mother said, "Be respectful." Dell said, "Mrs. Dye, when you were a girl, did you ever notice any strange objects in the skies over the Shan River? In sky, disc-shaped craft, perhaps." Perplexed, Mrs. Dye said, "Dishes in sky." Tommy thought he heard something outside. It might have been a truck door closing. Changing tack slightly, Dell said, "In the village where you were raised, Mrs. Dye, were there any legends of short humanoid creatures living in the jungle?" "Short what?" asked Mrs. Dye. "About four feet tall, gray skin, bulbous heads, enormous eyes, really mesmerizing eyes." Keetrong Dai looked at Mother Fawn for help. "She crazy person," Mother Fawn explained. "Eerie lights in the night," Dell said. "Pulsating lights, anything like that along the banks of the Shan." "Very dark in jungle at night. Very dark in village at night. No electricity." "In your childhood," Dell probed. "Do you remember any periods of missing time?" Unexplained blackouts, fugue states. Nonplussed, Mrs. Dye could only say, "Everyone sure not like nice hot cup of tea." No doubt talking to herself, but appearing to address Scooty, Dell said, "Sure as hell, this Shan River is a primary locus of evil extraterrestrial influence." Heavy footsteps thudded across the front porch. Tommy tensed, waited. And when a knock came at the door, he stood bolt upright from the sofa. Don't answer the door, Mrs. Dye advised. Yeah, Dell said, it might be that damn aggressive Amway saleswoman. The knocking sounded again, louder and more insistent. Raising her voice, Mrs. Dye said, "You can't come in." Immediately, the demon pounded again, so hard that the door shook and the lock bolt rattled against the striker plate. Go away," said Mrs. Dye. To Tommy, she said, "Only eighteen minutes, then everybody happy." Mother Fawn said, "Sit down, Tong. You make everyone nervous." Tommy couldn't take his eyes off the front door, until movement at one of the flanking windows drew his attention. The serpent-eyed fat man peered in at them. "We don't even have a gun," Tommy worried. "No need gun," Mother Fawn said. Got key trunk die. Sit down and be patient. The Samaritan thing stared hungrily at Tommy and wrapped one knuckle against glass. To Dell, Tommy repeated, "We don't have a gun." We've got Mrs. Die. Dell said, "You can always pick her up by the ankles and use her as a club." Key trunk die wagged one finger at the Samaritan thing and said, "I made you, and I tell you, go away. So now you go." The demon turned from the window. Its footsteps thudded across the porch and down the front steps. There," said Mother Fawn. "Now sit down, Dong, and behave." Trembling, Tommy sat on the sofa. It really went away. No," said Mrs. Dye. "It going all around house now to see did I forget and leave door or window open." Tommy bolted up again. "Is there a chance you did?" "No, I not fool." You already made one big mistake," Tommy reminded her. "Dong," Mother Fawn gasped, appalled by his rudeness. Pouting, Mrs. Dye said, "One mistake I have to apologize the rest of my life." From elsewhere in the house came the sounds of the Samaritan thing rapping on windows and testing doorknobs. Scooty cuddled against Dell, and she petted and soothed him. Mrs. Dye said, 
Some rain we have, huh? So early in season too, said Mother Fawn. Remind me of jungle rain, so heavy. We need rain after drought last year. Dell said, Mrs. Dye, in your village in Vietnam, did farmers ever find crop circles, inexplicable depressed patterns in their fields, or large circular depressions where something might have landed in the rice paddies? The Samaritan thing stomped up the steps onto the front porch once more. It appeared at the window to the left of the door, eyes fierce and radiant. Mrs. Dye consulted her wristwatch. Looky good. Tommy stood rigid, quivering. To Mother Fawn, Mrs. Dye said, So sorry about my... Break Mother's heart, said Tommy's mother. She lived to regret, said Mrs. Dye. I try so hard to teach her right. She weak, magician clever. Don't make bad example for sister, said Mother Fan. My heart ache for you, Mrs. Dye said. Virtually vibrating with tension, Tommy said, Can we talk about this later? If there is a later? From the beast at the window came the piercing, ululant shriek that seemed more like an electronic wail than an animal voice. Getting up from her chinoiserie chair, Mrs. Dye turned to the window. Stop that, you bad thing. You wake a neighbor. The creature fell silent, but it glared at Mrs. Dye almost as hatefully as it had glared at Tommy. Abruptly, the fat man's moon-round face split up the middle from chin to hairline, as it had done when the creature had clambered over the bow railing of the yacht on Newport Harbor. The halves of its countenance peeled apart, green eyes now bulging on the sides of its skull, and out of its face lashed the segmented black tendrils. You not scare me, Mrs. Dye said disdainfully. Zip up face and go away. The writhing tendrils withdrew into the skull, and the torn visage re-knit into the face of the fat man, although with the green eyes of the demon. You see? Mother Fawn told Tommy, still sitting complacently with her purse in her lap and her hands on the purse. Don't need gun when half key drunk die. At the window, its frustration palpable, the Samaritan thing issued a pleading, needful mule. Mrs. Dye took three steps toward the window, lights flashing across the heels of her shoes, and waved at the beast with the backs of her hands. So she said impatiently, Sue, Sue. This was more than the Samaritan thing could tolerate, and it smashed one fat fist through the window. As shattered glass cascaded into the living room, Mrs. Dye backed up three steps, bumping against the chinoiserie chair, and said, This not good. This not good? Tommy half shouted. What do you mean, this not good? Rising from the sofa, Dell said, I think she means we turn down the last cup of tea we're ever going to have a chance to drink. Mother Fan got up from the bergere. She spoke to Ki Trong Dai in rapid Vietnamese. Keeping her eyes on the demon at the broken window, Mrs. Dai answered in Vietnamese. Looking distressed at last, Mother Fan said, Oh boy. The tone in which his mother spoke those two words affected Tommy as an icy finger drawn down his spine would have affected him. At the window, the Samaritan thing at first seemed shocked by its own boldness. This was, after all, the sacred domain of the hairdresser witch who had summoned it from hell, or from wherever Jean River magicians summoned such creatures. It peered in amazement at the few jagged fragments of glass that still prickled from the window frame, no doubt wondering why it had not instantly been cast back to the sulfurous chambers of the underworld. Mrs. Dye checked her wristwatch. Half snarling, half whining nervously, the Samaritan thing climbed through the broken window into the living room. Better stand together, said Mrs. Dye. Tommy, Dell, and Scooty moved out from behind the coffee table, joining his mother and Mrs. Dye in a tight grouping. The serpent-eyed fat man no longer wore the hooded raincoat. The fire from the yacht should have burned away all attire, but curiously, the flames had only singed its clothes as though its imperviousness to fire extended somewhat to the garments it wore. 
The filthy and rumpled trousers, the equally disheveled and bullet-torn shirt and vest and suit jacket, the acrid smell of smoke that seeped from the creature, combined with its gardenia-white skin and inhuman eyes, gave it all the charm of a walking corpse. The demon's plump hands curled into fists, relaxed, curled into fists. It licked its lips, and it shrieked. Beyond the windows, the sky was still dark, though perhaps more charcoal gray than black. Mrs. Dye startled Tommy by savagely biting the meatiest part of her palm below her thumb, drawing blood. She smacked her bloody hand against his forehead in the manner of a faith healer knocking illness out of a sufferer. When Tommy started to wipe the blood away, Mrs. Dye said, No, leave. I safe from demon because I summon into ragdoll. Can't harm me. If you smell like me, smell like my blood, it can't know who you really are. Think you me, then not harm you either. As the Samaritan thing approached, Mrs. Dye smeared her blood on Dell's forehead, on Mother Fawn's forehead, and on Scooty. Be still, she instructed in an urgent whisper. Be quiet. Grumbling, hissing, the creature approached to within a foot of the group. Its fetid breath was repulsive, reeking of dead, burnt flesh. With a wet, crackly sound, the plump white hands metamorphosed into serrated pincers designed for efficient slashing and rending. When the radiant green eyes fixed on Tommy's eyes, they seemed to look through him, as if the beast were reading his identity on the barcode of his soul. Tommy remained still, silent. The demon sniffed him, not as a snorting pig might revel in the delicious stink of its slops, but as a master viniculturist with an exquisitely sensitive nose might seek to isolate and identify each of the many delicate aromas rising from a glassful of fine Bordeaux. Hissing, the beast turned to sniff Dell, lingering less than it had with Tommy, then Mrs. Dye, then Mother Fawn. When the creature bent down to sniff Scooty, the Labrador returned the compliment. Apparently puzzled by finding the scent of the sorceress on all of them, the demon circled the group, grumbling. As one, without having to discuss it, Tommy and the three women and the dog shuffled in a circle to keep their blood-smeared faces toward the Samaritan thing as it prowled for prey. When they had shuffled all the way around, 360 degrees, and were back where they had started, the creature focused on Tommy once more. It leaned closer until their faces were only three inches apart, and it sniffed. 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 The serpent-eyed thing shrieked at Tommy, but though his heart raced faster, Tommy neither flinched nor cried out. At last the demon exhaled its pent-up inhalation, bathing Tommy's face in a gale of foul breath. It shuffled to the bergere and sat where Tommy's mother had been sitting. After a moment, the pincers changed into the fat man's hands once more. The Samaritan thing smacked its lips. It sighed wearily. The radiant green eyes changed into the ordinary brown eyes of the murdered Samaritan. The demon looked at its wristwatch. Tick-tock. Yawning, it blinked at the group standing before it. The beast bent forward in the bergere, seized its right foot with both hands, and brought the foot to its face in a display of impossible double-jointedness. Its mouth cracked open from ear to ear like the mouth of a crocodile, and it began to stuff its foot and then its heavy leg into its maw. Tommy glanced at the windows. Pale pink light spread like a dim blush on the face of the eastern sky. As if it were not a solid creature, but an elaborate origami sculpture, the demon continued to fold itself into itself, growing smaller and smaller still, until... With a shimmer that hid the howl of the final transformation, it became only a rag doll once more. Exactly as it had been when he had found it on his doorstep, a limp-limbed figure of white cotton with all the black stitches intact. Pointing at the pink sky beyond the windows, Mrs. Dye said, Going to be nice day. With paper towels and tap water, they had cleaned the blood off their foreheads. The two Vietnamese women sat at the kitchen table. 
After applying a healing poultice that the hairdresser witch kept in the refrigerator, Mother Fawn taped a gauze pad to Mrs. Dye's bitten hand. You sure not hurt? Fine, fine," said Ki Trang Dai. "Heal fast, no problem." The rag doll lay on the table. Tommy couldn't take his eyes off it. "What's in the thing?" "Now," Mrs. Dai said, "mostly sand, some snake blood." "I want to destroy it." "Can't hurt you now. Anyway, taking a part is my job," said Mrs. Dai. Have to do according to rules, or magic won't be undone. Then take it apart right now. Have to wait till noon, sun high, night on other side of world, and then magic be undone. That's only logical, Dell said. Getting up from the table, Mrs. Dye said, "Ready for tea now?" Sit down, Dong. Stop worry. Have tea," said Mother Fan. "You make Mrs. Dye think you not trust her." Taking Tommy by the arm, Dell said, "Could I see you a minute?" She led him out of the kitchen into the dining room, and Scooty followed them. In a whisper, she said, "Don't drink the tea. Maybe there's more than one way to make a stray son return to the fold." What way? A potion, a combination of exotic herbs, a pinch of river mud. Who knows? Dell whispered. Tommy looked back through the open door. In the kitchen, his mother was putting out cookies and slices of cake while Mrs. Dye brewed the tea. Maybe, whispered Dell, Mrs. Dye was too enthusiastic about bringing you to your senses and back into the family. Maybe she started out with the drastic approach, the doll, when a nice cup of the right tea would have made more sense. In the kitchen, Mrs. Dye was putting cups and saucers on the table. The devil doll still lay there, watching the preparations with its cross-stitched eyes. Tommy stepped into the kitchen and said, "Mom, I think we'd better go now." Looking up from the cake that she was slicing, Mother Fawn said, "Have tea and nibble first, then go." "No, I want to go now." "Don't be rude, Tong. While we have tea and nibble, I call your father. By time we done, he stop by, take us home before he go work at bakery." "Dell and I are leaving now," he insisted. "No car," she reminded him. Crazy woman's car just trash in garage. The Peterbilt is parked out there at the curb, he said. Tommy and Dell and Scooty went into the living room, where the glass from the broken window crunched and clinked under their shoes. Mrs. Dye and Mother Fawn followed them. As Tommy unlocked and opened the front door, his mother said, "When I see you again." Soon, he promised, following Dell and Scooty onto the porch. Come to dinner tonight. We have come to come, your favorite. That sounds good. Mmm, I can't wait. Mrs. Dye and Mother Fawn stepped onto the porch as well, and the hairdresser said, "Miss Payne, what day your birthday? Christmas Eve. Is true." Descending the porch steps, Dell said, "October thirty-first." Which true? Mrs. Dye asked a little too eagerly. July fourth," said Dell, and to Tommy, sotto voce, she said, "They always need a birthday to cast the spell." Moving onto the front steps as Dell reached the walkway, Mrs. Dye said, "You have beautiful hair, Miss Payne. I enjoy doing such beautiful hair." So you can get a lock of it," Dell wondered as she continued to walk toward the Peterbilt. "Mrs. Dye is wonderful genius hairdresser," said Mother Fawn. She give you the best look ever have. I'll call for an appointment," Dell promised as she went around the truck to the driver's door. Tommy opened the passenger door to the truck cab so the dog could spring inside. His mother and Mrs. Dye stood side by side on the steps of the front porch. They waved. Tommy waved back at them, climbed into the truck cab beside the dog, and pulled the door shut. Dell was already behind the wheel. She put the truck in gear. Mrs. Dye and Mother Fawn waved again. As Dell drove away from the house, Tommy said miserably, "What am I going to do now? I love my mother. I really do. But I'm never going to be a baker, or a doctor, or any of the things she wants me to be. And I can't spend the rest of my life afraid to drink tea or answer the doorbell." "It'll be all right, Tofu Boy." "It'll never be all right," he disagreed. "Don't be negative," 
Negative thinking disturbs the fabric of the cosmos. A little bit of self-indulgent negativity might seem like an innocent pleasure, but it can cause a tornado in Kansas or a blizzard in Pennsylvania. Scooty licked Tommy's face, and he didn't resist. He knew he was genuinely desperate when he found himself taking comfort from the dog's attentions. I know exactly what we need to do, Dell said. We've both known since we kissed on the carousel. What a kiss. So for starters, we need to fly to Vegas and get married. If you care to propose to me. Scooty looked at him expectantly. Tommy was surprised to hear her offer, but he was not surprised to hear himself say, Deliverance Payne, daughter of Ned and Julia Rosalind Winona Lilith, will you marry me? It's going to take a lot more than a doll snake rat quick little monster thing to stop me. You have a beautiful smile, he said. You too. Actually, he wasn't smiling. He was grinning like a fool. Tommy expected to catch a commercial flight from John Wayne Airport to Las Vegas, but Dell's mother owned a Learjet. Dell was a qualified pilot. Besides, she said as they walked the last block to the airport from the abandoned Peterbilt, the sooner we tie the knot, the better. In regards to what Mrs. Dye may have in mind, married, we geometrically increase our psychic resources. We have more power to resist. A few minutes later, as they boarded the private jet, Dell said, Anyway, I want to see if we can beat my mom's record. She married Daddy 19 hours after she met him. Studying his watch, calculating, Tommy said, You served me dinner about 12 hours ago. We'll make it. Are you tired, darling? I feel totally rested, but I didn't sleep all night. You may never need it again, she said. It's such a waste of time, sleeping. Tommy sat in the co-pilot seat while Scooty lounged in the passenger compartment. They flew east into the morning sun, where the sky was no longer pink, but as blue as Deliverance Payne's eyes. Their suite at the Mirage Hotel was one of several spacious and lavishly appointed accommodations that were not rented to ordinary customers, but were provided free to high rollers who regularly gambled fortunes in the casino downstairs. Though neither Dell nor Tommy intended to wager one dollar on the tables, the Payne name elicited a response no less generous and effusive than would have been accorded to an Arab prince bearing suitcases full of cash. Eighteen years after his death, Ned Payne remained a legendary poker player, and the hotel management's affection for Dell's mother was evident in their numerous inquiries into the state of her health and her current activities. Even Scooty was greeted with huzzas, petted and nuzzled, and talked to in baby talk. In addition to the enormous vases full of fresh flowers in each of the seven rooms in the suite, there were strategically placed silver-plated bowls full of dog biscuits. A clothing store in the hotel's shopping arcade sent up two salespersons and carts laden with garments. Within 90 minutes, Tommy and Dell had showered, shampooed, and selected wedding outfits. He wore black tassel loafers, black socks, charcoal gray slacks, a blue blazer, a white shirt, and a blue striped tie. She wore white heels and a figure-flattering white silk dress with white lace at the neck and at the cuffs of the long sleeves. You look like a bride, he said. No veil, though. Wouldn't want to hide that face, he said. You're so sweet. Just as they were ready to leave the hotel for the chapel, the mayor of the city of Las Vegas arrived with their license. He was a tall, distinguished-looking man with silver hair, attired in an expensive blue suit, wearing a five-carat pinky ring. You, dear girl the mayor said, kissing Dell on the forehead. You are the most glamorous creature I've ever seen. How is Ingrid? She's splendid, Dell said. She doesn't come to town often enough. Will you tell her that I pine for her? Dell said, Well, I'm spilling a secret here, but I'm sure you'll have a chance to tell her yourself. The mayor embraced Tommy. This is a great day, a great day. To Dell, he said, Dear have you arranged the limousine? Yes, it's waiting. Then just delay here two minutes so I can pop downstairs and be sure the police escort is ready too. 
You're an absolute jewel, Dell said, kissing his cheek. The mayor departed, and Tommy said, Who's Ingrid? Examining herself in the marble-lined foyer's ornate mirror, Dell said, That's what some people call my mother. Of course. Will she be upset that she wasn't at the wedding? Oh, she's here, Dell said happily. Still capable of surprise, Tommy said, How? I called her as soon as we arrived, before I showered, and she flew up in her other jet. On the way down in the elevator, Tommy said, how could you possibly manage to arrange all this so quickly? You took so long selecting your wardrobe, she said, that I had time to make a few calls. An enormous black stretch limousine waited in front of the hotel in the shade of the portico. Mummingford stood beside it. He had flown up from Newport Beach with Ingrid. Miss Payne, he said, my best wishes for much happiness. Thank you, Mummingford. Mr. Fawn, said the butler, I offer you my congratulations. You're a fortunate young man. Thank you, Mummingford. I think I'm more than fortunate. I'm blessed and bewildered. I myself, said Mummingford, have functioned in a state of perpetual bewilderment ever since coming to work for Mrs. Payne. The Chapel of Everlasting Bliss, one of Las Vegas' more well-appointed wedding mills, was bedecked with so many hundreds of red and white roses that Tommy feared an attack of hay fever. He stood by the altar railing, trying not to fidget, smiling stupidly because the place was full of people smiling at him. Designed primarily to provide a suitable quasi-religious venue to impulsive out-of-state couples who arrived in Vegas either alone or with a few carloads of friends, the chapel seated only 60 people. Even given such short notice of the ceremony, friends of the Payne family filled the pews to capacity, and another 30 stood in the side aisles. At Tommy's right hand, Roland Ironwright, the magician, said, Relax. Getting married is a snap. I did it myself 18 hours ago in this very room. Accompanied by a nine-piece band, Frank Sinatra sang, I've got the world on a string, as only Frank had ever been able to sing it, while Mrs. Payne gave Dell a final once-over in the vestibule at the back of the chapel. Then the band struck up Here Comes the Bride. Scooty entered from the vestibule, carrying a nosegay in his mouth, which he brought to Tommy. Behind Scooty was Mai, Tommy's sister, radiant as he had ever seen her. She carried a white basket full of rose petals, which she sprinkled on the carpet as she advanced. Dell appeared, and everyone seated in the chapel rose to beam at her as she approached the altar. Frank ad-libbed additional lyrics to Here Comes the Bride, adding lines like, She looks so groovy, like she stepped out of a movie, without diminishing the beauty and solemnity of the piece. Indeed, his version enriched the old standard, and he sounded not like a crooner at the twilight of his life, but like a young swinger in the days of the Dorsey brothers and Duke Ellington. The minister was mercifully swift in the performance of his sacred duties, and precisely when it was needed, Roland Ironwright cut open a fresh orange and produced the wedding band from the heart of the fruit. After the minister pronounced the man and wife at 11.34 in the morning, less than 18 hours after they had first met, Tommy and Deliverance indulged in another kiss of earth-shaking power, only the second they had ever shared, and the onlookers applauded joyously. From the bandstand, Frank called to Dell's mother, Hey, Sheila, you wonderful broad, come up here and do this number with me. Dell's mother joined him, and they shared a microphone to belt out an up-tempo rendition of I've Got You Under My Skin, which served as a recessional. In the receiving line outside, Dell reminded everyone about the reception at the Grand Ballroom of the Mirage at 7 o'clock that evening. It promised to be the party of the year. When the two of them were alone again, with Scooty in the back of the limousine, returning to the hotel... Dell said to Tommy, Are you tired yet? I don't understand it, but I feel as if I just woke up from the longest sleep on record. I've got so much energy, it's absurd. Lovely, she said, snuggling against him. He put his arm around her, excited by the warmth of her and by the exquisite perfection with which her supple body molded to his. 
We're not going back to the hotel, she told him. I asked Mummingford to take us to the airport. We're flying back to Orange County right away. But I thought, I mean, aren't we going to... Oh, Dell, I want to be alone with you. I'm not going to ask you to consummate until you know all of my secrets, she said. But I want to consummate, he said. I want to consummate this morning as soon as possible, right here in the limo. Have you been eating too much tofu? She asked coquettishly. If we go back to Orange County, we'll miss our own party this evening. It's less than an hour flight each way. We maybe have two hours of business when we get there. We'll make it back with time to spare. She put a hand in his lap. With time to consummate. In her house on Balboa Peninsula, Dell led Tommy upstairs to the studio where she created her paintings. Canvases were hung on all sides, and others stood in stacks against one wall, at least a hundred altogether. Most of them were exceedingly strange landscapes of places that could never exist on this world, scenes of such stunning beauty that the sight of them brought tears to Tommy's eyes. I painted these by remote viewing, she said, but someday I hope to travel there. Where? I'll tell you later. Eight paintings were different from all the others. They were portraits of Tommy rendered with a photographic realism equal to that with which the landscapes had been painted. Blinking in astonishment, he said, When did you do these? Over the past two years, when I began having dreams about you. I knew you were the one, my destiny. And then, last night you just walked into the restaurant and ordered two cheeseburgers. The living room in the Fawn House in Huntington Beach was remarkably similar to the living room of the Dye House, although the furnishings were somewhat more expensive. A painting of Jesus revealing his sacred heart hung on one wall, and in a corner was a Buddhist shrine. Mother Fawn sat in her favorite armchair, slack-jawed and pale, having taken the news of the wedding as though she had been hit in the face with a skillet. Scooty licked one of her hands consolingly, but she didn't seem to be aware of the dog. Dell sat on the sofa with Tommy, holding his hand. First, Mrs. Fawn, I want you to understand that the Paines and the Fawns could be the most wonderful combination of families imaginable, a tremendous union of talents and forces, and my mother and I are prepared to embrace all of you as our own. I want to be given a chance to love you and Mr. Fawn and, and Tommy's brothers, and I want all of you to learn to love me. You steal my son, said Mother Fawn. No, Dell said. I stole a Honda and later a Ferrari, and then we borrowed the Peterbilt that the demon stole, but I didn't steal your son. He gave his heart to me of his own free will. Now, before you say anything more that might be rash, that you might later come to regret having said, let me tell you about my mother and me. You bad news. Ignoring the insult, Dell said, 29 years ago, when my mom and dad were driving from Vegas to a poker tournament in Reno, taking a scenic route, they were abducted by aliens from a lonely stretch of highway near Mud Lake in Nevada. Gazing at Dell, his head ringing like a gong with remembered lines of conversation that had seemed like sheer lunacy when she had spoken them, Tommy said, South of Tonopah. That's right, darling, said Dell. To Tommy's mother, she said, they were taken up to the mothership and examined. They were allowed to remember all of this, you see, because the aliens who abducted them were good extraterrestrials. Unfortunately, most of the abductions are perpetrated by evil ETs, whose plans for this planet are nefarious in the extreme, which is why they block abductees' memories of what happened. Mother Fawn scowled at Tommy. You run off and marry crazy woman. She discovered Scooty licking her hand, and she shooed him away. You want loose tongue, you filthy dog? Anyway, in the mothership hovering above Mud Lake, Dell continued, the aliens took an egg from my mother, sperm from daddy, added some genetic wizardry of their own, and implanted mother with an embryo, which was me. I am a star child, Mrs. Fawn, 
And my mission here is to ferret out damage done by certain other extraterrestrials, which often includes teaching people like Mrs. Fawn to perform evil mojo and set things right. Therefore, I lead an eventful life, and often a lonely one, but not lonely anymore, because I have Tommy. World full of lovely Vietnamese girls, Tommy's mother told him, and you run away with crackpot mediac blonde. When I reached puberty, Dell said, I began to acquire various extraordinary powers, and I suppose I might continue to acquire even more as the years go by. Tommy said, So that's what you meant when you said you'd have been able to save your father if he hadn't gotten cancer before you reached puberty. Squeezing his hand, Dell said, It's all right. Fate is fate. Death is just a transition between this and a higher existence. The David Letterman Show. Grinning, Dell said, I love you, Tofu Man. Mother Fawn sat as stone-faced as an Easter Island monument. And Emmy, the little girl, the daughter of the guard at the gatehouse, Tommy said, you have cured her. And gave you a massage so you'll never have to sleep again. He raised one hand to the back of his neck, and as his heart began to race with exhilaration, he remembered the tingle of her fingers as they had probed his weary muscles. She winked. Who wants to sleep when we could use all that time to consummate? Don't want you here, said Mother Fawn. Turning to her mother-in-law again, Dell said, When the aliens returned Mom and Daddy to that highway south of Tonopah, they sent along one of their own as a guardian in the form of a dog. Tommy would have thought that nothing on earth could have torn his attention away from Dell at that moment, but he turned his head to Scooty so fast that he almost gave himself whiplash. The dog grinned at him. Scooty, Dell explained, has greater powers than I do. The flock of birds that distracted the demon, Tommy said. And with your indulgence, Mrs. Fawn, I will ask him to give a little demonstration to confirm what I've told you. Insane American maniac blonde lunatic, Mother Fawn insisted. The Labrador sprang onto the coffee table, ears pricked, tail wagging, and gazed so intently at Mother Fawn that she pressed back into her armchair in alarm. Above the dog's head, a sphere of soft orange light formed in the air. It hung there a moment, but when Scooty twitched one ear, the light spun away from him and whirled around the room. When it passed an open door, the door flew shut. When it passed a closed door, the door flew open. All the windows rose as if flung up by invisible hands, and balmy November air blew into the living room. A clock stopped ticking. Unlighted lamps glowed, and the television switched on by itself. The sphere of light returned to Scooty, hovered over his head for a moment, and then faded away. Now Tommy knew how Dell had started the yacht without keys and how she had hot-wired the Ferrari in two seconds flat. The black Labrador got off the coffee table and patted to his mistress, putting his head on her lap. To Tommy's mother, Dell said, We'd like you and Mr. Fawn and Tommy's brothers and their wives, all his nieces and nephews, to come to our party tonight in Las Vegas and celebrate our marriage. We can't fit you all in the Learjet. But Mother has leased a 747, which is standing by at the airport right now, and if you hurry, you can all be there with us tonight. It's time for me to quit my job as a waitress and get on with my real work. Tommy and I are going to lead eventful lives, Mrs. Fawn, and we'd like all of you to be a part of that. Tommy couldn't read the wrenching series of emotions that passed across his mother's face. Having said her piece, Dell stroked Scooty, scratched behind his ears, and murmured appreciatively to him. Oh, him a good fella, him is, my cutie scooty woodums. After a while, Mother Fawn got up from her chair and turned off the television. She went to the Buddhist shrine in the corner, struck a match, and lit three sticks of incense. For perhaps two or three minutes, the survivor of Saigon and the South China Sea stood staring at the shrine, inhaling the thin and fragrant smoke. Dell patted Tommy's hand. At last his mother turned away from the shrine, came to the sofa, and stood over him, scowling. Dong, you won't be doctor when won't you be doctor? Won't be baker when won't you be baker? 
that story about silly whiskey drunk detective won't keep old ways. Don't even remember how speak language from land of seagull and fox. My Corvette and like cheeseburger better than com de com. Forget your root. Want to be something never can be. All bad. All bad. But you make best marriage any boy ever make in history of world. So I guess that got to count for something. By 4.30 that afternoon, Tommy, Dell, and Scooty were back in their suite at the Mirage. Scooty settled in his bedroom to crunch dog biscuits and watch an old Bogart and Pacall movie on television. Tommy and Dell consummated. Afterward, she didn't bite his head off and devour him alive. That evening, at the reception, Mr. Sinatra called Mother Fawn a great old broad, Mai danced with her father, Tone got tipsy for the first time in his life. Sheila, Ingrid, Julia, Rosalind, Winona, Lilith answered to three other names, and Dell whispered to Tommy as they did a foxtrot, This is reality, Tofu Man, because reality is what we carry in our hearts, and my heart is full of beauty just for you. Other titles by Dean Kuntz available on audio from Random House are Dark Rivers of the Heart, read by Anthony Heal, Icebound, read by John Glover, and Intensity, read by Kate Burton. This has been a Random House audiobooks presentation.